tonight on Ice Pilots NWT. A young pilot is put to the test, landing a DC-4 for the first time. Don't keep that nose down and never pull on it. A bridegroom finds an arctic way to mark the big day. You stand right up here. And a rookie co-pilot faces engine failure. We are having uh, engine issues. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Out of your hats, boy. The Northwest Territories, Canada. 1.2 million square kilometers of unforgiving frozen tundra hugging the North Pole. Only 42,000 people live here, half of them scattered in tiny settlements over a landmass almost twice the size of Texas. For most of the year, there's only one way in or out. By air. There's an airline based in Yellowknife, unlike any other in the world. Buffalo Airways, owned and operated by aviation legend, Buffalo Joe McBrien. Okay, yeah, yeah, 3017 or taxi runway 04. He lives by that simple cowboy code. If it can be done, Joe will do it. If it doesn't, stop. he's one tough boss to please. I would not want to be one to piss Joe off. It's his way or the highway. No, I'm not I'm hard to work with. I'm hard to work for if you want to put that way. Buffalo Joe is a cross between Howard Hughes, James Dean, and Al Bundy from Married with Children. You put those three people together and you mix them up a little bit and you add a toque and a parka and that's Buffalo Joe. He may be hard to impress, but for young pilots fresh out of flight school, Joe offers the adventure of a lifetime. Only one in a hundred recruits will survive Buffalo boot camp. And the teeth cracking Northern cool to make it to the flight deck. And those who have the right stuff Yeehaw! get the pure adrenaline rush of flying 40,000 pounds of vintage steel. You know, we fly some of the coolest planes, I think, in the country. The DC-3. The DC-4. And the C-46. These big, multi-engine beasts aren't like the planes that flew in World War II. They are the planes that flew in World War II. If you really want to fly, if you really want to experience flight in this life, then you have to strap these things to your ass and let your wings extend out, and that's the closest thing you will come to a human flying. A bit of an adventure, that's why all those guys are up here. Flying something that old, that big, as your first job? Hell yeah. First, you've got to pay your dues every day. And in the dead of winter, 5 a.m. comes dark and early. Most of Yellowknife is still asleep. But co-pilot Scott Blue is bracing himself for another minus 35 morning. Yeah, I think the darkness can wear on you a little bit. It's you know, cold and dark between, you know, three in the afternoon and 10 in the morning. You just, you're sleepy all the time and sometimes you can find yourself being a little bit, you know, grumpy and not yourself. Scott's a long way from home in Toronto where he parked cars for a living before pouring everything he had into flight school. To fulfill his dream of becoming a captain, he's come north to work at Buffalo. Oh, here in Yellowknife, but it seems every single morning you're cleaning up just a little bit of this shit, which is fine when you're doing your car. It sort of sucks when you get to work and you have to do the whole damn plane. 
Scott spent a year here busting his butt loading cargo and prepping planes before he even got a shot at the cockpit. Now he's a rookie co-pilot, but at Buffalo that still means doing the grunt work. Here it doesn't work like other places where you know you show up, you fly, you go home, that's all you do. Here there's so much more involved uh, in terms of expectations of ground help and getting the plane ready on your own and you know loading it yourself and de-icing it yourself and fueling it yourself. Scott's not the only one up before dawn. Okay, so that's 360 plus 85. That one will go and then this one. Cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic is figuring out how to squeeze as much freight as she can onto the plane. Hopefully we'll make this all fit in there. And if not, they'll have to bump some stuff. Kelly is dispatching food and supplies on a 1,700 kilometer run up the Mackenzie Valley to four isolated settlements. Delaney, Fort Good Hope, Norman Wells, and Toledo. It usually goes between three and five times a week. Its main purpose is to deliver fresh goods because these communities don't have permanent roads. And basically their permanent road is the C-46. They're gonna kill me. It's hard to try to keep everybody happy when you know, you're dealing with four, four communities. It's difficult. Getting vital supplies to where they're needed takes a lot of juggling and a little bit of sweet talking. When the other pilots get a load, I'll have maybe, you know, 13 skids. Scott will get stuck with 20. I have to be nice to him. I got a love you, Scott thing on here. Um, Cause all this crap has to fit on here. There's enough space here for about 14 pallets. And then there's 20 coming. So, I don't know, it's just gonna be a pretty tight plane. Nothing in flight school prepared Scott for this. He loves me. Not. If you're gonna go straight out of flight school and get onto a 65-year-old, 48,000-pound twin-engine beast, you gotta do a little bit of, you know, not so fun stuff. Scott's training on the C-46, a World War II U.S. Air Force piston pounder. It's just unique. Like when I first saw it in Hay River, when I got here and I was standing there and the thing lands, and I'm like, what the hell is that? They're made of an aluminum alloy. It's very strong, non-corrosive. They're almost indestructible. The big, bulky C-46 is the toughest plane to fly in Buffalo's fleet. So pilots usually start training on the smaller DC-3. But Scott has no choice. At six foot seven, he's just too big for any other cockpit. Ballerina, I ain't. I first got here from down south. I, uh, I squeezed myself, I tried to squeeze myself into a DC-3 in Hay River. Uh, did not fit. So I was like, okay, well, is this gonna work? Like, can I stick it out here and fly something else? Next morning, um, came over to Yellowknife. They actually let me fly <laughs> my first morning uh, for about 20 minutes across the lake, which was kind of cool, kind of surprised by that. And it was in the C-46, and I fit. So far, he's hanging in there, but being limited to the C-46 limits his flight time and paychecks. Today, he's not even flying. And with about 500 hours logged, he has a long way to go to the 2,700 he needs to qualify for captain. If Scott's dreams are going to get off the ground, he needs a lot more hours in the air. We're on our way to the airport here, just down the road to pick up Alex Wagner. Even though he's just arrived, new recruit Alex Wagner is already on the fast track. He's going to be uh, uh, the newest uh, DC-4 pilot. He's coming in the train, and hopefully he turns out pretty good. With 5,000 flying hours on a variety of aircraft, Alex is formidable competition for less experienced pilots like Scott Blue. Well, I could be flying a, an airline, and there's been a, a lot of hiring the last few years on that. 
and uh, I thought about it. It'd be nice, but that's not uh, that's not my style, and I want to yeah, fly the DC-4. Designed in the 1930s, only a few dozen DC-4s are still in operation. There's no plastic, no microchips, no auto anything on these old war horses. Rarely does a pilot today get to fly such a massive, multi-engine plane with no electronic assistance. I just like to fly machines. I don't want to be flying computers. I want to have my hands in the control and fly something where you really need a pilot on board. Basically flying a 50,000 pound empty aircraft, four engines, that's just great. Coming into Buffalo, everybody's excited and eager. Um, maybe a detriment. That happiness or that eagerness wears off quite quickly. Alex looks good on paper, but how will he measure up at Buffalo? Bob, there's been a lot of people that can't handle this job in that quick day, like lots of people. There's all sorts of stories about guys leaving in the middle of the night. Where's Bob? Uh, I don't know. His car's gone, his bedroom's cleared out. He's just disappeared, you know? I had a guy here this fall. He arrived here on a Saturday morning, left Sunday noon. He laughed. He said, boy, this sure ain't for me. To survive here, Alex will have to prove that he's Buffalo material. And he'll get that chance sooner than he thinks. Still to come. You hear that backfire, Scott? I think it came from this side. Co-pilot Scott Blue finally gets in the air, but he'll wish he hadn't. Uh, a little bit of smoke uh, popping out of the exhaust, black smoke. Another cracking cold morning in Yellowknife. Balanced 15 feet up in the pre-dawn darkness, new hire Alex Wagner preps a big DC-4 for startup. Dealing with the coal would be the, the harshest part, actually. Even though he's used to wicked Quebec winters, Alex is still trying to get acclimatized to Yellowknife's deep freeze. Is that 37 for real? No. If you ever get cold while brushing the wing, don't worry, probably the exposure of sl slipping off the wing will actually get your heart rate going up and a bit of a little adrenaline shot there. Just a week ago, a rookie slid off broke his arm, and quit on the spot. Everybody's supposed to fall once at least. That's what they say. I haven't fallen yet, but... Uh... Alex is hoping to start training on the big DC-4, which is worlds away from the planes he's used to. This 20-ton aircraft has four 1,500-horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines, a 36-meter wingspan, and cruises at about 365 kilometers per hour. Today, he's getting the chance to step closer to his dream. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader and Co-Pilot Dan Catoni have invited him to ride along. We told him to come up, we'd throw him in uh, DC-4 and start getting him trained, uh, just to get him used to the airplane. Okay, let's get out of here. They're headed north to Copper Mine with a load of building supplies. Straight ahead for a bit, turn on course. Alex studies how Arnie and Dan handle the plane. I'll be okay. We're 95 for 85. Flaps up and touch down. He's got to pick things up fast because Arnie has a surprise in store. If you want to switch seats, that's fine. All been again and all. He gives Alex the co pilot seat and hands over control of the plane. This DC 4 goes back almost 70 years. With a range of almost 7,000 kilometers, it was intended to be the first pressurized transatlantic passenger plane. But those lofty goals fell to earth with World War II, and the DC-4 was converted into the Skymaster, a big troop and armaments hauler. It was back to basics. There are no simulators for these airplanes, so you can't teach them how to fly it. With a simulator, you have to actually let them fly the airplane. As chief pilot, Arnie oversees all the trainees at Buffalo. They can handle these airplanes, handle anything they ever run into. Well, it's, you know, bringing them up the ladder, keeping them on track, keeping them alive. You know, in a very tough environment, it's uh, a lot of winter ops here, so 
they're learning as they go. So my responsibility is to keep them safe. It doesn't take long for Arnie to know what kind of pilot you are. He's seen a lot of pilots. There's nothing automated in this airplane. We have to do everything physically with throttles, props, and so on. It's not like an airliner where you get in the air, you can punch three buttons, and the airplane flies itself for the remainder of the trip. With Alex getting comfortable in the cockpit, Arnie eases off power on one engine just to test him. Which engine's failing? Number three. And you can see that yep. by the manifold pressure. Manifold, yeah. And you can feel it on, you can and feel you the can, drag you on the right feel the side. drag, yeah. Alex has passed the first test, so Arnie plans to take him to the next level. Well, you wouldn't realize how heavy it is until you land it when you start to round out. Landing and taking off is one of the most difficult things you do. That's, you know, put them right into it, let them do it. Because all airplanes land the same. You just have to get the feel of that airplane. It will be Alex's moment to prove himself. On the return leg to Yellowknife, he's going to do something he's never done before. Land the DC-4. In Yellowknife, co-pilot Scott Blue is back on the ramp, prepping a C-46 for another supply run up the valley. And today, he's going to fly. Warmer weather has brought more humidity and fog, and the threat of icing on the wings and props. Start building up a lot of icing, you're going to get in trouble pretty fast. So you have to take it seriously if you're talking about uh, your life, anybody else's on the plane lives, and the aircraft itself. So you, you have to take icing seriously. The captain on the C-46 is A.J. DeCoast. A.J. started off at the very bottom, but A.J.'s work ethics helped him move up in the Buffalo ladder of, of uh, responsibilities. The very first time I ever uh, tried to take off in the C-46, as we started rolling down the runway, it started to go left a little bit. So I applied right rudder. By the time it was uh, going too far right, I, uh, I had the left rudder, but it was still going right. So we ended up uh, basically taking out a couple of runway lights. Before boarding the plane, AJ gives the exterior a thorough inspection. You can see where some of the paint is missing along here, where uh, ice has actually been thrown from the propeller in flight and uh, hit the side of the fuselage. And it's like a gunshot. It's very loud, and if you're not expecting it, it's kind of scary, actually. I'm gonna try to get this shit off of here. I'm just gonna pick up more of it with this freezing fog. But it's only on the ground here. 200 feet up, it's blue sky. Everything is set to go. They fire up the engines and taxi out to do a run-up. Very just a dash on the right, there should be any conflict. It looks like Scott will actually get some much needed flying hours today. Zero three tower line up at the threshold, runway two seven. And eight oh three, we're just gonna need a couple of seconds here. But it's, uh, it's okay. Yep, that's fine. But AJ decides to turn back. A little bit of a vibration coming from the right engine. It appears to be a timing problem. On the right engine, uh, there's two mags, and uh, one of the mags is not working very well, so uh, mechanics are going to go get the tools and we'll chip away and fix the problem. A look by a mechanic, and it appears this isn't a quick fix. Scott won't be flying today after all. But the unexpected downtime gives AJ the chance to take care of some important personal business, and Scott tags along. AJ's checking out an extraordinary Yellowknife landmark, the location for his upcoming wedding. This is the Ice Castle. Every winter, Snow King Tony Foley had builds this impressive structure from scratch, using only ice and snow. There's no cooler place to get married in than the Snow King's castle. You can either walk that way or this way, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. You're getting married in March. All my family's coming up here. Pretty excited about getting everything organized. Originally from Nova Scotia, AJ and his Winnipeg-raised fiance Candace have fallen in love with the North. Hold on tight. AJ proposed on April Fool's Day. 
<laughs> I assume that it wasn't a joke, though. AJ isn't really one to have uh, secrets or su make surprises. He basically bought the ring and proposed within, I think, an hour. <laughs> like, he didn't waste any time at all. He brought home flowers and got down on one knee and proposed. So, it's nice. I was a pilot before I ever met her. I was actually flying the C-46 before I ever met her, so she knows all my stories and she knows what it is I do and she knows I enjoy it. Yeah, I think when you are dating somebody from Buffalo, you definitely are looking at marrying into the company because it is a lifestyle. So this here is a big room, here. great hall. All your guests can stay up here, like here. Yeah. So this here you could use as a honeymoon suite if you like. Yeah, this is pretty awesome, man. I've never seen an igloo before, so actually. Crawl in there, crawl in there. You can stand right up in here. Mm. Maybe not Scott. <laughs> <laughs> it just even feels warmer in here. <laughs> yeah. Now, I got some uh, plastic flowers that we could put around. Like, the real flowers don't last. Because yeah, I guess the real flowers are just sort of like slowly just Oh, they die just... right away, I think, eh? <laughs> Thanks. Nice to meet you, Tony. See you. I'll see you soon. Before he walks down that icy aisle, AJ still has many flights and harsh winter conditions ahead. Sometimes those planes are kind of a bumpy ride. She probably worries a little bit, yeah, I don't know. I never asked her about that. It's scary sometimes. It's very scary. Coming up. There she goes again. Yeah. AJ and Scott battle serious engine problems on the C-46. It's new co-pilot Alex Wagner's moment of yeah. truth. He's never flown a massive four-engine propeller plane like this DC-4 before. But Buffalo Airways chief pilot Arnie Schrader is giving him a shot at it. Yeah. And now is the crucial test. Landing. Okay, we're coming up at 10. I'm going to just give you a little flap, just so you get the feel of it. Yep. Yeah, I'll give you 10. On approach, there's a hard turn, and controlling airspeed is critical. Yeah, that'll get you under. If Alex is going too fast, he won't be able to land safely. Too slow, and he'll stall the plane and could drop like a stone. Start my turn for the snow. Uh, I wouldn't start it too quick. Okay. You're at 95. I'm just trying to keep your speed up. Yep. You can now. You can gradually start it. Not too steep. Don't keep that okay. nose down. And yep. Never, never pull on it. Yep. I had the chance to do a lot of tests through through my flying career, but the first ones are usually usually pretty uh, pretty nerve wracking. Airspeed, wind direction, rate of descent, pitch of the plane. Alex has to keep everything in check. Now, a little bit forward on that yeah. tram factory. Alex only flown uh, light airplanes, so the DC-4 is a lot heavier when you round out and stuff. Okay, push the nose down. 95. Now break the nose level. You gotta hold the nose wheel on. Hold yep. the nose wheel on. There's the attitude. There you go. Now I just let the nose down. It took some last-second adjustments, but Alex pulled it off. A smooth DC-4 landing on his very first attempt. Okay, I have control. You have controls. Flaps down. Flaps, 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 up. Up. No, Flaps don't, up. Don't. Yeah, don't touch anything. I got them already. She's her. I just didn't want you to actually break the gear up. Yeah, no, boy, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I got it off. Awesome. We did it practice, but I didn't have it too much trouble uh, the way the way it was flown. It's just a matter of flying it a little bit, and it won't be any problem. Bring it on. Across the tarmac, it's the best part of the day for company president Joe McBrien. Passengers board Buffalo Joe's twin-engine DC-3 for his evening flight to Hay River. We're the only operator in the world who operates these Douglas DC-3s as a scheduled passenger service. That daily run, called the SCED, carries passengers and courier cargo 200 kilometers to Yellowknife in the morning and back to Hay River at the end of the day. 
the sked is the backbone of Buffalo Airways operation. And it's Joe's baby. Hello, this is Sheila. Get your haircut. No pictures. That's Joe's thing. That's Joe's sked, and that's what Joe does. And it's Joe's son Mikey's job to make sure it runs smoothly. Mikey here. Hey, Sandra. <laughs> Mikey does exactly what nobody else does. The rest of us focus, like hyper focus, and maybe you're not that good at multitasking or even looking at the big picture. I don't work at Buffalo Airways. I live at Buffalo Airways. Mikey grew up in the Buffalo hangar. But be sure and put this one back, see? Now he's learning to run the company under the demanding eye of his father. And it isn't always easy. You went to school, you go look at that file and you tell me if it makes any sense at all. Everybody here's been fired at least once. I've been fired on three occasions. Everybody can do it, but who's doing it? He rags on me pretty hard. Yeah, it hurts, but yeah, you get used to it. On the ramp, the ground crew loads guaranteed overnight cargo onto the sked. It must get to a connecting flight in Hay River by 8 p.m. With a scheduled 5 o'clock departure and a 50-minute flight, there should be plenty of time. As the sked taxis to the runway, Mikey starts shutting down the hangar for the night. My literally was on my way out of the door, right? DC-3 is taking off. But there's a problem with the plane. Joe doesn't take off. He steers back to the hangar. The Buffalo staff hit the tarmac to find out what's wrong. This DC-3 is powered by two Pratt & Whitney radial piston engines developed in the 1930s. At takeoff, these air-cooled engines deliver over 2,400 horsepower. But tonight, one of them isn't delivering. The passengers deplane to the waiting room. When Joe comes out of that plane, he's already got in his mind of what he has to do to fix the problem. We got to get the people in and get the freight. So whatever we have to do, we'll do it. The crew sprints into action. This is going to be one long ass night. Engineer Adam Smith spots the problem. I think we got a sheet prop governor. It won't let it go past uh, 2300 RPM on takeoff. There's no way this will get fixed in time for Joe to meet the connecting flight in Hay River. He needs a plan B. Is that airplane fueled up? He's like a general off in the war. He's got a mission. Mikey is supposed to have a backup DC-3 ready at all times. But not only is it sitting frozen on the tarmac, that's a big aluminum block sitting in uh, this harsh cold weather. It doesn't even have passenger seats in it. She's configured right now for freight, and we gotta make her ready for passengers. But when his father gets a look at it, this airplane's a hell of a mess. All right, how many times do I ask you to get this airplane ready? Get somebody in there and clean that shit out of that cockpit. It's filthy, and the back end's filthy, eh? The airplane's not prepared. Tomorrow, when the smoke clears, we're going to see what actually happened. It's going to be hell to pay guaranteed. If Mikey can redeem himself and get Joe in the air, it's not going to be pretty. Still ahead, pilots AJ and Scott finally get the C-46 off the ground, and things turn downright ugly. We've got a nasty shake, set down number two engine. A mechanical problem has grounded Buffalo Joe McBrien's sked flight. But the backup DC-3 his son Mikey was supposed to have ready on standby is nowhere near ready. And Joe is furious. The airplane's a hell of a mess. All right, Do you want to get some uh, clothes ready and come out here so you give us a hand? Now, Mikey has just 35 minutes to get the plane airworthy and Joe off the ground in order to meet the 8 o'clock connection in Hay River. We had to convert, technically, a freight airplane into a passenger airplane with no notice. Job one, install 28 seats. Then there's the issue of heating the minus 30 interior. 
The one thing about the DC-3 is it's not pressurized, it's not airtight. There's a million little holes in that little thing there. So we gotta figure out how to put a curtain in to hold the heat in. That's a rear one, huh? Yeah. No, this one is the one I want first. The only this thing that keeps you warm is, is these curtains that cover up the main hole, which is the door. Definitely, there's emergency, but tomorrow when the smoke clears, it's gonna be hell to pay, guaranteed. It's probably, it's probably gonna be my fault. The passengers don't care whose fault it is. They just want to get on their way. I think they said about a 40 minute delay <laughs> about an hour ago. <laughs> They'll get the freight on board because everything to do with this freight has a deadline. If Joe doesn't get this DC-3 in the air in the next 15 minutes, he's going to miss his cargo connection. And Mikey will be in a load of trouble. All he's doing is, is showing me that stuff like this happens and you gotta deal with it. Yeah, load him up. I'm gone. Yeah, I'll go over here. Thanks for your patience, folks. All done, but they're close to the wire. Takeoff must now go perfectly for Joe to make Hay River in time. Holy smokes. Inside the hangar, Mikey anxiously awaits word from his father. Go ahead, Alfar. We're going to make it for eight o'clock. A huge relief, but Mikey's not quite out of the doghouse. He's going to do some serious consideration whether we want to do this again. This airplane was not at all prepared. Copy. Mikey can't let something like this happen again. The next morning, engineer Adam Smith works to get AJ and Scott's C-46 back in service. Yeah, it's louder with that new prop. The right engine was running rough, so Adam is replacing the magneto. I've got the old mag that I removed from the airplane. This is the new mag going on. Go. The magneto controls the timing of the sparks in each cylinder of this 18-cylinder Pratt & Whitney engine. Even a slight flaw in timing can cause combustion with the valves open, resulting in rough running and backfiring. That's it. Goddamn pilots leaving the goddamn switches on. Scott's dying to get some flying time, but Adam still needs to put the new mag through its paces. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wait for all my temperatures to come up. In the cold, uh, metal gets more brittle. And if it's more brittle, you're more likely to crack cylinders, uh, low oil coolers, seals will fail. It's an art form, running them in the winter. It takes tender, loving care from everyone to keep Buffalo's vintage prop liners going. Scott's anxious to get flying the only plane his six foot seven inch frame fits into. Well, good to go. Shut her down, let the pilots take her. Just gotta do a little paperwork. Locked, loaded, and finally ready to go, Scott and AJ taxi out. Buffalo 328, backtrack in line up runway 09. You'll be number two for departure. Report ready after the 328, backtracking for departure, runway 09. Call your one up, please.
is finally in the air in the C-46. <laughs> but before this day is through, his ability to stay cool under extreme pressure will face the test of a lifetime. Scott and AJ are on a milk run flying food and cargo up the Mackenzie Valley in Buffalo's vintage C-46. Fun plane, it's a challenge. It can be quite frustrating, which is temperamental, but I like it. The C-46 is the ideal plane for the valley run, able to take off and land on small airstrips. And it can carry a massive payload. Up here, it's like an airborne 18-wheeler. Only a handful of C-46s in the world are still operating. I ended up here because I'm a nostalgic aviation anything with an engine geek. I don't know, there's just something about these old tanks that intrigues me. Like, how much longer are they gonna be flying? I mean, yeah, they've been saying that for 30 years now and they're still going, but this is the end of an era, I think. Back in World War II, Curtis Wright built the 46 with a glass dome enclosing the cockpit, a useful feature for wartime conditions. The plane was overbuilt for war with powerful engines, few windows, and enlarged cargo doors. So far, their supply run up the Mackenzie Valley seems to be going smoothly. But up here in the north, that can change in a heartbeat. Wendy, Wendy up here today. This fucking giver man will go up to 45. Charge of that. AJ notices something else. You get used to the normal running sound of the engines and. Uh, you can tell when one of them is not quite up to snuff. Kind of a heightened sense of awareness, watching for uh, the gauges to see if there's any indication that we're going to have a major malfunction on the engine. And the right, or number two engine, doesn't sound good. The engine actually had a, was running a little bit rough there for about a, probably a little bit less than a minute. So. Uh, we're just keeping an extra diligent look out here on our engine, engine instruments. It's the same engine that had the magneto problem earlier. You know, when things start breaking down up here, they have a trend of everything happening at once. On their way back home, just 180 kilometers from Yellowknife, things turn ugly. The right engine starts backfiring. You hear that backfire, Scott? I think it came from this side. Yeah, I have control. You have control. Take a look out there. He's definitely running rough. Yeah, if we have to shut it down, it's definitely not going to be much fun here. There she goes again. Yeah. The backfiring is so bad that it rocks the plane. Got a nasty shake. When it backfires and shakes, there's, there's other things that can then break on the engine because you're putting a lot of extra stress on some of the parts. Does it look like it's shaking out there, Scott? Yep. If they let the number two engine run this rough, the vibrations could literally tear the wing off this shuddering plane. We're gonna have to uh, shut down the number two engine. It's backfiring too much. That's too rough. We're worried something's gonna happen here. AJ initiates a shutdown of the right engine. Firm number two. Number two prop. Firm number two. Number two mixture. Thank you, firm number two. Number two feather. It's slowing down. But for some reason, the propeller isn't feathering properly. Revolutions are consistent. Feathering means rotating the pitch of the propeller blades so that they're parallel to the airflow. And if it's feathered, it's not moving. The engine's not moving. Lowest amount of drag, no wear tear on the engine. Best way to bring it home. But it doesn't work. It's, it's not feathering. I don't know why that thing's not feathering. We'll try it again here. Still spinning, AJ. It's still turning, eh? Still turning. She's not shutting down. You bitch. Scott spots more trouble. Uh, a little bit of smoke uh, popping out of the exhaust. Black smoke. With one good engine and one crappy engine. That won't feather. A DC-4, if it started to do that, then they would shut the engine down right away. So right now there's very little else we can do except uh, limp her home. Cross our fingers. 
AJ and Scott start their approach to Yellowknife, where there's more bad news. The weather in Yellowknife is uh, not the greatest right now. The cloud cover is low, just 100 meters above the runway. The runway 15 back course, and we are having uh, engine issues. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Get priority for landing. The faltering engine that won't shut down is rocking pilots AJ DeCoast and Scott Blue as they try to get their shuttering C-46 cargo plane safely onto the runway in Yellowknife. 4615, uh, request priority landing sequence. When they break through the cloud cover, they'll have just seconds to find the runway. Doesn't, uh, you have to make sure that your approach is the first one's a good one because you don't really want to overshoot. They're down to 1,000. With only one good engine, they'll have just one chance at the landing. They won't have the power to climb back for another approach. Uh, you don't have a lot of room for error. Okay, I'll be honest, it's gonna be a bumpy approach. This is where their training kicks in. There's no time for emotion. They need to focus on getting safely onto the ground. 50 altitude. Clearing the clouds, they find themselves offline with the runway approaching fast. On the right, what do you got? On the right, you got the runway? Yeah, right full there. flap, full flap coming. AJ pulls full flap. Full flap set. He'll have to drop into position quickly to try and nail the landing. Ninety. Thirty-five. Finals are done. One hundred. A very tough landing, under extremely difficult conditions. Yet AJ and Scott pull it off superbly. You know, they say like a pilot's life is hours of boredom, punctuated by moments of sheer terror, eh? There's so many different things that you're wondering about. Once you're on the ground, all that stuff is gone. It's just like someone just pulled, you know, 100 pounds off your back or whatever. Both me and Scott were shaking a little bit there. You can notice whenever you move to, to move something, you notice. Yeah, it was just sort of, you know, we're calm, we're cool, we're talking fine, you know what I mean? But the body has is naturally, you know, your brain's not dumb, your body's not dumb. It knows this isn't a great spot to be in, guys. So it'll be a couple weeks before I, I'm completely back to normal, I would think. AJ and Scott talk it through as they put the plane to bed. Serious, but, I don't know, if one mag was like working 100%, I don't think it'd be that shaky myself, but. Maybe it was something else too. Yeah, no, it's for sure the one. You don't usually you forget who it was you're with when you when you uh, have some sort of problem with the airplane. So yeah, it's a bonding experience. I think that's a lot of the reason why I was, you know, I never I never freaked out once, you know, in the plane. I never lost it. You know, I had I had full faith in who was sitting next to me. It's the end of the week. There's no trip scheduled for tomorrow, so. It gives you a lot of confidence in the person you're with. If they didn't make any mistakes and they did everything you wanted them to, then. The next time, you're probably going to be a little bit less nervous than you were, you know, that time. Scott just wanted a little flying time, but in the end, he got much more. The chance to prove himself cool under pressure in the eyes of his captain. All right, man. Yeah, for sure. Well, good work. Absolutely. See you later, eh? Yeah. AJ and Scott are home safe. It was like, you know, go jumping like that a little bit. And same thing with the RPM was wandering a little bit. Though AJ down might down downplay the story to his fiance. But the challenges of keeping Buffalo flying this winter are just beginning. Next time on Ice Pilots NWT. Okay, AJ, crank it over. With Christmas just around the corner. It's absolute crunch time. Buffalo's supply runs are a crucial lifeline to the north. Officer, get the groceries on the shelf. But engine problems on the C-46 aircraft wreak havoc on the delivery. Usually the propeller will move, but because the engine is so cold, this thing right now would never start. And tensions reach a peak. Don't fly the plane tonight! 
This week on Ice Pilots NWT. AJ, crank it over. That engine seized up. Food and mail flights to the north are grounded. We gotta take her off. That's strange. Landing gear is still hanging down there. It's a no-go for tonight. Don't fly the plane tonight. Especially when it's minus 40. This is Sunday. This happened Wednesday. Hang on to your hat, boy. Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. A bitter cold snap just before Christmas. A time when isolated settlements in the Arctic depend more than ever on Buffalo Airways to deliver food, supplies, and presents. But when it's this cold and there's so much on the line, things have a way of going south. You already got that idea in your head that everything's gonna break. So it's almost maybe a self-fulfilling prophecy. Still, Buffalo founder Joe McBrien pushes to get the job done. You gotta come up there with a covered wagon and an auction, you gotta get your groceries over to, to, to those shelves. We gotta live by that. Joe has to keep these old warplanes flying, even in the deep freeze. They're the only way to get food and mail to four tiny communities along the Mackenzie Valley. Fort Good Hope, Norman Wells, Toledo, and Delaney. Cold weather coming, whatever's worn a little or something like that, that's when it's going to break. Today, Captain A.J. DeCoste will fly the Valley Run in this vintage World War II aircraft, the C-46. I'm from Nova Scotia. I did my flight training there. And uh, I came to Buffalo with little or no experience, really. At Buffalo Airways, A.J. came a long way. Now he's the captain of one of the hardest airplanes to fly at Buffalo Airways, and I'd argue one of the hardest airplanes to fly in the world. The C-46 has a wide fuselage and a broad tail, making it vulnerable to crosswinds, especially with its small rudder. Plus, with most of its weight behind the main wheels, the back end can swing around if not landed straight. The Curtis Wright C-46 Commando is legendary. She flew U.S. troops and equipment in World War II. Soldiers called her Dumbo after the Disney elephant. She's big, unwieldy, and powerful. She made it through the war. Now, Buffalo Airways C-46 is the stalwart of the Mackenzie Valley Run. There's a need for that type of airplane in a frontier area. If you look at the age of the 46, the airplane must be a very, very good airplane to be that old and have survived so many other airplanes that have, have come, did their time, and went. With the conditions of the runways and the weather patterns in the north, the C-46 was our really only choice. I don't really think there's much else out there that could do the job that these airplanes do. It's like a big pig, eh? Like a big old pig. OK, AJ, crank it over. Scott Blue is the co-pilot on today's flight. At six foot seven inches, the only cockpit in the fleet that he fits into is the C-46. He was just too tall. Was, that's his nickname, actually, too tall. I gave him that name. He can reach things that I can't, eh? He's been flying for like six or eight months with us now, and he's actually doing great. You know, I love the, you know, fire up in the morning, you know? Bang, bang, bang. It's just cool, you know what I mean? The last time AJ and Scott flew this C-46, they had to shut down the right engine and land with just the left one. Buffalo 523, you're clear for takeoff, runway 27. 523 on the roll. With their pre-flight checks done, it's takeoff time. 
AJ and Scott head out for four stops up the Mackenzie Valley. Five two three Buffalo, winds calm. Altimeter three zero eight six. No reporting traffic. Right over there. Oh, you can turn. On the leg from Fort Good Hope to Norman Wells, 700 kilometers from Yellowknife, things start to unravel. We touched down, everything seemed fine. There was not an indication whatsoever in any instance whatsoever that anything was wrong. Filled her up with gas. AJ tried to start number two, like he always does. No. Scott, can you go check that right engine? So I had Scott go outside and actually try to physically move the propeller. Gave it a little bit of a tug, nothing. Gave it a little bit more, a little bit more, and you're, you're not going to hurt the thing. And as hard as I could, as hard as I could pull on that thing, and it wouldn't budge. And then I just yelled out, hey, Jay, she don't budge. So I knew then it was something else more serious. It's minus 38, and now Scott and AJ are stranded on the tarmac in Norman Wells. I can't budge. If this C-46 needs replacement parts, there could be a problem. Finding spares isn't easy. These parts are a scarce commodity dug up from a dwindling supply of wartime surplus or salvaged from the few scrap planes still around. There's a lot of competition for the 46. There's 10 airplanes left. It's like a race. Whoever gets there first gets the part. At the Buffalo Parts Department, uh, manager Ron Woolowich says with only a handful of C-46s still flying, this airplane's days are numbered. I'm serious, this 46, we keep this thing flying by the seat of our pants. They'll be going to the boneyard not because they can't fly, it's because you can't put the parts on them to fly anymore. And it's going to be a sad day. Up in Norman Wells, Buffalo's lead mechanic, Chuck Adams, arrives to check out the C-46 engine problem. He's a very knowledgeable uh, C-46 mechanic. Servicing these planes is in his blood. My dad worked on these. My dad was the director of maintenance for NWT era. We're the last of it all, right here, this, all these old piston pounders. They called me to come on up here and assess the situation. And the situation is, uh, it no good. Oh, it's seized, man. Something's gone inside the engine. I can't fix it. It's impossible. I thought you could fix anything, Chuck. Sometimes I can, but I left my magic wand at home. Chuck is going to have to perform some kind of crazy magic to get this seized up C-46 running. If he can't, a lot of people's Christmas presents will sit backed up in Buffalo's cargo terminal, 700 kilometers down in Yellowknife. Coming up, stuck landing gear tests a Buffalo pilot's nerve. If it doesn't lock, then it'll just collapse on you. That's the only thing that's really going through my head. It couldn't happen at a worse time. Buffalo Airways C-46 cargo plane has broken down in the remote Arctic village of Norman Wells at a critical time, the pre-Christmas rush. The cold weather coming, whatever's worn a little, that's when it's gonna break. Mechanic Chuck Adams has been flown in to see if he can fix the problem. Oh, it's seized, man. Something's gone inside the engine. But it's obvious that this is no quick fix. We're gonna take her off. They need to fly in a whole new engine. Replacing this 3,500-pound, 18-cylinder Pratt & Whitney in the middle of nowhere in minus 40 temperatures will be a colossal task. It has Chuck pondering career options. If you couldn't be doing this, what would you be doing? I would probably be a porn star. All you gotta do is get it up. <laughs> Chuck is a character, my friend. Extremely good guy and just hilarious. Chuck orders a full engine sent up from Yellowknife. Once it gets here, he'll have to pull off the seized engine and install the new one, here on the wind whip tarmac. Chuck. 
Back in Yellowknife, Buffalo General Manager Mikey McBrien needs to find a way to get that replacement engine to Norman Wells fast. Plus, he has to come up with a way to move the important shipments of Christmas food and goods already backing up in the cargo terminal. Groceries are under contract. Uh, they got about 48 hours from they're delivered to us to when they're delivered to the end user. The customer doesn't care about what's going on here. The customer doesn't care there's an airplane stuck in the wells. The customer doesn't care it's 35 below. They don't care about this stuff. All we gotta do is just make them happy. There's elders up there that, you know, they're not dusting off their guns to go shoot a caribou. I mean, they, they need this food. How would you feel if you couldn't make your kid a lunch for school? You know, anything like that. Mikey breaks the news to his father, Buffalo owner Joe McBrien. Hey, Dad. Yeah. Hey, a uh, little uh, crummy news for you. Um, I guess the 46 is in the wells right now with the bum engine. So... You know what? We're not coming up there. Tired of this shit. He's coming in. He's pissed off. Think about my father. He's not concerned about um, the, the aircraft per se. He's concerned about what the customers think. Buffalo is now in jeopardy of breaching their biggest contract. Joe decides to kill two birds with one plane by sending both the supplies and the engine on the backup C-46. Go up there and get the groceries on the shelf. Yeah. That's the idea. You can't sell groceries to back here. No, nope, I fully so, understand. But the backup C-46 isn't winter ready. With only eight hours left before Buffalo's contracted delivery deadline lapses, the big cargo plane must take a test flight. Captain Devin Brooks is at the controls. A couple of years ago, he applied to Buffalo on a whim. It was about minus 35 in the November, end of November when I came and almost turned around. They put me in food mail for two weeks and I really didn't like that. So I didn't unpack my car. <laughs> then I started to fly the 46. A year later, they made me captain on it. Here we are now, after two years and a couple months. Ten minutes into the test flight, and Devin's had enough. We're freezing our asses off. All right, Adam, jump up here. I'm getting cold and I'm getting crazy. The test flight is a bust. The cockpit is like a freezer. Well, our, our plan was this morning to uh, convert this aircraft to a winter aircraft, and uh, we kind of uh, failed the test flight on it. The heater failed to ignite. It's absolute crunch time. We have our engine that's needed to be sent up, and we have uh, late groceries. We have uh, customers on the phone looking for their stuff. They need this food, especially this time of year because it's Christmas, and I mean, they're waiting for their turkeys and all their stuff, presents, everything. They depend on us to get it to them. In an icebound community like Delanay, there is no permanent road in or out. It's one of the last stops on the Mackenzie Valley Run, and even a delay to Buffalo service can be a hardship. Buffalo, I would consider a lifeline to the community because Dillon is an isolated community. Um, we only have a rent road access three months out of the year, nine months out of the year. Everything's flown in. While some of Delaney's 600 residents still hunt and fish, more and more they depend on food air freighted from the south. White fish there. We're still waiting for the buffalo to come in. And if you take a look at the stores, then, you know, they're out of bread, they're running out of milk, their, their produce is old. Seymour Jacobs, who runs the Great Bear Co-op in Delaney, is getting frustrated. Morning, buffalo. Hi, Kelly. Seymour calling from Great Bear Co-op. Hey, Seymour. How are you? So what happened to the freight? Uh... plane broke down, so I couldn't get the freight out to everybody. Sorry, buddy. That one will go, and then this one. Kelly and her husband Juan came to Buffalo from British Columbia just over a year ago. Juan got a job as a mechanic. I thought I was just going to come up here, you know, maybe work in the mines or do something. And then as soon as I got here, they said to bring me over and hired me immediately. Kelly's definitely a people person when it comes to management. 
that pellet. People gravitate to her. She's so nice. Uh, when she's around, it makes everybody work harder. She's great to work with. She's great people. She takes care of everybody like your, your family. She's a sweetheart. Um, it's as simple as that. All the customers seem to be happy. Everything is going well. And overall, she's doing an um, excellent, excellent job. We're never going to get through this. And today, Kelly's anxious to find a way to get the cargo to her customers. It's the only place they're going to get the food from is us, so it's pretty important that we get it up there today. So <laughs> we're working on plan B, which usually always happens is plan B. After hours of repair, the backup C46 cockpit heaters are ready for another test run. We're actually going to take it out in the air and see if she goes. Uh, this is our second test flight of the morning. Oh yeah, it should be able to go now. She should be good to go. This time, the C46's cockpit heaters ignite. The plane should be winter ready. The Buffalo team prepares for a full capacity load. Hopefully, this will all fit on the plane because we've got the engine and all the tools and everything else going on it. First up, easing in the 3,500-pound engine bound for Norman Wells. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, slowly, slowly. But Norman Wells is losing its luster for the Buffalo crew cooling their jets there. Is it a town that I would like to spend a lot of time in? Personally, no. Um, a little too small for me. Norman Wells, population 800. A couple of restaurants, one library, zero nightlife. There was little to do but, you know, jack up our TV time. While Scott is single, AJ's missing his fiance Candace back in Yellowknife. And Chuck, he has a wife and three kids back home. Here's the wife. Over here, right? She's the mother of the three angels. Yeah. One, two, where's the other one? Come here. Wave the camera. Smile. And the waiting is grinding his gears. <laughs> what do we got? Yeah, here's what we got. Piece of cheese <laughs> and beginner beer. <laughs> I hope my friends don't see me in yelling with this because they, they would disown me. Like, I'm a professional alcoholic. <laughs> And that is beginner beer. Loaded to the max, the backup C-46, piloted by Captain Devin Brooks and co-pilot Gord Cooling, finally takes off from Yellowknife on the rescue mission. It's bound for Norman Wells with the replacement engine. That's strange. But something's not right. Hmm. It doesn't seem like landing gear is going up properly. I want to give him a call and check the radio. Hey, TXW there, I uh, noticed uh, on takeoff their wheels are a little slow. Yeah, it looks like the landing gear is uh, still hanging down there. It looks like both of our yaw pumps aren't working. The hydraulics aren't lifting the landing gear. There's something wrong, and it's too risky to keep trying to pull up the wheels in case the gear does come up and then get stuck in the undercarriage. That's when their heart starts racing. Mikey has no choice. He orders Devin to turn around and bring the plane back, but neither of them even knows for sure if the stuck landing gear is properly locked down. Like, if it doesn't lock, then it'll just collapse on you. That's the only thing that's really going through my head. Your mind automatically goes to the bad scenarios. If the hydraulics haven't locked the landing gear, the plane will crash belly down on the runway. Is the landing gear going to collapse on landing? You're already preparing yourself for the worst. With a desperately needed engine and Christmas food and cargo aboard, Buffalo Airways backup C-46 has finally set off from Yellowknife. It's on a rescue mission to Norman Wells, 700 kilometers north where the main plane has broken down. But the rash of mechanical problems isn't over yet. The, the freaking perfect storm. We have a problem with the 46 and Norman Wells. It needs an engine, so we're using the backup. And sure enough, it takes off, and the freaking landing gear is stuck down. Now that's another problem. 
With no other alternative but to turn back and try to land the plane, Captain Devin Brooks prepares for the worst. Doesn't lock then. Hmm. You're in a, it'll just collapse on you. That's the only thing that's really going through my head. Okay. Well, this is a pain in the ass. But that's only half of Devin's concern. Just leave the flaps down so we don't uh, use up what hydraulics we have. Uh, we just want to make sure we have enough pressure in the system to use our brakes. Got full flap, full flap coming. Even if the landing gear is locked down, Devin still fears that if there's a leak in the hydraulic system, he may not have enough pressure to apply the brakes. So he uses full flaps to slow the plane as much as he can on approach. It's all he can do now. The C-46 landing gear holds, and so do the brakes. But Buffalo has missed its delivery deadline. Realistically, that plane was supposed to leave on Friday. It being Saturday night, and you see the plane's moving in the wrong direction right now. The C-46 seems cursed. I'm smiling now, but I'm smiling under just extreme duress. Uh, there's a lot of people that wanted their stuff today. We'll get into them tomorrow. Yeah, Mike. Coming tonight, or is going to come tomorrow morning? It's a no go for tonight. A no go. Oh, yeah. It's a no go for tonight. That was Chucky and Norman Wells. Uh, he's asking when he can get in his engine, and I had to give him the bad news that his engine is 20 feet away from us and not in the air, heading towards him as we speak. Well, they're still having problems with that 46. It's in the hangar right now, getting made this somehow. This waiting game for the engine is taking its toll. You know what happens? I get stuck in town. First of all, I'm gonna turn gate. <laughs> I got roped into this somehow. And I gotta backtrack, figure out how they roped me into this. After another long night in the hangar, Adam and the other Buffalo mechanics fixed the hydraulic problem with the C46 landing gear. I'm hoping it's all good now. I'm just having a final look over, make sure nothing's uh, falling apart. But now, there's such a backlog of food for delivery, one flight can't carry it all for all four communities. Perfect. The supplies for Delaney will have to be bumped another day. And that's more bad news for Seymour Jacobs, who runs the local food co-op. Not coming in again today. No. Uh, come, you're not coming in today. I couldn't get your rest of your stuff on there. Couldn't get it on the plane. Because they had to take an engine up to Norman Wells. It'll be on the plane tomorrow. Seymour's not happy, okay. and neither okay. is Kelly. The pressure of managing the backlog is starting to get okay. to her. Bye. Shit, already I'm like 5.30 in the morning till 5 o'clock at night, and this week was seven days a week. I mean, it wears on a person. At last, after an unplanned vacation in Norman Wells, mechanic Chuck Adams' ship has finally come in. It's carrying the C-46 replacement engine he and pilots AJ and Scott have been waiting for for four days. How's it going, partner? You guys should have been here Thursday night with the engine, not today. It's Sunday. This happened Wednesday. <laughs> really? Really. What about, uh, well, I'm partner. pissed off because you guys couldn't organize a banging a new road. There's no hangar space to work in, but Chuck is given access to power just outside the hangar. Now, the only trick is to drag 17 tons of vintage steel with a half-ton pickup. I couldn't believe that, you know, that little old Ford F-150 was dragging the C-46. I mean, we're crawling along at two miles an hour, but in reverse,
In Yellowknife, the Christmas cargo is piling up on manager Kelly Durasevic. I had to bump a lot. We haven't flown since Wednesday, and what is it, Sunday now, so. It's been brutal. Plane's breaking down, not getting the food out, having to work seven days a week. It's loving it. The Buffalo couriers keep bringing in more freight, but Kelly can't ship it out fast enough. Well, we're backed up bad. I got two trucks sitting out there that are full. We got another friggin' truck here. I got nowhere to do the freight or move it in here because it, it's just nuts. It's Christmas. And everybody just expects me to jump and have the shit ready and get it moved. The Arctic temperatures are crippling just about everything. Park that broke down inside the warehouse. We can't unload any of the trucks to get the flights ready. And I'm irritated. And she isn't the only one. Mike Dunn oversees Buffalo's courier van service. Five out of my eight vans won't start, uh, so I, I've, I've got three on the road scrambling to get done what I can. The cold snap is not only wreaking mechanical havoc, but emotional turmoil as well. Mike Dunn loses it and throws a tantrum in the office. Mike, you scared the f***ing shit out of Rose. I'm not kidding you. I don't need her to quit. Like, she, when you threw the phone, you freaked her right out. So, okay, give me a hug. I love you. <laughs> Mike's throwing shit, throwing phones, freaking out. Rose is scared, which isn't good. You don't have to scare Rose. She's our new employee. Mike makes a power play, deciding he needs to take charge of Kelly's cargo transport operation. It's all hell broke loose, I guess, and he spoke with me that he's got to be in charge of my loads too and this and that now. Basically, Mike Dunn, from the gist of it, I heard he says, I'm the boss, we'll do it my way. I mean, shit, it's exhausting. I'm not very happy. I don't know what to do. With conflict among employees, there's a high chance that either Kelly or Mike Dunn will be leaving, and we just hopefully it doesn't get to that point. But it does. Kelly's had enough. Well, if Kelly's walking out the door, we're all walking out. Because, to be honest, the only reason we're all working here and everybody's so happy over there is because of Kelly. Pushed to the brink, with Christmas cargo piling up, Kelly's on the verge of quitting. And if she does, she may take half the cargo terminal staff with her. With their C-46 cargo plane grounded, and Christmas deliveries backing up. Buffalo's courier depot is in chaos. Cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic is on the verge of quitting after freight operations manager Mike Dunn threatens to take over her job. Please, I didn't understand why, what I've done wrong because I mean, all I give a shit about is Buffalo. If Kelly ever left, I'd leave, Juan would leave, the news would leave, and probably quite a few people would leave. To avoid a total walkout, Kelly confronts Mike Dunn. Well, I want us to be friends. We work together, and you are my friend, and I've explained that to everybody. You okay? She brokers an uneasy Take peace with Mike. He reluctantly agrees. She'll continue to run the cargo terminal. I'm just standing down here, Devin. And it's back to work loading Devin's C-46. We gotta get this one on the way right now because the engines are already getting down. Prepare for takeoff on runway 427. Prepare for takeoff on 427. It'll be a right hand turn straight on ahead. In Norman Wells, Chuck and his assistant Glenn are busy removing the seized up C 46 engine. We are in day one of the swap, I guess. It's about minus 30 today, so it's just beautiful. Oh, it's lovely. You know, it's like being in Florida on the beach. All we're missing is the chicks. We ain't got no chicks. Well, we've got to get a pin out of there, right? To get this this river off. It's quite obvious. I can't see the goddamn thing. The frost fighters provide some relief from the cold, but spew a blinding fog. You got the wind blowing snow on occasions, and it's just oil and grease and grime and hydraulic fluid. Pretty much there was just a trail of goo and mess everywhere we went. Let's see what oil's like at minus 30. You get covered in oil, you can't avoid it. It's like molasses coming off the engine, it's all frozen. 
You gotta walk up and down ladders, you gotta bend in, you gotta basically crawl inside the back of the engine. You can see this is a young man's game. You don't have to join the Army or the Navy to get an experience like this. You just gotta join Buffalo Airways. Right, partner? Meanwhile, Captain Devin Brooks is making up for lost time. After a delivery to Fort Good Hope, Devin powers on to Delaney, where Seymour Jacobs and his customers have waited almost a week for their food shipment. But the string of bad luck strikes again. Devin is forced to stop short of Delaney and make a pit stop in, of all places, Norman Wells. That's where head mechanic Chuck Adams has been battling the bitter wind and cold as he tries to replace the entire engine on the disabled C-46 grounded there. To see 246s down in Norman Wells is very rare. Oh, brother. I think I've only had two the whole time I've been here that have broken down out in the field. Chuck manages to tune up Devin's engine so he can fly the plane back to Yellowknife for a full repair. But making the food delivery today to Delaney is out of the question. In this deep freeze, engines freeze up within a half hour. Devin needs to get going quickly. Race is so once the tents come off, we don't freeze up. Especially when it's minus 40. But the curse won't let up. While sweeping off ice, high up on the wings, Devin falls 10 feet onto the frozen tarmac. He fell off the wing and I sort of tried to half catch him, which may or may not, I mean, yeah, he screwed up his shoulder. Despite his injury, Devin is determined to fly back to Yellowknife before the engines freeze. He phones Kelly to let her know the shipment destined for Delaney will not be delivered tonight. That's unknown ID. Hello, this is Kelly. The call catches Kelly at home, where she's hosting a party for the Buffalo yeah, Gang. Hey, how's it going? Kelly's role here at Buffalo is uh, officially she's the head of food mail, but her unofficial uh, role here is, is sort of like the mom of everybody. I just make sure I always invite the, the boys over and you know cook them dinner and have drinks and play poker or whatever and you know show them that they're loved because when I came up here I was pretty lonely for my family and Buffalo became my family. Are you sure you're gonna be all right to get home? Promise me? Lots of these kids are like my own kids. Like, God, if anything happened to them, I don't know what I would do. Okay, I'll call you right back. Worried about Devin's condition after his fall, Kelly calls her boss, Joe McBrien. Yeah, Joe, hey, how's it going? Devin just contacted me. He's gonna just fly straight home with the aircraft. Joe, I would like to make a call to tell that plane to stay there. I'm really worried. It's dark, it's late, and I don't want anything to happen to those guys, Joe. Well, I think we'll be hanging down today. Okay. The boys will take a rest, double up tomorrow. Kelly relays Joe's decision to Devin. I want to give you guys the heads up. I spoke with Joe, you and like I explained that you hurt your arm. Devin was fine to fly. He had a sore arm. I think his injury was blown out of proportion back in Yellowknife. Joe doesn't want you to come home tonight. Joe made the call because it's too late. He doesn't want the airplane to move. In the Norman Wells terminal, Chuck Adams gets wind of the change of plans. What do you mean shut down? Who said that? Joe. Bullshit. No. That's the worst mistake you can make right now. Joe McBride made the call that you guys stay in the fucking well. I don't care what she says or Joe says or anybody else. Yeah, you get to run them right now and get back to the old Okay, Devin. Joe made the call. Don't fly the plane tonight. Buffalo Airways is buckling under the strain of the pre Christmas rush. Don't fly the plane tonight. The bitter cold weather and a crazy string of mechanical bad luck. In Norman Wells, C-46 Captain Devin Brooks and his crew have been ordered to stay the night. 
Now they pay the price, waking up to a frosty minus 50. The C-46 engines exposed overnight might as well be set in concrete. Usually the propeller will move when you pull it. I'm putting a, quite a bit of force on it, but because the engine is so cold, the oils are pretty much like molasses. So that's why we're putting the heat on the engines and the oils. This thing right now would never start. Mechanic Chuck Adams knows they missed their best chance to get out last night. You know, they wouldn't listen to me, they could have flew at home. For four hours, they warmed the engines with diesel heaters. Finally, Devin can take off for Yellowknife. Where the cargo backlog has reached epic proportions. The continued setbacks have Seymour Jacobs of the Great Bear Co-op in Delaney at the end of his rope. It's frustrating. Another day, no freight. No bread, no bread. No fresh produce to eat, no fresh milk. On and over, we're in terrible shape. The 46 breaks down, the second 46 has a problem. The stuff's not getting there. Okay, this week is mechanical. Next week is weather. Next week is something else. It's always a bag of tricks. And I don't blame the communities. The communities don't care how their chips get to their place. They don't care if it comes on dog sled or comes on a 747, as long as it gets there. The product is no good in the airplane. It's only good on the shelf. With both C-46s out of commission and too much cargo for any of the regular fleet to handle, Buffalo Joe makes his move. I thought it'd be a good time to exercise the electric, see how it works. The Electra, Buffalo's recently purchased turboprop cargo plane, is the latest addition to the fleet. In a hangar full of planes from the 1940s, this shiny 1950s era plane seems sleek and futuristic by comparison. It was the first turboprop airplane built in the US. With a 100-foot wingspan and with 15,000 horsepower at takeoff, the Electra can carry over 12 tons of cargo. It's done its test flights, it's done its little fussiness, and uh, yeah, it's basically ready to go. Now, it will make its maiden voyage under the Buffalo Airways banner. It's got a lot of advantages with its, with its power. With turbine engines powering propellers, the Electra cruises at 350 knots, more than double the cruising speed of the C-46, and carries twice the payload, but at a price. This airplane here, we turn uh, jet fuel into black smoke. This will suck uh, 5,000 pounds an hour. That's $4,000 of fuel guzzled every hour. To justify that kind of cost, the Electra needs a massive payload, almost 30,000 pounds worth. And that's just about the weight of the cargo backed up in the terminal. So the Electra will be packed full. Well, I love the Electra. There's no other airplane around that can, can do what the Electra does. It carries a, a good big load and, and it's fast. But nothing the size of the Electra has ever landed in Delaney. Twice as heavy as the C-46, the Electra requires an extra 1,000 feet of runway to take off and land. Fortunately, Delaney has just extended its strip to 4,000 feet, the minimum length the Electra needs. Hi, Kelly. Seymour calling from Great Bear Corps. Hey, Seymour. How are you? Not too bad. So what's going on with our freight? Well, buddy, I'm having a flight with the Electra, and you have 7,000 pounds on the plane. So are you telling me all my freight is there? You, yeah, bread, produce, milk, dairy, general, frozen. I promise it'll be there. OK, thank you very much. Kelly's given Seymour her word that the food will ship out. But the weather over Delaney has turned. There's no guarantee that the Electra will be able to land. Seymour Jacobs heads to Delaney's airstrip to see with his own eyes. It was a week yesterday that we had our last freight. 
It's been eight days. And now we wait. Conditions are treacherous. There's a thick ice fog and crosswind so powerful that the lighter C-46 would have never been able to land. Through the fog, the Electra finds the runway. It has never landed here before. Touching down at 120 knots, the turboprops are thrust into reverse. For Seymour, the Electra's arrival is a welcome relief. Yes, we got our stuff. And for his patience... We need them all one day. Thank you very much. Hey, no problem. Tell Kelly Tangs. I will. A box of donuts from Kelly. The Electra has proven itself, making deliveries up the Mackenzie Valley in less than half the time it would take the C-46 to shuttle this same load. Back in Norman Wells, mechanic Chuck Adams and the wind-whipped crew of the disabled C-46 are finally installing the 3,500-pound replacement engine. Hold it! When you're putting an engine on, you're connecting up oil lines, hydraulic lines. It takes a long time just to line it up because it's half frozen. You got to work with those gloves. That's something you have to get used to if you want to do this right now. You better take your gloves off. Christ. Oh, yeah, I have my moments. Let me assure you. I curse, I swear. Christ. Well, that's Chuck. I'm always bitching. If I ain't bitching, I'm not happy. Bullshit. Ten days, a uh, whole lot of waiting. 16 kilograms of MSG each from the Chinese food at the hotel. So we're finally, it's all finished up, buttoned down, lock wire, tightened, corked, ready to rock, we hope. If it doesn't start, I'm going to flip. I just spent 10 days here. And if it don't start, I'm going to snap. For 10 days, Buffalo Air's trusty C-46 has been the problem child of the fleet. It broke down and left its crew stranded in the isolated village of Norman Wells. That caused chaos right before Christmas for Buffalo's crucial food deliveries in the Mackenzie Valley. Mechanic Chuck Adams, his assistant Glenn and pilots AJ and Scott have endured brutal cold as they swapped out the entire engine to revive this old warbird. Now, it's the moment of truth. If it doesn't start, I'm gonna flip. But I just spent 10 days here, and if it don't start, I'm gonna snap. Oh, for sure, but yeah, freedom. Freedom from Northern Wells. We're going home, boys. Friggin' A. We're going home. Did I know it was going to start? No. Was I glad it started? Yeah. If it didn't start, you guys would have had some real good footage. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would have started with the camera guy. Third 30. Buffalo Airway C-46 is finally back up and running and heading home to Yellowknife for Christmas. Well, I say to myself every time I'm done one of them jobs, I'm ready to quit. I've had enough. If they wanted me to do it tomorrow, I'd probably go do it again tomorrow. Next time on Ice Pilots NWT, an all-night attempt to turn a DC-4 into an airborne fuel tanker. Damage to the valves, we're gonna have a pretty big spill. 
trouble between the sexes heats up with the arrival of a female pilot. If there's anybody who's going to jump somebody in line, it's a girl. And Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader has a birthday from hell. Oh! In this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Buffalo Airways turns a DC-4 into a flying fuel tanker. Trouble between the sexes heats up with the arrival of a new pilot. Welcome to Buffalo. And Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader has a birthday from hell. <laughs> The Christmas season has come and gone at Buffalo Airways, and with it, a string of problems on the Mackenzie Valley Run. The Valley Run is very challenging. It is a thousand miles. That aircraft flies a thousand miles four times a week. Today, Buffalo's most senior employee, 65-year-old Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader, is flying the run. No one at Buffalo has more experience than Arnie, and no one knows him like Kelly Jurasevic. He's a workaholic. Arnie likes to fly, and I think as long as he can fly, Arnie will fly. As Chief Pilot, Arnie also trains Buffalo's rookie pilots. A lot of them are just like sons, you know? Oh yeah, you get very, very close to them. Eh? Arnie's in a, in a spot now where he's kind of like an old Jedi, like Obi-Wan Kenobi, where he uh, has to pass on his knowledge. Today, some of that knowledge will be passed on to his co-pilot, Scott Blue. Watching him, you know, you learn a ton. He's got thousands and thousands of hours on some seriously cool machines. I've got about 37,000 hours, so that would be about four and a half years in the air. Arnie and Scott's valley run in the C-46 aircraft include stops in Norman Wells, Fort Good Hope, and Delaney. And today, something new. They're taking Kelly along for the ride. Scott's probably looking for me. Well, I'm pretty excited. I've never been on the 46, and I've worked here for a year, so I can hardly wait to go, because I get to meet all the people in the communities. Arnie's given me the chance to go, and I'm really, really excited. She wanted to go along because she wanted to meet and greet all the people that she deals with every day on the phone. So it's very good of her to want to do that, because most of the people we've had working there don't do that. The first stop on today's Valley Run is Norman Wells. Just before Christmas, co-pilot Scott Blue was stranded there for 10 days when the C-46's engine seized up. He's hoping this visit will be short and sweet. But first, he has to land the bulky C-46 in gusty conditions. Roger, that thing will pretty high. Lower your nose. Oh, okay. Good, Scott. You're doing good. Instead of a delivery, Arnie and the crew have a pickup here. A 900 pound pipe destined for Yellowknife. It's an unwieldy piece of cargo. Turn it like this. Good, 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 good. Jump forward. They were rushing it a little bit with that forklift. The driver was a little jerky with the forklift. It was a different guy operating that forklift than normally does. Eh? Dale? 
Did it hit the plane? No. Oh, cow. That was a close call. You know, when he slipped and fell, too, and I thought that pipe had hit him, it scared the hell out of me. Like, I couldn't imagine if something happened to Arnie. Steel against steel, it moves pretty quick when it decides to slide. All right, he's a little bit too narrow on that. And thank God it didn't hit the tail, or else we'd have been screwed. That stuff happens now and again. Hopefully not too often, but it does. Let's leave it. Tip up, Kyle. We'll leave it and come back and pick it up in the boat's office. Arnie decides to give the forklift driver a chance to practice. He'll come back later after they've unloaded more cargo up the valley. Uh, nobody got hurt. The plane's okay, right? Yeah. That's better. Thank God. No oh, shit. Next stop, Fort Good Hope, where Kelly meets one of her customers. Hi, George. Yes. I'm Kelly. Oh, nice to finally meet you, my dear. That's really heavy, George. You got her? She's locked. We're all We're all Then it's off to Delaney. A remote community of 250 souls on the shore of Great Bear Lake. Less than 100 clicks south of the Arctic Circle. Before Christmas, Kelly had to bump Delaney's food and mail shipment for over a week due to mechanical problems on the C-46. And her customers weren't happy. Sometimes I get a little bitchy, especially Seymour over his potato chips. Seymour, my buddy! <laughs> I make sure he gets them no matter what. I'll bump his milk versus, you know, he's got to have those chips. It's so good to meet you, Seymour. Awesome. That's my Seymour Jacobs, who runs the local food co-op, has never met Kelly in person, and she's not exactly as advertised. I told him I was 500 pounds, about four feet tall. It's so good to meet you. A quick visit, but long enough for Kelly to put a face to what was just a voice on the phone. It was awesome. It was really good. He's hilarious. It's so funny how you think somebody looks, and then you finally meet them, and they look so different. That's pretty cool. Next, Arnie and the crew are heading back up the valley to pick up that massive pipe that gave them so much trouble in Norman Wells. Straight ahead now. Straight ahead now. As far as you can go. This time, Arnie uses the onboard winch to help pull the 900 pound pipe into the cargo bay. and leaves the heavy lifting to his crew. Okay, come on. The pipe's on board. Time to head back to Yellowknife. From the most senior flyer on Buffalo's roster to the one who hopes to be the newest. Jeremy Dow is a ramp hand, or rampy. Bet. The entry-level position at Buffalo Airways. Uh, any bets on how successfully I'm going to make it to the van? Straight out of flight school, Jeremy's come north with ambitions to fly Buffalo's big vintage World War II aircraft. Yes. I rock. But before he can get into those planes, he first has to pay his dues as a courier van driver making pickups and deliveries all over town and working the ramp in the brutal cold. At six foot four, 245 pounds, Rampy Jeremy can haul ass with the best of them. After four months on the ramp, he knows what it takes to move up at Buffalo. You have to work as hard as you can all the time, running, working, lifting. It all has to be done with just the best, most efficient, fastest way you can possibly do it. The key to Jeremy making the jump from the ramp to the cockpit is someone who comes from the other side of the world. Ramon Shravastava, not your typical rampy. Ramon came here on uh, my recommendation. I met him during some flight training down in Vancouver. He's the guy who called me up here. Yeah, this is a new word. Him here is all my fault. I feel fine about it. My, clear, my conscience is clear. 
Ramon traded the balmy heat of his home in Kanpur, India for the deep freeze of northern Canada. The day I landed here, it was the coldest day in the like, world, they said. Like. So coming all the way from here to... What the heck? This. Yeah, like. Oh, Ramon's a nice guy. Good. He's a uh, hard worker. He's, he's trying to make the best of everything living up here. Quite a few people here, they said, you are crazy, you're gonna make a mistake in your life. It's gonna be very, very tough for you. And if the bone-numbing temperatures aren't bad enough, the job requires a fair bit of muscle. And for Ramon, that's in short supply. I'm not feeling that stronger as they are right now, but trying to build up my muscles so that compete with them for sure. Yeah, he's struggling a bit with the, uh, with the physical aspect of it. It's uh, certainly his first physically demanding job. He's in good shape, he's just very small. If Ramon can tough it out, he could replace Jeremy as a rampant, freeing Jeremy to move up the ladder. Moving up the ranks, one step. I'm definitely the next in line. But there's a new rampy who has just arrived at Buffalo, and she could really throw a wrench into Jeremy's plans. Still to come, Arnie Schrader rides out a bumpy 66th birthday, Buffalo style. Hang on to your hat, boy. Have your rough. In the dead of winter in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, the sun rises at 10 and sets before 4. Just arrived from Quebec, some 3,000 kilometers away, Audrey Marchand heads off in the dark for her first day of work at Buffalo Airways. Audrey was working for a small airline in the south and chalked up just over 200 hours in the cockpit. She's come to Buffalo with the hope of quickly building her flying time on some seriously big planes. If I can be a co-pilot uh, in about uh, three or four months, it will be fine. When a pilot comes in Buffalo Airways, they think that they should be flying right away. But that's not the way things work around here. Audrey is thrown onto the ramp where Director of Flight Operations Mike Hanley gives her a quick orientation. The aircraft in the tail. What I'll do is I'll watch them when they come and I'll give them a thumbs up because we also have to watch the wingtip on the other DC-3 park here. Yes. So we have to make sure when he comes in, he doesn't clip the other wingtip. So really Audrey tries to follow Mike's rapid-fire instructions. So you always want to hold your hand out far beside you and have your thumb up in the air. Okay, great. A lot of our young guys are notorious. They'll just sit there and stand there like this or like this. <laughs> if it's too close to your body, you can't see it. If you have any questions, we'll just ask. Okay. Like, don't, don't ever think you don't have to ask a question. If you don't ask, that's the worst thing to do. It's a lot for Audrey to absorb, but that's how Buffalo operates. Quickly grab the chalks. You're thrown into the fire on day one. The DC-3 arrives. I was really impressed because the planes are so big. It's time for Audrey to get to work as a rampy. The fact of the matter is not everybody can do it or, or is willing to do it. But at Buffalo Airways, if you can survive this, the training period, when you're down in the, in the trenches and you work your way up, you could be a Buffalo Airways pilot. And on her very first shift, Audrey meets the man she will have to impress, Buffalo Joe McBrien. Morning, Joe. We have a new rabbi start today. Who's that? It's me. It's you? Yeah. <laughs> this is Joe McBrien, like I said. Where are you from? No kidding. That's the first <laughs> But rampy Jeremy Dow is not impressed. When I first saw her, my bets on her staying, sticking around were pretty damn low. She looks like she's about 100 pounds soaking wet, and she's about five foot nothing. It's like the first. A Rampy's life is all about grunt work, far from the romance of flying vintage aircraft. I hope I s I'm not gonna stay long as a Rampy. I hope I'll be flying soon. For me, a Rampy is somebody who doesn't talk about being a pilot, because technically you're not a pilot. Even though you might have spent $50,000 at a flight school, to get a thing that says I'm a pilot, you're not a pilot. 
I want to be a pilot. I don't want to be a Rambi. <laughs> but that could take a while. <laughs> Buffalo Airways is feeling the pinch of the global recession this winter. Really? So any new contract yeah, is a welcome addition to their right, bottom I'm line. Glad, yeah, it won't take us long. It takes a half day to get the plane ready, and then, uh, well, we can do her. The remote village of Uranium City in northern Saskatchewan is running extremely low on fuel. They need Buffalo to fly in some gasoline from Stony Rapids, the closest town. Our DC-4 can do um, uh, about 10,000 litres of haul, so that's still five trips. To accomplish this, gas tanks must be installed on the DC-4 right away. we got to watch with this is we don't break our valves off. It's hitting on the end here, guys. Do any damage to the valves. Once we go to fill it up, we're going to have a pretty big spill. You can you go another half foot over here. Buffalo it. rookie pilot Alex Wagner will be tagging along to get in some more flying time on the DC-4. I am getting itchy fingers. It's just great, actually, to be uh, at the, at the helm. Alex came to Yellowknife specifically to learn to fly the DC-4. I wanted to fly the DC-4, that's, the, that's where you do it, and uh, I wanted to fly a, a real machine, not a computer. The DC-4 is a 70-year-old four-engine piston prop plane, and Buffalo Air is one of the few places still flying them. The airplane was designed as a carrier of, of freight and troops in the Second World War. For Alex, getting to fly this vintage plane is the chance of a lifetime. I feel privileged, actually, just to fly this, uh, this piece of history. At Buffalo, everyone, even the pilots, help make sure the aircraft is prepped and ready. Alex uh, gives a chance uh, for Alex to show his merit and uh, see how he does on the job. After working through the night to install the two huge fuel tanks on board, the Buffalo crew has the DC-4 ready. Mission was uh, to fly 50,000 liter of uh, automotive gas from uh, Stony Rapids to Uranium City. The man in charge of the mission is Captain Justin Simley. Back your left. Take your right. Radios and instruments. All set. Brakes north. Transporting 10,000 liters of volatile gasoline is too sensitive a job for a rookie like Alex. The DC-4 can be as twitchy as a racehorse. Well, they can be a little bit cantankerous, and, and you gotta you gotta think ahead with them. I mean, uh, you know, especially in the cold temperatures. So. Check. so Justin will be at the controls when the fuel tanks are full. And when they're empty, Alex will get some valuable flying time, including his first takeoff in the DC-4. Let's go to 30. Go to 30 with me now. 30, good on top. Let's have 40 seconds now. It's a pretty big chunk of metal to, to start struggling with it. Me too, rotate, positive read. Zero. They're off to Stony Rapids to pump the tanks full of fuel yeah, check, go, go and turn this aircraft into a flying tanker truck. We're making a very special cake. <laughs> it's Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader's birthday, and his good friend Kelly Jurasevic and her niece Janelle Glenn are baking him a cake. Just making a cake for Arnie's 66th birthday, <laughs> and he'll love it. It's gonna be pretty good. Even though it's his birthday, Arnie's not doing anything differently. He's headed up the Mackenzie Valley again today. On board are co-pilot Scott Blue and mechanic James Dojack. All right, one five four, flying at the back track. Check one five four on the right. By the time this birthday is over, Arnie will wonder why he didn't just take the day off. Good 
Coming up, the DC-4 threatens to stall as it ices up in flight. It's not looking good at all. In northern Saskatchewan, Buffalo Airways DC-4 is about to become an airborne tanker truck. It's going to shuttle 50,000 liters of gasoline to the community of Uranium City, 10,000 liters at a time. Nothing like highly flammable cargo on board to test a pilot's nerve. You don't want to get yourself killed or hurt just for, for automotive gas, basically. The tanks weigh 10 tons when full, close to the maximum payload for the DC-4. Chains should keep them secure, but there's nothing controlling the movement of the fuel inside. You can feel the uh, fuel slosh around a little bit front to back, so it's turbulent or gusty, so uh, you need to be ready for that. Captain Justin Simley and co-pilot Dan Catoni will handle each of the five fuel delivery runs, but trainee Alex Wagner will still see plenty of action on the empty shuttles back to Stony Rapids. Clear left. Uh, clear right. Dex check this one here. Okay, coming up. The flight from Stony Rapids to Uranium City is only 160 kilometers, but with volatile cargo on board, the crew is on high alert. Halfway there, the weather turns humid and the exterior of the plane begins to take on ice. They'll just build on the leading edge of the, uh, the wing there. It's not looking good at all. Older planes like this DC-4 have no de-icing equipment. Well, on these aircraft, we don't have the icer boots uh, or needed leaning edges to get the uh, ice off the wing. Ice uh, increases your stall speed. In aviation, a stall is not when the engines fail. Stall is a sudden reduction in lift. Icing on the wings can induce stall by disrupting the flow of air over the curved top of the wing, critical to create lift. To avoid stall caused by icing, airspeed must be increased to compensate. But Justin tries to escape the freeze out altogether by dropping in altitude. So we're gonna try to get out of it here. If it doesn't work, this flying fuel tanker could fall from the sky like a brick. All around, not, not a very good thing. So we're gonna try to get out of it here. We're gonna descend out of it. Justin maneuvers to get the plane down into drier air. Bad. We don't have much on there, so we're out of it now. We're between layers again. The threat of stall is averted for now. We'll just sit tight for now. Justin continues on to Uranium City with 10,000 liters of fuel in the hold. Meanwhile, Audrey Marchand is working hard as a new rampy in hopes of getting promoted to the cockpit. But Jeremy Dow, who has already worked the ramp for four months, has his doubts about her. Definitely doesn't look like the type that I would expect to be all that happy here. She looks too, uh, too fragile. Being a female pilot anywhere, let alone Buffalo Airways, I can imagine it'd be pretty rough, but hopefully uh, she'll pull through, she'll pull through. Less than 7% of all commercial pilots in North America are women. Aviation is still a male-dominated industry. Yes, I'm Buffalo okay. Joe calls Audrey to his office to pass on some words of wisdom. The reason you're here is to learn. Yep. And it's strictly up to you. I'll do my best. How you learn and how well you learn. Every day you gotta learn a little more. Every day you gotta be a little further ahead than you were. Yes. So Joe's soft spot for female flyers has Jeremy looking over his shoulder. Sure Girls do get a free ride. In Buffalo a little bit. They pull their weight like the guys very, very well, and, and while they're on the team, the guys have to ship up and pull their weight because they don't want to be overshadowed by a lady doing better. I know a lot of guys here told me that I have a big advantage because I'm a girl. She'll get more than her fair chance at uh, flying here in Buffalo. If someone 
come here and tell me that I will take the place in the cockpit tomorrow morning as a co-pilot, I will take it. That's for sure. Birthdays are just like any other day for Buffalo's chief pilot, Arnie Schrader. Celebrating the big 66 today, Arnie and his crew, co-pilot Scott Blue and engineer James Dojak, are 600 kilometers northwest of Yellowknife. They're about to land the C-46 in a mother of a windstorm. Quite a wind there, Scotty, so let's just see what it's like as we get closer. Roger that. The C-46 is only rated to land in a 12-knot crosswind. Its wide profile acts like a sail. This tail-wheeled aircraft is weighted to the rear, so on landing, a straight approach is crucial to avoid the back end swinging sideways. As they get closer, wicked crosswinds blast the chunky C-46. Doesn't like crosswinds. Um, can be temperamental uh, when you flare for touchdown, and just a general pain in the butt. Well, the C-46 is very difficult to fly well because it's a large tail airplane with a very large fuselage, so it's very dangerous in crosswinds. So if it starts to swing, it wants to continue to swing. And the winds were, were pretty strong, so we're coming in at an angle. We weren't coming in straight. Okay, there's one. Can't push the nose down. Just falls along with you here. Gotta stay right on it and be straight. Oh, you got a good way down here, That's unbelievable. You're limited to when you can fly that thing into strong winds, and if you look around the Arctic, there's all kinds of C-46s strewn all over it. And it was all because of wind always. They had too much wind, and they'd ground loop them and wreck them. Hang on to your hats, boy. That'd be rough. It's so bad that even a seasoned flyer like Arnie is struggling to align the aircraft with the runway in Toledo. Be prepared for a go around. The crosswinds rock the C 46 as it closes in on the landing strip. Oh, we're going to have to go. We can't handle it here. Still not your way in. Arnie makes a split-second call and aborts the landing. Uh, around that uh, rock there, it's pretty turbulent, and the wind was blowing about 40, 45 miles an hour, and it was across the runway, so we just overshot it. Unfortunately, the 500 residents of Toledo will have to wait another day for fresh supplies. It was a good decision to uh, try not to land. <laughs> James is relieved, but Arnie's birthday from hell is far from over. Still to come. So, well, Audrey, go for it, take my seat, and fly. Audrey gets a trial by fire on the DC-3. Uranium City. Population under 100. Fuel supply nearly empty. Dean Clausen runs the local fuel delivery business. He's heading to the airstrip to meet the Buffalo DC-4. It's carrying the first of five 10,000 liter loads of gasoline. Now we're out of gas in town. And the next supply would be the winter road, so you can't run a community road without any gas. Normally, gas is trucked up on the ice road across Lake Athabasca, but the ice isn't thick enough yet to support the weight of trucks. So flying the gas in is the only option. Fuel trucks pulling in. Cool. Buffalo's come to our rescue quite, quite a few times in the past. They're really kind of a savior this year. The DC-4 lands and there's no time to waste. The 10,000 liters of fuel needs to be transferred from the plane to Dean's truck. But pumping the gas is taking up valuable time. Uh, we, don't want the, uh, we don't want the engines freezing up, that's for sure. If the once red-hot engines freeze up, the crew could be stranded here, and Buffalo's fuel delivery contract would be thrown into jeopardy. 
The fuel transfer is done, but Justin, Dan, and Alex have four more loads to pick up in Stony Rapids and deliver to Uranium City. All in a day's work. After a rough ride and aborted landing over Toledo, birthday boy Arnie Schrader, co-pilot Scott Blue, and mechanic James Dojak approach Norman Wells, their final stop of the day. Flat tire. We landed and the airplane started all shaking and everything, and Arnie's all, ah, oh, he blew a tire off. Oh, or a broken wheel. Just started bouncing a little bit, and you know, immediately Arnie's like, oh no, we blew a tire, you know. I gotta get it off the runway. Hopefully, we just bust out of it. Right the airplane off. What is it, flat or broken? Changing a tire in these conditions won't be easy. Well, it's very hot, so it's really not very good to change the tire. The first priority is to tent the engines so they don't freeze up. Engine! Gonna need help putting these tents on! If we don't get that, the wind off of that engine, it's gonna freeze out and then she won't start. He's gonna replace that tire, so we'll be here for a while. And they cool down fast. Whatever the f dust is dirty, who knows? I had the tent on on top of the engine on the right hand side. Grab it! Grab it! It was just getting tossed uh, like a rag doll. And for a second there, I was worried I was going to get tossed off. They only managed to get a tent on the engine most exposed to the wind. The three of us who couldn't hold on to the tent, it's like a parachute wants to take off, eh? As the mechanic on board, James is responsible for fixing the flat tire. There's just one problem. You've never changed one before? He'd never changed the, spare, the rear tire on before. I'd never done it out in the field before, so yeah. <laughs> Wind's blowing and you've got the snow coming at you. And my first thought was, F I gotta do this now. <laughs> Normally, James is up to his armpits and airplane guts in the relative warmth of the Buffalo hangar. Like all the engineers at Buffalo, he'll take 60-year-old piston pounders over modern jets any day. You get a chance to get dirty. In the newer airplanes, you really don't get a chance to get dirty. We're diehards, really. You know, we, we love the machines, so... That's kind of what drives us to, to keep them going. You gotta give it love and care and she'll keep going and going. During the brutal winter months, Buffalo engineers often fly on board in case anything goes wrong. Like a flat tire. You have to jack it up so you can get the, the wheel out and new one in. They have a jack, but there's still a problem. Size matters. Jack or something to brace it on and then rejack it. Maybe like blocks of wood or bricks or something. The jack isn't raising the tail high enough to lift the wheel off the ground. Still too fing low. Need two more two by fours. But the higher James raises the tail in these roaring winds, the more precarious the balance. After using every scrap of wood on board and every expletive that comes to mind, success. But now, all that's holding up the rear of the 43,000 pound aircraft is one small jack mounted on top of a stack of two by fours. That wind, it, it caught the tail and knocked it over on the ass, and you know, we're underneath it, you know. 
At the Buffalo Hangar in Yellowknife, new rampy Audrey Marchand is feeling more like a janitor than a pilot. Like, you know, the, the broom man. The broom man is useful, but who wants to be a broom man? I'm going to go tell Audrey that she's coming to Hay River tonight on the sked, which she probably isn't expecting. Audrey has been chosen to fly tonight with the boss, Joe McBrien, a chance Jeremy would rather be getting himself. So, you are heading to Hay River tonight? Under Joe's scrutiny, Audrey will be showing off her piloting chops on the DC-3 evening sked flight. I'm just happy to, to fly because it's been a while. Flying with Joe is a rite of passage for every Buffalo Rampy who aspires to become a working pilot. I feel pretty confident. I think yes. I hope. <laughs> I hope it's going to be great. While Jeremy has seniority at Buffalo, it's not the only factor that will get him closer to the cockpit. Well, capability is number one. Seniority, they'll become senior by capability. I believe that somebody should be uh, rewarded on how hard they work. Jeremy's working hard, but he's beginning to see that Audrey may be more of a threat than he originally thought. Uh, I've heard rumors that if there's anybody who's going to jump somebody in line, it's a girl. Tough shit. Like, that's just how it is. If she makes a good impression on Buffalo Joe, Audrey could move up the ranks before Jeremy does. It's whatever Joe says. Whatever Joe says goes. This is real life. This is what happened. In some of these situations, the best man doesn't always win. On the tarmac in Norman Wells, the bitter wind and cold make even a basic task like changing a tire a major deal. Your fingers go numb in no time flat, and the wind's just blowing all the heat away from you. After an hour, you know, 40, 50 below, you start to really feel it. You can hurt yourself pretty bad. While birthday boy Arnie Schrader keeps warm in the plane, fear of frostbite has mechanic James Dojak and co-pilot Scott Blue ducking for shelter. Get me home, tired. Yeah. yeah, it's cold out today, boys. I don't know how his fingers are going to fall off. Like, in terms of handling that cold steel in that wind and having to hammer and bang and, and figure it out. James finally gets the spare bolted in place. But what could have been done in less than 30 minutes in the hangar has taken them nearly two hours in these inhuman conditions. And that's way longer than any of them wanted to leave the engines exposed. Now the question is, will the plane start? That's the thing about these old machines that you're, you're fighting a battle against heat, heat retention in the engines and having enough warmth in them to start. We're gone. We're going home. It looks like Arnie will make it home to celebrate his birthday after all. It's four o'clock in Yellowknife. Prep time for Buffalo's evening sked flight to Hay River. Tonight, new rampy Audrey Marchand will pilot a plane she's never flown before. It's my first time in this type of plane too, so it's my first DC-3 flight. If that's not enough pressure, she'll be flying with the boss, Buffalo Joe McBrien. Once they're in the air, Audrey doesn't move to the co-pilot seat as she expects. Buffalo Joe has a different plan for her. 
After the takeoff, he said, well, Audrey, go for it, take my seat and fly. Joe gives Audrey the captain's seat, and co-pilot Ian Bottomley gets her up to speed. This is a lock. All the way up like that? Yep. Uh, no. Joe keeps a close eye from the back of the cockpit. I was used to fly in little planes, so when I flew that big plane, it was quite exciting. It's like being in a little car and driving a big, big bus. Make sure you're at the right altitude at your 10 miles, 1,900 feet. And then uh, Joe will be pretty happy with you. When the plane starts to go down to go to Hair River, uh, Joe will take back his seat. But it's very nice to control the plane. <laughs> nine eight nine, I got twenty two. Joe is pleased with Audrey's performance. Enthusiasm, motivation buys it all to start with. So that's there already. So from there on, we'll see where she, where she runs with it. Thank you. If Audrey can keep impressing him, it could mean getting off the ramp and into the co-pilot seat faster. I think I did a great job and like at the end of the day, I was proud of myself. <laughs> Still ahead, Audrey's euphoria is short-lived as she gets a look at her overnight accommodations. We'll clean it up, we'll get you the sheets and stuff. Shouldn't be too terrible. After a successful debut flight in the DC-3, Audrey is introduced to Buffalo Staff House in Hay River. She'll be spending the night here. House residents, as you can see, they like to break down washrooms, begin renovations, and then walk away. It's a marvelous thing. There's a sink in the shower, and um, neither of which work. Just gonna close that door, and that will be fine. See, now she's not, she's less excited now about being in Hay River now that she knows what's actually here. Yeah. Jeremy's been living here for months and tries to make her feel at home. When I get in the room I was supposed to, to sleep in, <laughs> there was, uh, there was stuff everywhere. I doubt it's your size. I've been in a lot of staff houses, so I'm maybe biased. This one's pretty nice. It was just a big mess. Yeah, we still have to clean people's stuff out a little bit because the last people left in a bit of a hurry and left everything. So we'll clean it out. We'll get you sheets and stuff. Shouldn't be too terrible once everything's over. No, it's not. It's a big enough room, and I think it's a warm one. So. Okay, great. Now what? Just another staff house room. Welcome to Buffalo. Jeremy's playing nice, but that will change if Audrey gets promoted before he does. I'm a great guy right now. She jumps me in line while then civility sort of goes out the window. Yep. After a hellish birthday battling flat tires, falling pipes, and ferocious winds, Arnie Schrader finally makes it back to Yellowknife. The Buffalo gals have a naughty surprise to cheer them up. Put it here, Thank you. Yep. It's your birthday, have a ball. <laughs> I can see when he's coming in through the crack here. He wants yes. It's perfect. He's gonna kill us. <laughs> 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 oh my god. It was hilarious. Because <laughs> he had, he had, he had gray hairs, you know, made out of coconut and white hairs. It was awesome. It was cool. <laughs> I was kind of shocked there. It caught me by surprise. <laughs> if the rookies at Buffalo Airways can survive 40 years in this business the way Arnie has, they too will have a ball. Or two. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Well, their, their phones just went dead. They're like, just, the power's kicking off. Except for one. Buffalo Airways scrambles to respond to an emergency call. 
it's exciting. Get some blood pumping. Back out. Whoa. We can't leave it like that. This ain't gonna fly, boys. Three rampants fight to get ahead. I love my job. You have to prove yourself. Grumble. And Joe's on the brink of a $7 million deal that could save Buffalo Airways. That is not part of this agreement. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Their phones just went dead, They're like this, the power's kicking off. Except for one. Buffalo Airways races to respond to an emergency call. It's exciting, gets the blood pumping. Whoa, whoa. We can't leave it like that. This ain't gonna fly, boys. Three ramp hands fight to get ahead. I love my job. And into the cockpit. Late January and minus 30 here in Hay River Northwest Territories. Dawn is still hours away, but at the Hay River Crew House, Jeremy Dow's daily grind has already begun. Jeremy has been working as the Hay River Ramp Hand, or Rampy, for four frigid months. Uh, 4.45 in the morning, it's my job to start the cars. Or put another way, over a hundred frosty wake-up calls. Gosh, gotta get the other one going too. It's too damn cold for this. It's not exactly the glamorous pilot's life he dreamed about in flight school. Too damned early. Again. Like it is every day. That's it. People keep taking the big bowls first. <sighs> Hay River is on the southern edge of Great Slave Lake. Buffalo's daily DC-3 flight to Yellowknife leaves here sharp at 7.30 each morning. And gets put to bed by 7 each night. Oh my God. For this, I'd be bored. It makes a long day for Jeremy, lugging freight, prepping the plane, and making cargo deliveries in between. Oh, okay. Dr. 36 in Yellowknife. Just like every other rampy, he's already a licensed pilot. They all put up with the brutal conditions, long hours, and minimal pay for one reason. Find something that old, that big, as your first job? Hell yeah. Every Rampy wants to get behind the controls of Buffalo's fleet of vintage prop liners. When I talked to my uh, friends, they said, man, you are getting a lifetime opportunity to fly that aircraft. And each one has a favorite. I'm gonna start flying DC-3 and DC-4. I dreamt about it. I definitely, as soon as I saw them, I knew I wanted to fly them, especially things like the Electra. The C-46 is faster than the DC-3, so that's one of the reasons why I prefer the C-46. More power and making more noises too. To get a place on the flight deck, the rookies need to impress one man above all, company owner Buffalo Joe McBrien and he knows exactly what he's looking for. Your gumption, your ambition, your initiative, your finesse, your charisma, whatever it takes, every day now it's up to you. You got the world by that tail and you hang on and pull like shit, now you can do it. But don't stand by waiting for somebody to do it for you. If you do, you're in the wrong business. While working the ramp is grueling, it keeps these licensed pilots one step closer to the planes they hope to fly. But they're also expected to pull their weight off the tarmac. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome in my new life as a courier. A recent arrival from Quebec, Audrey Marchand is anxious to move up the ladder. I want to be a pilot. I don't want to be Randy. <laughs> and if that also means driving a van, she's going to suck it up. I just have to prove them up that I can do like everything they, they can ask me to. Audrey has one big advantage. She works at the Yellowknife hangar in close contact with Buffalo headquarters. I'm doing great. While Audrey's burning rubber, Yeehaw! 200 kilometers away in Hay River, Jeremy could be left out in the cold, even after four months of paying his dues. The great part about loading the airplane is it's plus 30 in there and minus 30 out here. Try dressing for that. You can't. You either freeze your balls off outside or you roast them inside. There's your options. My balls are out of options. I've got about, you know, seven days a week, four months straight. That's a record or a law or something. If he's got any hope of moving ahead, Jeremy's got to get to Yellowknife. But first, he needs someone to handle the work in Hay River. So he's lined up an unusual replacement. Raman Srivastava, direct from India. Got my license and just within two days I, I talked to Jeremy. He told me about Buffalo and I said, yeah, it's a good idea to join the Buffalo, right? He went through a bit of a temperature shock, certainly. <laughs> he's having a tough time adapting. He's pretty slight. I mean, he's, he's in good shape, he's just very small. If Ramon can hack it here, it will be Jeremy's best chance for promotion. But Ramon's also fighting a terrible homesickness for his native India. Everything is on my computer. <laughs> that's my dad, that's my mom, that's my sister, and that's my brother-in-law. That's my mom, actually. <laughs> I love her. I love her a lot. I miss her too much. That's my nephew, my, mom, my dad, and she is my would-be. Wow, she's gorgeous. Thank you. She is gorgeous by heart, too. Ramon's having such a hard time, he won't even reveal just how tough it is to his family. To be very frank, I don't want to tell them exactly, like, in what situation. Sometimes, you know, you get, you, you get a little struggled with the weather and you're not feeling well, but you can't tell them everything, you know, just because they'll, they'll start thinking about you and probably it's not good for them, right? Same thing happened yesterday, actually. My mom, she started weeping and said, uh, it's enough now, I'll just come back. If Ramon's homesickness gets the better of him, Jeremy is looking at an indefinite run on the Hay River ramp. I love my job, 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 I love my job. Back at Yellowknife headquarters, a much more urgent SOS is throwing Buffalo into overdrive. Oh, I got a call from the Power Corporation and none of it. And uh, in Rankin Inlet, I guess their generators went offline. Rankin Inlet, a mining village of 2,300 people on the northwestern shore of Hudson Bay, has lost power. Three of their four generators have failed. The community has declared a state of emergency. The one generator still running is allowing essential services like the health center to stay open but residents must endure blackouts. No lights, no TVs, no ovens, and no heat. All they have is that one generator is their heart, the heart of the community. It basically, it's like your heart pumping blood to your system. So when that heart stops, you get desperate. You do what you have to do. So what's our tentative dispatch? One hour. One hour and counting. We're one of the few airlines up here that can at the drop of a hat, dispatch a plane within a few hours. You're good over there, Louis. Buffalo has one plane perfect for the job, the Douglas DC-4. 
NWT Power Corp, they build their generators to fit in the DC-4 because for the longest time it was the only plane that could move them. So They are built to just slide in the door. The DC-4's cargo door measures over 10 feet wide and 6.5 and feet tall. The 4 was designed as a 42-passenger transatlantic airliner in the late 1930s. Douglas built it with an unusually wide fuselage. Adapted for World War II, it became the C-54 Skymaster and hauled troops and armaments. Buffalo's DC-4 flew in the war. Today, it's got another important mission, but they have to move fast. It's uh, that kind of job, if you don't jump on it right away, you're gonna lose it to somebody else. Well, their phones just went dead, They're like just the power's kicking on and off, so. Okay. Hey, go ahead. With no time to lose, Buffalo pulls in one of their most trusted captains, Justin Simley. A lot of drums there, so. Oh, it's exciting, you know, we gotta get there and uh, get the gen set there and get the power on for these people, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting, gets the blood pumping. Justin has spent his entire career with Buffalo Airways. He started as the Hay River Rampy. This would be the airplane we're taking to Rankin Inlet. Uh, Me and Justin kind of grew up together here at Buffalo. You happy? He got in shit every day. Every day, there wasn't a day Justin was getting in shit. We got a great bunch of guys here. Everything runs pretty smooth, you know? There wasn't a day when he was getting a hard time from another Rampy, but he never, ever quit. Um, yeah, we got fuel and drums. You got the refueling kit? I'll go get it. Okay. The plan calls for Justin and co-pilot Charles Lorty to fly the DC-4 to nearby Fort Simpson. There, they'll pick up two giant generators, then proceed to Rankin Inlet, 1,500 kilometers away. I wouldn't worry about sweeping it. It's just going to blow off on takeoff. Oh, there. Everybody at Buffalo stepped up. There's no real time to think of what ifs and, and how comes and why can't we do it or why can we do it. They do it. Yeah, Justin goes, grabs a sandwich, puts on his jacket, jumps in the airplane and does his job. Oh, it looks great. You ready to go? Ready to go. Okay. Mixture for it. Stand by. Except for one? This Buffalo DC-4 flew over a half century ago in the historic Berlin airlift, ferrying supplies into blockaded East Berlin. Today, it's flying to the rescue again. Yes, that's uh, actually pretty amazing to use an airplane that 50 years ago you used to be you know, overseas for a uh, Berlin airlift. And 60 years later, we're still uh, used uh, the airplane for the same purpose. It's not business right now, it's, uh, it's almost like an ambulance. But the wheels on this ambulance are about to come off. Coming up. Go back, go back, go. Whoa, whoa. We can't leave it like that! You won't leave it, Whoa! Doesn't fit. It's a make it or break it day for Buffalo Airways. Two delegates from the Turkish government are arriving in Yellowknife to seal a critical deal. And Director of Flight Operations Mike Hanley is anxious to make a good first impression. We've got representatives coming from Turkey to finalize the contract negotiations with Buffalo Airways and the CL 215s uh, for the sale and purchase of these aircraft. The global recession has forced owner Joe McBrien to sell two CL215 water bombers. The 215s are big flying boats that scoop water off lakes and dump it on forest fires. This is one of the type. This is not the actual airplane. It'll be identical to this airplane. This $7 million deal for the 215 water bombers is crucial to Buffalo's bottom line during these tough economic times. kind of get you down if uh, if you if you just keep watching the newspapers on this recession they're talking about or the depression 
Uh, we still owe money on the hangar. We still owe money on the 215s themselves and uh, various other things. This will definitely breathe a little bit of fresh air, a little bit of life into our morale, into our people. Turkey deal for Buffalo Airways is huge. It's, it's going to save us, and technically we do need saving. Mike Hanley is on the front lines as Buffalo's one-man welcoming committee. How you doing? You guys um, for Buffalo Airways? Yes. Yes, how you doing? Fine, thank you. Good, good. Welcome to your life. The I'm Turkish Hanley. delegates are lawyer Yasar Ozturk and aviation inspector Orhan Kandir. 40 below zero. So if we're not too cold? Oh, too cold. Too cold? Uh, you get used to it after but a while. While it. Mike brushes up on international relations, Buffalo's cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic and her niece and assistant Janelle Glenn have their own special assignment. Turkey time. We gotta get Arnie's hair cut and make sure he doesn't wear a Harley t-shirt today. <laughs> so we're off to cut his hair, pluck his eyebrows, pull some nose hairs, wax them. You know. Joe has asked Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader to take the Turkish delegates out for dinner tonight. Cute. <laughs> so it's makeover time. Well, they, you know, they spent a lot of money on these two airplanes, so and we haven't got it yet, so we better get spruced up a little bit, wine and dine them so we can get paid. Arnie's a key part of the contract. He'll lead the crew flying the 215s across the North Atlantic, then stay on to train the Turkish pilots. Well, there's that barber downtown, but Kelly does just as good a job, so. You are one sexy man. She's such a bullshitter, eh? But first, he needs to help close the deal. Arnie's got his haircut. Anybody can tell that something's gonna happen. Be that or someone died. Across town, would-be pilot Audrey is finishing up her courier run and living by the first rule of a rampy. Never stop moving. The ramp in my book should always be at work. Um, they should always have work on their mind. To become a successful rampion is to basically erase everything in your mind about being a pilot and you have a job. If the job is getting frostfighter for the airplane, that's your job. I still, to this day, I can't understand why. They would put themselves through what they do. But I also understand that they have to. And if they don't, someone else will. Audrey's fresh attitude and enthusiasm are threatening to eclipse Jeremy's months of hard work. I'm setting personal records, all right. Yeah, definitely hours worked in a week and in a month. And I probably just cleared the record of, you know, hours worked in a year in the last four months, which is probably not good, but it happens. Big airplane. Yet, Buffalo Joe has singled Audrey out as the rampy most likely to climb the ladder. Yeah, to see how it works. I, I told her, you know, she'd, she'd move through the system as quick as she can. The next step up is flight attending. It might not sound like a great promotion, but at Buffalo, it's the key step between working the ramp and flying the plane. Now, once they're on the airplane, then they start to learn. They learn to navigate, they learn different areas of the north, different towns, different airstrips, and, and they learn the environment that we operate in while they're flight attending. All the rampies know that whoever is trained next as a flight attendant will get first crack at the co-pilot seat. In Hay River, Jeremy's heard the rumor that Audrey might be getting that chance ahead of him. Grumble, grumble, grumble. There's a possibility that I get pretty screwed out of a promotion. So, yeah, life's a bitch. This news is dragging him down and affecting his work. Today, my brain is not working right. So today is going really terribly. Messing up where I put freight and what order I deliver it all in forgetting pieces. It is just crappy. <laughs> that sounded expensive. Jeremy's only hope is to get himself to Yellowknife so he can get an equal shot at that promotion. But that means new Rampy Ramon has to be ready to handle the work in Hay River. We have two frost fighters, so that weighs probably around uh, 700, 800 uh, pounds for sure. 
I got a little pissed off. Okay, moving that uh, frost fighter, but then I thought like people did it this thing right here, and they were managing this this thing alone. So why not I? The physical demands of the job are taking their toll. Ramon is running out of gas. Two hundred kilometers away, the DC-4 is pouring it on. The remote village of Rankin Inlet has been suffering a power outage since last night. Captain Justin Simley and his crew are on an emergency mission to pick up two generators in Fort Simpson and rush them to Rankin. On the tiny Fort Simpson airstrip, Justin meets the crew from the local power company. Hey, operator. Yeah. Hey, man, I'm Justin. They've got to get both massive generators onto the plane and in the air as soon as possible. There's no time to waste. Probably is, we can start putting stuff in. Uh... Good thing Justin learned to hustle on the Hay River ramp. Off to the right. What's your heaviest piece here? This one? Uh, I think it's another... 15,246 pounds. Looks pretty good. We're just uh, organizing the load. It's got to go in in a certain order. First, some minor modifications. Uh, it's going to be a pretty close fit, so uh, we're just having them take some, some parts and pieces off the top of the gen set. The generators have been designed to fit through the cargo doors of the DC-4, but that doesn't include the protruding parts on the top, the muffler and the eye bolts. We're just trying to get the, the eye bolts off the top so it'll fit through the door, but they're bolted underneath. In Rankin Inlet, the one functioning generator is barely holding up. The limited power available is being rotated throughout the hamlet for one hour periods. Just enough time to pump a bit of heat. Rankin Inlet is a remote place to begin with, and if you take away the power, it's kind of like uh, they just disappear in the darkness. The clock is ticking at the Fort Simpson airstrip in the Northwest Territories. Buffalo Captain Justin Simley must fly two giant generators to the isolated settlement of Rankin Inlet. The tiny hamlet is in the middle of a power blackout, with the January deep freeze getting deeper by the minute. The generators, protruding eye bolts, and mufflers are torched off. Now to load them in but it's still gonna be a tight fit. Whoa. Slowly. Can't see a stop. They can't find the proper angle to fit the full length of the generator into the plane. Justin's gotta find a way. Straighten your wheels first, please. I know this is frustrating for everybody. Bear with us here. We have a reputation for finishing the jobs we start, and uh, and that's our intention every time. You're gonna swing it right into the fucking door. Yeah, not only does a job like this affect our reputation, uh, a job like this can bring in uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, like we're talking tens of thousands of dollars. So we gotta make sure we get this job done. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Come on in. It's grabbing on the floor. Can he go up some? Okay. Come forward a little bit. Three inches, he says. Okay. If he backs up, we can tilt it. Our problem is that we don't have enough of the generator in the airplane for him to back out. We can't leave it like that. Okay, go through. Back it out. Okay. Back out, back out, back out. Whoa, whoa. You won't clear the corner here. If you turn here, doesn't fit. Unbelievable. How much room on the back end? He's got an inch. Cinch? Yeah. This ain't gonna fucking fly, boy. We can't get her in the fucking door here. Not this way. With night falling, the man who was trained to always finish the job is forced to make a difficult call. I hate this, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm done. I'm done with this generator tonight. I think we all are. Yeah. 
But there's still hope. A second, smaller generator. With the setting sun sending Arctic temperatures even lower, the people of Rankin Inlet are in for a cold, dark night if Buffalo doesn't deliver. At the only French restaurant in Yellowknife, Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader and his new haircut had their own job to do. Arnie and his wife and another Buffalo Airways couple are whining and dining Orhan and Yasar from Turkey, potential buyers of Buffalo's two water bombers. Well, we didn't know the representatives and, you know, the people from Turkey are, they like a little bit of class, so it's just a sales, a sales pitch type thing, you know? make them feel better and then things go easier you know with the sale and that you might expect company president joe mcbrien to be there when seven million dollars are on the table but he'd rather have arnie handle the pr they'll be just quizzing each other on the the cultures of Yellowknife in canada and what's it going to be like when we get over to your country so they'll be comparing notes given back for tonight is when everybody is super polite and what are you going to have for what I'm going to have, bologna sandwiches. <laughs> Do you think we got fresh bread? No, I checked it at <laughs> noon. We got day old. No, I have no plan on being with these people tonight. I'd like them to, to meet the people they're going to be working with. No, man, he just went home, opened up a new case of bologna, made himself a sandwich, sitting there in his boxers, talking about freaking chrome parts on a mercury. Arnie's task is to smooth things over before tomorrow's meeting to finalize the sale. A little bit of whiskey or something helps, you know, good supper, some wine, makes things go better. Do your honor. The stage is set. Tomorrow, it's all up to Joe to close the deal. And that's what worries people. You are no more Hay River guy. You are now Yellowknife guy, right? In Hay River, Jeremy's opportunities may be opening up. Yeah, exactly. He's been called to work the ramp at Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife tomorrow. Finally, a chance to show what he's capable of. Yeah, that, that's for sure. Definitely something is wrong just because hooking that thing, it wasn't doing anything. It's Ramon's chance to prove he has what it takes to handle the Hay River ramp on his own. I worry, man. I worry. It's going to work tomorrow for sure. Tonight, Jeremy intends to turn this Hindu vegetarian into a true man of the north. Yeah, so where to put the coin? with a little hunting trip. You beat me? Oh yeah. <laughs> here we go. If Ramon can make it here, he might just stick it out. And Jeremy could make the permanent leap to Company HQ in Yellowknife. <laughs> what other people are saying about me, like any idea? Like with my today's performance, like till now performance, like Still need to work on hustle. Still need to work on hustle. Working like, faster. Yeah, that's for sure. But I know you it's know, developing it's a technique, but you also got to post your ass. He helped me. He helped me from inside out. I'm very thankful to Jeremy. Like he always supported me, and he knows somebody is there to take care of you. In in absence of your parents or friends. Jeremy's even helping him fit in with the Hay River locals. Jesus, every Buffalo boy should have a dirty hooker. Wow. There you go. No, this is for you, my friend. You gotta drink it. Thank you. <laughs> Does that taste like the last dirty hooker you had? No, it doesn't. I have sat here many a Friday night with with men as good and or better as you. Look at that. have said to me, I gotta get up at 4:30 and put the plane on the roof. And, and they kept drinking until three. Yeah. Yeah. He's motivating you. And He's motivating you. Oh. If they had enough balls to make it from the bar down to this table, <laughs> they're Buffalo boys. After you yeah. call them boys, well, they're not, not men. Not well, yet. No, they're not yet. They're not uh, men. And it's not up to us to call them men. It's up to Joe to call them men. <laughs> Tomorrow, Ramon will find out just how much of a Buffalo man he can be. After struggling all afternoon in Fort Simpson to load a massive generator onto the DC-4, Captain Justin Simley is finally calling it quits. Uh, I'm done. I'm done with this generator tonight. I think we all are. But he's still determined to come to the rescue of Rankin Inlet. Justin is confident that the second smaller generator will fit. 
take to everything else. And uh, go to Rankin Inlet tonight. Oh yeah, we're going to Rankin tonight. Uh, communities got no power. You just quit because you think you might not be able to do the job. You look for solutions. Eh? You want them to the left? Go left. The financial reality of this mission weighs on Buffalo General Manager Mikey McBrien. It is a very critical contract, but technically every contract we have is pretty critical. Our main objective was very simple. Uh, get the power, get the lights back on in Rankin Inlet. But the second generator isn't cooperating. This one's higher than the other one by a quarter of an inch. And a quarter of an inch is exactly the size of a recent modification to the plane. We put a beefier floor in the DC-4, and uh, the floor had been raised a fraction of an inch. I guess there's, if there's no fucking room, there's no room, man. Right? Our reputation is based on our ability to get the job done. So we'd like to get the job done. Well, if it won't go, it won't go. Because it's simply ain't gonna go in, eh? It's this way. That's the way it is sometimes, just a fraction of an inch between success and failure. And Mikey calls with even more frustrating news. Oh, you talked to him. Who is Power Corp or not a good power corp? Ciao. A competing company located another generator and is on the way to rank him. It's done. All the Buffalo boys can do now is go home. We're all a little disappointed, but uh, well, we'd done everything we could uh, to make it happen and uh, it didn't work out. So. They did their job impeccably, on time, as best they could, but the piece would not fit in the airplane. They did as much as they can, and that's real life. That's what happens. That's not a Hollywood ending. Not only did they fail to come through, they lost a contract that would have helped to fatten the company's books in these lean times. A new day dawns in Hay River, Northwest Territories. Jeremy's getting the chance to work in Yellowknife today and to prove that Audrey isn't the only Rampy who deserves a promotion. You're out of sight and out of mind down here, which isn't a good thing. You really want to be impressing those you're working for. And there aren't that many chances to do that. You don't really get to demonstrate how hard you're working as well as you could maybe in Yellowknife. Ramon will be left behind to handle Hay River Rampy duties on his own for the first time. The DC-3 and Jeremy are away. And Ramon is off and running solo. With the first of several courier runs. In Yellowknife, Jeremy is slogging it out on the ramp with renewed passion and working with the full range of the Buffalo fleet. Big planes rather than the little DC-3s. Get your momentum up to you through the drift. Jeremy gets instructions from C-46 co-pilot Scott Blue. Um, and this is just going on the left-hand side, on top of all the wood. Yeah. Just three straps, you can just undo it, put it on top, zing, zing, zing. The workload is much heavier than in Hay River. Where am I hooking it up to, boss? I'll show you. Uh, Rookies. Things are a little frantic, um, mostly because I've never prepared a 46 before at the same time. So I'm just going to focus on this one until they tell me to go the hell over there. A little more hustling, and the 46 is ready to go. Jeremy's experience is paying off, and Audrey is nowhere in sight. 
She's been given the day off, but she's not taking it easy. Audrey's keeping fit to stay competitive with the guys. If I'm not strong enough to push something or to pull something because it's too heavy or to carry something, I'll find another way to do it. But I will really try to do it on my own instead of asking someone else. Back in Hay River, Ramon has no one to ask for help. He's on his own. You know, I was trying to drive one uh, forklift today. That's the first time, actually, I tried putting that uh, big 600-pound box in my van. So far, Ramon is rising to the challenge. It was heavy, and especially, you know, you have to be very precise, because that machine, it doesn't want you to, you know, run like any heavy thing. Just go with smoothly. It's, it's like a tiny bit of changes on the controls and then drop it off slowly. I was trying myself to be very good on that one. You have to deal with hard machines. You have to prove yourself. But it's going to be a little trickier than he thought. I should go in and then can close the door, right? Otherwise... Oh, it's heavy, man. In Hay River, Buffalo's new rampy, Ramon, is working on his own. His friend and mentor, Jeremy, has entrusted him with the Hay River duties for the first time. He's figured out the forklift enough to load up a 600-pound piece of cargo. Oh, it wasn't the proper lane. But then, the van doors won't close. The only option left is pure rampy can-do. Four time, whatever I weigh myself. Jeremy's drilled into him that if he's going to make it here, he's got to step up and prove himself. If I'm not enough capable to handle their business, why well, they'll keep me, right? This kind of business, we do it, and that's how you have to handle it. So you have to be, you know, quite strong to handle that kind of thing. Task is done. Finally. Ramon feels like a real rampy. That 600 pound was challenge. That was a good thing actually, that motivated me. I can do it, I can lift it now. Back in Yellowknife, it's D-Day. Buffalo is about to close the $7 million sale of two CL-215 water bombers to Turkey. In a recession year, this deal is one bright light in a bleak financial forecast. Please extend a warm Buffalo welcome. For God's sakes, don't say anything fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, don't say anything. Just keep my mouth shut, please. What you say? We're a bunch of animals, or what? Joe's playing it cool. He's been in the aviation business for 40 years, and he's seen it all. But after buying and selling over 100 airplanes on a handshake. If you run down the center of the freeway long enough, you're going to get run over, and it doesn't come back to haunt you, and all of a sudden, one will bite you. And this deal is one of the most critical of his career. Oh. Roger, Roger, Brian. Brian. Oh. All right, listen, have fun. He's a director of maintenance. What's your name? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi, I'm Raul Legal Consultant. Legal Consultant. Lawyer. 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 I have all the faith in him, but he can f up stuff sometimes, eh? This is Debbie. You talk to Debbie on the phone? Debbie Dwyer? Oh, nice to meet you. This is the lawyer. This is my favorite. This guy I go to like the most. He can, he can say the most oddest things and, 
and uh, maybe they're not the most uh, socially appropriate phrases. Just before the meeting begins, the Turks duck outside for a smoke. Now I gave my Canadian cigarettes, see what they think of it. I told them to take big sucks and knock them on his ass because they're really strong compared to theirs. Eh? So he's probably laying out in the snow up there somewhere. Maybe he'll find them. Jeez, I don't know. I think Europeans have been smoking a lot longer than we have. <laughs> Finally, everyone is assembled. Oh, hey. The financial fate of Buffalo Airways is on the line. It's time for Joe to get down to business. Yeah, the one thing about business is uh, the, the smile kind of goes away uh, when you start talking business because it's serious to him. That is not part of this agreement. This agreement today we buy, sell airplanes. You are directors. I'm here only <laughs> to get this yeah. bill of sale yeah. and to tell them that, okay, we have it, send money, and then you... Money in the bank. Music to Joe's ears. Deliver paper to him. He delivers papers to you. Then Tomorrow you morning, the airplanes are starting to be tanked. Right. So I sign here? Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll shake hands with you. Thank the you. deal is done, but the work is far from over. Where the first one going to when we arrive? Three bases. Oh, there's three different bases, okay. Preparing the planes and getting them across the North Atlantic to Turkey in the middle of winter will take everything Buffalo's got. Still to come, Ramon drives the ice road. Frozen water, right? I'd say, look at that, it's getting over the frozen water. It's crazy. Frozen lake. It's good. Energized by his morning smackdown with a 600-pound box, Task is done. Ramon has been making record time on another Hay River Courier run. He's handling the workload like a real rampy. For the first time, Ramon seems at home in the job and in the north. Definitely, it's gonna be a good something, something new uh, in my life. Like I'm feeling more stronger as compared to when I was living in India. Ah, this door is totally frozen, man. So I'm living like a soldier's life. And today, he's going to experience another northern first. When I was in chatting with Jeremy, he told me like generally we fly, we drive over the frozen lake. So I told to my parents like I'm going to drive over the frozen lake. They got scared. What? Are you crazy? Look, we are just about to get into, into the frozen lake. Wow. See that? It's awesome. Just because now I'm over the water, man. <laughs> frozen water, right? I'll say, look at that, it's riding over the frozen water. It's crazy. It's awesome. It is awesome. I like this actually. I wanna lay down here. It's awesome. It's like the frozen lake. It's good. Oh, you somebody is calling me. No homesickness now. Ramon has proved to himself that he's got what it takes to make it at Buffalo. For now. That evening, Buffalo's passenger flight rolls onto the Hay River ramp. Jeremy's back from Yellowknife and anxious to hear how Ramon handled things here. Oh, how was your first day running Hay River, man? Good, man. Yeah. You got Smith and Simpson done today? Yep. It's all done now. He's working his butt off. And he's trying his darndest to fit in. It's working. Jeremy's encouraged. Later, at the Hay River Staff House. How's everything going on there? A call home to his family reveals just how much Ramon is adapting to the north. Well, I'm doing fine here. I'm definitely, you know, day by day, it's getting better here. Getting used to of the environment, weather. So it's not like today temperature is minus around 30. So it's not that cold for sure. Ramon has caught that rampy spirit. <laughs> oh, he's making a serious one, eh? Good, huh? And for now, Jeremy's game plan is coming together. Start competing over who can make the best paper airplane. What is that? It's an easily modifiable airframe. Ramon could take over for him in Hay River. <laughs> That's a dart. I'm saying supersonic, man. That's not an airplane. It is. It's not an airplane. It's it doesn't have it's wings. Moving to Yellowknife and becoming a Buffalo co-pilot could soon become a reality for Jeremy. 
<laughs> but sometimes things have a way of unraveling. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Buffalo races against the clock to turn two low flying short haul water bombers into transatlantic aircraft. Is that oil there? That's not supposed to be there. A mechanic guts it out on a remote airstrip in minus 40. And the C-46 crew faces the toughest landing of their lives. Orchard, orchard, orchard. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. Is that oil there? That's not supposed to be there. Buffalo races against the clock to turn two low-flying short-haul water bombers into transatlantic aircraft. A Buffalo mechanic guts it out on a remote airstrip in minus 40 and the C-46 crew faces the toughest landing of their lives. Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Midwinter freeze is set in. It's been teetering around minus 40 for days. So far, the weather hasn't stopped Buffalo Joe. He's still flying the daily passenger run from Hay River. But once the temperature slips below minus 40, even Joe stops flying. He's uh, anywhere from 41 to uh, 44 below here right now. I don't anticipate anything moving more than uh, this airplane here. If any emergencies come up or anybody runs out of uh, heat or lights or groceries, we'll take another look at it. They have a threshold for flying in these frigid conditions. 40, 40, 40. That's about it. That's minus 40 degrees in the air, minus 40 on the ground, and minus 40 at the flight's destination. It's the trifecta of no-fly weather. There's that minus 40 threshold. It's a magical number. Once you get past minus 40, once you see a four in front of the zero on your thermometer, shit happens, man. At 40, 40, 40, the fleet is grounded by the cold. And that's a big problem for cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic. All of this stuff, most of it's food, and then I got bread and stuff in here. And then the freezers are full too. But we can only do what we can do. Buffalo Captain Devin Brooks is up early. But his girlfriend Janelle Glenn is still fast asleep. Off. I seen her in the plane dressed in her camouflage snowsuit one day and then we just started hanging out. That was that was it. Hey. We just sort of met and kind of hung out and hit it off, I guess, and yeah. Good morning, Sunshine. They're living together now. And they'll both be late for work if they don't hurry. See you at work. I drink lemon juice in the morning because it's supposed to wake you up. It doesn't really work. <laughs> Devin shows up where Joe is keeping a sharp eye on the temperature. It will go to the public forecast and get me, if you can, the forecast. I mean, that's, what, that's what's happening. I wonder what's going to happen. Once it hits minus 40, everything just freezes up quicker, and when you start a cold engine, more can go wrong. Devin's anxious to get flying. So is co-pilot Scott Blue. They get paid by their hours in the air. Checking the weather up the valley right now. Seeing the temperatures, and it's cold. So it's still cold, Joe? Get dressed it up, take it off today, and double up tomorrow. Sounds good to me. All right, thanks. It's still 40, 40, 40. Joe sends Devin home. But food shipments for the settlements up the Mackenzie Valley are backing up in the cargo terminal. 
So Joe's keeping one flight crew on standby and hoping it warms up just enough to fly. Nothing's moving in Yellowknife, but at the Buffalo Hangar in Red Deer, Alberta, 1,200 kilometers south, there's a lot going on. Buffalo Joe has just sold two CL-215 water bombers to the Turkish government. A $7 million deal that's crucial to Buffalo's bottom line during the recession. Selling the planes was the easy part. The challenge will be getting these lumbering, short-range, low-flying prop planes across the North Atlantic. Right now, it all rests in the hands and tools of mechanic Corey Dodd. It is a very big deal. The economy is basically going for shit. You know, everybody's, you know, really scraping to get trips done and, you know, find work and stuff. We're still, we're giving her. This is the way we've got to make a living, so we've got to do what we got to do. Yeah, it's going to be good. Make some noise. Wake up the airport. As the chief mechanic for the 215s, Corey won't just be getting the planes ready to go. He'll be on board all the way to Turkey, too, in case something goes mechanical. Yeah, let's go give her a whirl. Start the engine. Okay, ready here. Come on, you old pig. Uh, we're going to ferry them across the ocean, and once we get over there, we're going to probably do a two to three year contract to maintain and crew them. It's a dangerous transatlantic flight that these planes were never designed to make. There is no alternate airport. There is no, hey, let's go land here or let's land in the bush or something. They're over the open water. And this isn't like your lake at your cottage water. This is rolling seas, high winds. The airplane behind me is not set up to be in a rock and roll and f wave fest. That's weighing on Corey's wife, Sonia. She's a pilot for one of Buffalo's main competitors, and she understands the risk her husband will be taking. A 215 is a smaller airplane. It's not pressurized. It's going to be down in the weather, and it is older. There's going to be less options when they are over the ocean uh, to even glide to safety wherever they may be. A lot of people joke that it's a boat and they can be in a better airplane, but uh, it's a big ocean and, and I don't think they would last very long. Corey said goodbye to Sonia a week ago before heading to Red Deer. If he can get the planes ready in the next few days, he'll go back to Yellowknife to see her one last time before departing for Turkey. And if he can get home, Sonia's got another mission waiting for him. Well, she kind of jokingly said that she would like to uh, conceive a child before we left. <laughs> Just so if something did happen, we could carry on my legacy. Well, Corey's is the man I plan to spend the rest of my life with, and, and if he doesn't come back, that's not going to work out very good. Um, it's made us think a, a little bit about stuff that's important, like uh, family. And maybe it's time to start that. But they can't start anything until Corey solves the major hurdle facing his dangerous flight the short range of the 215. The route that we're taking across the Atlantic, um, the airplane actually doesn't have enough fuel or oil to do that. In summer, the planes could cross the Atlantic via the northern route, making short hops from landmass to landmass to refuel. But that route is too stormy in winter. They'll have to fly southeast across 2,000 kilometers of ocean to the Azores Islands, a 10-hour flight. But the planes only carry enough fuel for about six hours. Corey has to find a way to get an extra thousand gallons of fuel on each plane. No, well, it's all good. I hope. Back at Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, things are heating up. Sort of. Right now here is minus 38. Warm enough for Joe to give the one standby crew, Captain A.J. DeCoast, co-pilot Gord Cooling, and engineer Adam Smith, the go-ahead to fly. Oh, we're on the uh, Mackenzie Valley food mail run. We're taking groceries, private freight, all the stuff that uh, supplies the communities. 
They'll be delivering much needed supplies up the Mackenzie Valley in one of Buffalo's vintage C-46 aircraft. And it's best to do the inspection before it gets covered in snow. Yeah, daily inspection. As the engineer on board the C-46, I have to be prepared to fix anything. Cylinders, tires, heaters. I've had to change many a thing up the valley. But with temperatures hovering around the 40-40-40 no-fly range, Adam, AJ, and Gord are hoping their 65-year-old piston pounder holds up on this 1,700-kilometer run. Coming up... TX-70 is coming to decoffee. Mikey loses radio contact with the C-46 and prepares for the worst. TX-70 is coming to decoffee. I got until about quarter to eight before I can initiate an emergency response plan. On a day so cold that no one is flying, a lone Buffalo Airways C-46 cargo plane has been cleared for takeoff. It's carrying essential supplies to settlements up the Mackenzie Valley. But the number two engine on this plane has been acting up lately. Engineer Adam Smith believes he's got it running smoothly now, but as he and Captain A.J. DeCoast and co-pilot Gord Cooling head to their first stop, things start to go wrong. We moved on the descent into Delany, and the engine started backfiring. Adam doesn't have much time. The engines can freeze solid within a half hour in these temperatures. He opens up the cowling and takes a look. Backfiring is not uncommon in these old 18-cylinder engines. Adam doesn't find anything wrong. The real test will come on takeoff. You're gonna have a big problem. You're gonna notice it most on takeoff power because that's the biggest strain on the engine. Right now, we're just running it out of refuse power setting and it seems to be running pretty good. It's a daily challenge for Adam to keep Buffalo's 65-year-old C-46s flying. I don't know how to describe it. It's a love. I can't believe I get paid to do this. But these planes are in Adam's blood. His father, Jim, was a legend at Buffalo Airways. My dad was the chief pilot here for 15 years. I've been around here since I was nine. I started working here when I was 12. This is sort of uh, the Jim Smith pictures. Jim Smith suffered a fatal heart attack at the age of 48 while driving a car on the tarmac at Buffalo. My dad died on December 15th, five years ago now. Uh, Adam looked up to Jim with great admiration as his dad, and Jimmy was very proud. He was hard on me. He actually uh, was probably a lot harder on me than he was anybody else. He wanted me to strive to succeed, and uh, so he kind of toughened me up. Since then, Adam's kept these old engines turning in the raw cold, and today, there's a new challenge. Heading towards the settlement of Norman Wells, the number two engine begins to lose power. Maybe it's a top cylinder or something if it's not leaking into oil, eh? Yeah, maybe. Could be a bag. Could be high tension. Are you AJ's anxious to get the C-46 on the ground in Norman Wells, so Adam can get another look at the faltering number two engine. Things are quiet at Buffalo HQ. The C-46 is the only plane in action due to the near 40-40-40 conditions. It's pretty cold. Uh, you can get the bubbles to, to freeze, which is kind of neat. At these temperatures, uh, it just kind of turns into almost plastic. For Devin and Janelle, the cold presents a unique opportunity. We're going to ice fishing. Got the bait right here. 
since nothing's moving in the cargo terminal. Let me do it. Let me do it. I got the magic touch. Janelle has the day off too. Ice fishing, man. Like nobody goes ice fishing, I don't think anymore. Let the games begin. Brains before beauty. <laughs> dig it, baby, dig it. I'm digging it. Give me a fish, other than tuna. Like, I know the fish are around. We have to catch one. People deserve to catch fish when they go ice fishing, okay? Yeah, it's a lot of work. You know what? We need a freaking fish. We have a lot of fun together. Just give us, just give us a little tiny fish. Anything. It just works, I guess. I just even want to bite. I just want to thrill. You know, I don't really care. Do you I get off on something. the thrills, Miss Glenn? Yeah. <laughs> Janelle has lightened up this usually gruff captain, but the future for this couple is still up in the air. You know, I could get another job and go, and she could go someplace. I think he cares about what I want to do, you know, and he knows that I care about what he wants to do. That ah, was a good day. It was fun. We didn't catch any fish. We're gonna head home, have a hot shower, go to the grocery store and buy some fish. <laughs> 1,200 kilometers south at Buffalo Airways hangar in Red Deer, Alberta, mechanic Corey Dodd is under the gun to figure out how to get two short haul water bombers outfitted so they can make it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Hey, okay. we're talking. Buffalo Joe is expected in a few days to check on Corey's work. Pressure? I don't know, you just gotta deal with it. Yeah, I can't get too worked up. You just gotta make things happen. Oh yeah, it's crunch time now. Now we got no more excuses. Corey's found a solution to increase the fuel capacity of the 215s. Uh, we're using these rubber bladder tanks. Uh, we're going to plumb the right into the actual airplane's tanks and then use auxiliary pumps to pump fuel from the cabin into the main tanks. That gives the plane an extra 1,400 kilometers of range. 529 U.S. gallons. So it'll be approximately 3,000 pounds. With two tanks per plane, Corey will be riding with 6,000 pounds of extra aviation fuel in his back seat. He has to make sure there are no leaks and no room for a potentially fatal error. It's the first time Buffalo has attempted a trip of this scale in a plane this small. This is the first time we put him in a, in a CL-215. These tanks have been around the world several times. Probably been to Indonesia five times through Hawaii. They wouldn't have needed as much fuel as this requires to go through the Azores. It's a gamble, but there's just no other possibility for getting planes and crews safely to Turkey. If we can't make it to the Azores, uh, basically we're screwed. And if Corey's plan doesn't pass Joe's inspection, they're doubly screwed. Visibility to the west through to the northeast. The C-46 is on approach to Norman Wells, with the right engine continuing to act up. Captain A.J. DeCoast brings the plane down safely. Roger. The extreme cold has left Norman Wells Airport all but deserted. Buffalo mechanic Adam Smith is on his own to find the engine problem and fix it. It's the temperature out here, Gord? Minus degrees. And getting colder. 40 below, you're looking at about half an hour before that engine's frozen. With an anxious pilot looking over his shoulder, Adam has to quickly zero in on a probable cause. I don't know what, what caused this one. It's amazing when you have a breakdown how like seamlessly things can, can be fixed or repaired, uh, depending on who you have together with you, or the same job can take a really long time. It just depends on who's leading it. Adam discovers the problem, a broken push rod. One of the push rods went to the push rod tube, so they gotta replace it. Push rods control the valves in each engine cylinder. Spinning cams push the rods, opening and closing the valves in proper sequence. 
In these temperatures, it's not easy installing a push rod to micromillimeter specifications. It's a race against time. Your hands freeze up pretty much right away. They stop working. Uh, you freeze the backs of your ears if they're not protected, your nose. My glasses freeze to my cheeks. Everybody's cold. You gotta be really quick because the engine will get cold. And could freeze solid in minutes. It's all in Adam's hands. And his hands are freezing. Still to come. Oh, we're gonna get beat to shit. Devin and co-pilot Scott Blue try to land in deadly wind shear. Speed. Call the fucking speed. On the deserted Norman Wells airstrip in 40 below, mechanic Adam Smith is replacing a push rod in the C-46's right engine as fast as his frozen hands can manage. And he has his late father, Buffalo's former chief pilot, to thank. My dad is the reason that Joe has C-46. My dad hadn't come to work for him. He wouldn't have gotten the C-46s. Jim Smith inspired Buffalo Joe to expand the fleet and he inspired his son to do his best. My dad basically took me under his wing. I worked till the job's done and that was all because of him. While Adam tries to fix the broken push rod with numb fingers, a bit of luck. A large portable heater is found at the deserted terminal. In the north, you grab what you need, no questions asked. This is a Herman Nelson. It's basically a portable heater. And it will loosen everything up because the oil's freezing right now and you can stick things together. It'll, uh, all the oil's sticking together so it makes it a little bit more of a challenge to uh, fix things. Things don't just fall apart like they should. This diesel heater could be a lifesaver. Well, if we're here for too long, it's going to be very cru crucial because the engine will freeze and then it, it won't be, we won't be able to turn it over to get it to run. It'll be too cold to start, you just break stuff. If the Herman Nelson can warm the engine and Adam's hands, he might be able to get the repair done by nightfall. Should be about an hour from now, I hope. I think we do not want to spend Friday night in house. Norman Wells has a population of about 800. A small oil drilling town with little to do on a Friday night. On the frozen tarmac, the portable heater has done the trick. We had to change the tube, change the seals, put in, find the right length push rod because they're different lengths. You gotta sometimes put the push rod in four or five times till you get the right length. The repair is done. The crew hurries to get the C-46 ready for startup, hoping that the engines haven't been exposed to the brutal cold for too long. If you can't move the propeller, you won't be able to start it. Pressure's coming up, uh, fuel pressure's normal. Now we can get out of here. Carry on and go home. But the repair has put them over an hour behind schedule, and no one has phoned company about it. Up here, it's not uncommon for a plane to be out of radio range from HQ. I can't get a hold of uh, HW. Um, hopefully, everything's okay. In Red Deer, the boss has arrived. This is your 500 gallon job? Nope. Right there, it's 529. That's it. Brand new one. He's Mechanic Corey Dodd is ready for the inspection of the new fuel and oil systems he's just installed. What do you got, you got This is your 539? That's 529. The giant fuel bladders, accessory oil drums, and new fuel lines should extend the range of the water bombers for their trip overseas. But the final call belongs to Buffalo Joe. And we're, and it's vented? Nope, these tanks aren't vented. Joe has his company and the lives of his crew riding on the CL215s, and he won't take any chances. And the oil? <coughs> the oil? The oil's right here. Where, where, did, where did these go? 
Those go up through the back of the wing yeah. into the tank, oil tank. If there's anything that doesn't meet with Joe's approval, it'll be back to square one for Corey. Has he ever used this in real extreme cold weather, these tanks? I don't know. Extreme cold weather? No, I mean, if there's 30 below here, we're not going to go anyway. Like, what about these, uh, these lines breaking? If one of the crew steps on a cold fuel line during flight, it could rupture the plastic hose and cause a dangerous leak. Oh, no, it's just that, uh, you know, they're very careful of plastic hose in extreme cold weather. They, they do breakable. But no, it's not a lot of high traffic air. Nobody going back here, either, either Corey or Norm. No, oh, he's just got his normal mumble, mumble jumble comments and, that no one can really understand, but we all know what he's getting at, so. It's very good, very well. I like the, I like the, uh, the setup there. Corey's system passes muster. I guess he's pretty happy with everything. He had one little concern about the uh, clear fuel hose, but that should be not a problem. Keep them safe. Sit in your seat. Now Corey can set up a test flight and just maybe get home to see his wife Sonia before he has to leave for Turkey. But Sonia fears they'll have to put their plans to start a family on hold. I just have to go with the worst case scenario that I'm not going to be able to see him before he leaves. Flying in the dark, an hour from Yellowknife, the C-46 crew, AJ, Gord, and Adam, are trying not to think about their own worst case scenario. Uh, we're running at minimum power setting right now, yeah. There could be another broken push rod too, or mid valve or something. And there's another problem. The cross street's the issue, eh? Yeah, this is the cross street valve right here. It's very, very hard to move. If AJ has to close down the number two engine, engine number one will have to work harder, burning more fuel. It won't have enough in its wing tank to get them back to Yellowknife. The usual solution? Open the crossfeed valve, allowing fuel to be drawn from engine number two's tank on the opposite wing. But the crossfeed valve is frozen. It's minus 40 up here where we're flying. Not an obvious tag. So we're doing our best to try to get it back to home base. It's been a hell of a day for Buffalo Airways C-46 crew on the Mackenzie Valley run. The only plane flying in freezing 40-40-40 conditions is having serious problems with its number two engine. Captain A.J. DeCoast and co-pilot Gord Cooling are trying to get home to Yellowknife with engineer Adam Smith, hoping his recent repair work holds out a little longer. If we were forced to shut down, then we'd be landing at the nearest airport, so... Back at Buffalo, Mikey tries again to reach the mysteriously delayed flight on the radio. The C-46 is still out of radio range 50 kilometers from Yellowknife. I got until about quarter to eight before I can initiate an emergency response by Mikey gives it one more try. TX7 is going to be uh, Is Mikey trying to get hold of this? Uh, we're, uh, we'll be landing in about 20 minutes. Okay, copy that 20 minutes. And the flight's back in radio range, and everyone's okay. So we're going to be coming straight in on 09. Yeah, just in front of the hangar, and then we'll open up and throw it in. After traveling in darkness for hours, the lights of Yellowknife are a welcome sight to the C-46 crew. Finally, Texas, you got three degrees, curb is cool, two goes long, two joint pressures up, one flip to go keep their cord, go to there. On approach, AJ decides to keep the backfiring number two engine running. The landing is smooth but the number two engine will need a complete maintenance check before this plane will fly again. Thanks, Adrian. But Adam Smith has one more job to do before he can get out of the cold. Tent it all up, you're frozen again. By the time the airplane's put to bed and then you go home and jump in a hot shower. A new day in Red Deer, Alberta. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader has arrived to take the newly retrofitted water bombers on a test flight. He doesn't get too excited. He just does what has to be done and usually everything works out good. 
Arnie will also be the lead pilot on the dangerous cross-Canada and transatlantic journey to deliver the planes to the buyer in Turkey. Well, I've never done a flight uh, that far with that type of an airplane. I've done it with Herx and, you know, DC-8s and things like that, but not with a summertime airplane is what we're okay. dealing with here. So weather is the biggest factor. We're flying a summertime airplane in winter conditions. The crew needs this test flight to put any fears to rest. I'll just taxi it back here and then if everything's good, we'll blast off. Okay. Sounds good. They haven't even left the ground and there's already a problem. See that oil there? That's not supposed to be there. We got a pretty good oil leak on the oil cooler. So we're gonna have to change that out before we go for test flight. We got another couple of little oil leaks on the engine. If they hadn't caught this leak, the results could have been disastrous. The, the cooler's f The cooler's f Yeah. He's pissing out the bottom of it pretty good. We'll go when he says we can go. It's worth the wait. Well, I'd rather fix this here than fix it in a life raft in the ocean, so. Corey needs to fix the leak and get the test flight done today, or else he won't make it home to see his wife. I do hope I get to see him one last time before he goes across the Atlantic. That would mean a lot, lot to us. Corey and his team work feverishly to repair the leak in the engine cooler. This won't take very long. Finally, this CL215 is ready for a test flight. I'm ready to go here anytime. Arnie flies the 215 full out. I think she's pretty good, Corey. What do you think? Oh, yeah, whatever. Go ahead and head back. I'm happy. I don't see anything wrong with it. Eh? That seemed to work pretty good, eh? I think so. The water bomber passes the test flight with only a few minor adjustments to be done. Miller type. Those are little snags, yeah. Little snags that can be dealt with by the other mechanics. Corey's got a flight to catch. I'll go back to see the wife and maybe make a child, see what happens. <laughs> Next morning, the temperature in Yellowknife is minus 36, allowing Buffalo to resume regular service. Well, today's not as bad as it was yesterday. It's still cold, but it should warm up during the day, so uh, the food needs to go. After a couple of unscheduled days off, due to the 40-40-40 conditions, Captain Devin Brooks is glad to be flying the Valley Run today. Devin's co-pilot, Scott Blue, is also his roommate. How's the early morning wake-up call go? <laughs> and he's noticed some changes since Devin's girlfriend, Janelle Glenn, moved in. Well, I think the place gets a little cleaner. <laughs> it's not quite so dirty. The decor of the apartment has certainly improved. Certain magazines aren't around as much as they used to be with <laughs> Janelle around. Don't think you're ever up or uh, neutral? Scott is Devin's friend, but in the C-46 cockpit, Devin is the boss. I'm trying to teach him what my captain's taught me. And just because he's my roommate, I can probably say a little bit more to him. He's old enough, older than me. He can take it. He's a man. I'm only doing it to try to make him a better pilot. It's a very typical plane to fly. Um, you know, and I'm still learning every day. And Scott has little choice. At six foot seven, he's too tall to fly any other plane in the Buffalo fleet. I would have been checked out sooner if I could have flown the DC-3. Uh, a fellow by the name of James ended up getting that check out because he fit, I did not. I had to wait a few more months to get on the C-46. Like Scott, Devin started out at Buffalo as a co-pilot on the C-46. I was put in from float planes to C-46 co-pilot. I had a tough time. I was in the same boat. I couldn't fly the damn thing for three or four months. It's a very, very difficult airplane to fly. 
Once again, Adam Smith is the onboard mechanic. He knows what Scott's up against. Well, Scott's a pretty green co-pilot. He's got maybe 600 hours in the airplane, and that's not a lot of time for that airplane. Go selectors. Front's here, quantity's fine. Those pumps, go on hold. Carburetor in, go. Ignition. It's clicking for Scott now. He's getting better and better and better. Set pre takeoff circle plate. You on that power, Buffalo 508, turn up complete, ready for takeoff. Buffalo 508, break, turn up, clear, takeoff, runway 15. 508. They're on their way. Today's Valley Run will not only test Devin and Scott's medal as flyers, it will test their friendship as well. With clear, calm skies over the Mackenzie Valley, C-46 Captain Devin Brooks makes the most of this flight, taking the vintage warplane down to a low altitude. Up here, you got the freedom to fly around, see different things. It gives you the perspective on how fast you're actually flying. Probably makes you a better pilot, too, because you're paying attention more. Sure, you're on a flight plan, but it's uncontrolled airspace, and that, to me, is, is fun right now. It's fun now, but there's trouble up ahead over Toledo. Located at the junction of the Mackenzie and Great Bear Rivers, Toledo means where the rivers meet in Dene. You got the two rivers coming together. You got the big rock for turbulence coming out of a valley and into another valley. So you get some pretty interesting winds and can be pretty rough in there. We got a warning that there was wind shear in Toledo, but up to that point, everything was fine. Converging bodies of water and land formations like Bear Rock, right beside Toledo's airstrip, can whip up volatile flight conditions on final approach. Coming over the trees, the airplane drops out of the sky. We can't do that. Because of its shape, the C-46 is extremely vulnerable in wind shear. Big fat body, not very long, so it can get twisted and tossed. And when your crosswinds are changing all the time, it just isn't a good scenario whatsoever. Wind shear is a very hard thing because everything looks normal. I fly along and bang. It's like a thief in the night takes away your ability to fly. So it's scary. Back in Yellowknife, the Buffalo staff have heard the weather warning for Toledo. And that has Devin's girlfriend, Janelle, worried about his safety. There's only a certain amount of wind that the 46 can handle, like in a crosswind. So across like the, the runway, whatever they're landing on. And uh, you know, if it's if it's bad, then they can they can really crash. Yeah. Flying is just one huge calculated risk, right? Hopefully, the pilots are uh, trained enough to deal with it. As the C-46 approaches Toledo, the threatening thousand-foot-high Bear Rock looms large. From past experiences, you know that Bear Rock gives always oh, turbulent. From our perspective, it's just stay away from it. It's bad. I've seen lots of wind shear in there, and lots of rough turbulence. As the wind buffets the plane, Devin gets set for a wild ride. Watch that speed every couple knots, call it out. Pilot flying is dealing with flying the aircraft, looking outside of the cockpit, you know, with quick glances. I was watching Devin as he was making his approach. He put full left hand aileron in, and the airplane stayed level. And when I saw that, I go, oh, this is going to be bumpy. Oh, we're going to get beat this shit. My job as a co pilot is to assist the captain. You slip into train mode, everything becomes, you know, short, sweet, to the point. Say it quickly, say it loudly. Your reactions have to be like that. Any, any variation. Scott knows a co pilot's responsibilities on approach. Their head does not go up, their head stays in the cockpit, and they're just scanning, 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 scanning everything, they're calling airspeeds. But knowing what to do and doing it under pressure are two different things. All the Call the speed. Roger that. He doesn't need to look outside. His job is just to take care of the stuff in the plane called speeds. Call the speed. It's vital. Every five knots, if not two. I just told him call the speeds every five knots and any fluctuation. You got to call it, man. It's been 20 knots. I'm going to get pissed off here. 
In a life and death situation, there's no mincing words. He just didn't have his head in the plane enough. Devin needed somebody to vent on, and Scott was right there, and that's kind of the co-pilot's job is to get vented on. A sudden gust hits the 46 like an oncoming train. The plane suddenly loses speed and altitude. When, when I hit the wind shear, I seen it on my airspeed that it dropped 20, 25 knots. I've never seen a 25 knot loss in 200 foot loss like that. Wind shear blasts them head on. With the gear down, flaps down, you know, you drop too much more, you can stall. A sudden top wind could slam the plane to the ground. One ten. Devon descends lower, just feet from the runway. Not bad. Devon overshoots the runway, aborting the landing, but he's not giving up. I got a comment from the other side. He's going to give it one more try. I was thinking we should have left after the first one. Final approach to the remote airstrip in Toledo. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks has already made one attempt to land in extreme wind shear. Orchard, orchard, orchard. In 10 years, flying in this airplane, that's the worst wind shear I've ever seen in Toledo. Despite the treacherous conditions, Devin wants to give it one more try. I just had to. Uh, I got one, take it up to 23. 23, I'm going to do it. Up top. The wind shear is nasty, the airspeed is fluctuating, the plane is getting tossed around a little too much. It's not something to be toyed with in any way, shape, or form. Well, he doesn't really have something to prove, but he's got to at least try as hard as he can to get the airplane in. And Scott, his roommate and co-pilot, is focused and ready this time. Let's take a look outside, make sure everything's fine. That's good, I'm alright. Yeah. The second shot, we came around in a different pattern. I tried to stay over the, the Mackenzie River a little bit, see if it was any common. 85. 95. 90. 45. 20. It was my decision, and... I didn't feel like wrecking the airplane. Being the youngest captain at Buffalo means don't be an idiot, don't let it go to your head. I guarantee you every one of us has a little cockiness streak in us, but you don't take that to the left seat of an airplane. The wind shear was so close to the ground, we could have landed and slid off the end of the runway or something else worse could happen. Wind shear, 100 feet off the ground. We're just going to leave Toledo's freight on board and go home. What do you think, Adam? Oh, it's way too rough, man. It's not worth it. I don't really care if they don't get their food. Let's get the out of here. can have their groceries tomorrow. I'd rather be alive sitting here talking to you about it than make a stupid mistake. That's being the captain of an airplane, Ed. These guys are all my responsibility. They have input. But at the end of the day, it's my responsibility as them. Okay, you ready? As soon as he's home, Corey and Sonya rev it up in the Great White North. A chance to forget about the dangerous trip he's about to embark on. You can't dwell on if you're gonna crash or die or whatever, you just gotta plug away. You just turn into a nervous wreck if you're constantly worried about all that stuff. But it's impossible for Sonya to dwell on anything else. No, I won't see him until he's, they delivered the planes and then they have come back to Canada, whenever that is. As a pilot, uh, I can understand someone wanting to do a flight like this. I would love to do a flight like this. As the wife of someone who's going to be part of the ferry crew, it's worrisome. And then, and then the big trip will be from St. John's to the Azores. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, they just got to get there. They, they will. They will. Yeah. Absolutely. They are risking their lives. And I don't want to, to lose my husband over something like this. Gary? 
scary, but scary. exciting. Corey volunteered for this assignment, and there's no turning back now. Next time on Ice Pilots NWT. Buffalo Joe has a meltdown over an operational screw-up. Goddamn clean shirt I've covered before. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks faces a tough decision over a job offer in Africa. And a Brit and his dog struggle to make it to a remote outpost to start a new life. I feel like I'm in a second world war movie. Just about to get on one of these bloody things. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Buffalo Joe has a meltdown over an operational screw-up. Big damn clean shirt uncovered. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks faces a tough decision over a job offer in Africa. And a Brit and his dog struggle to make it to a remote outpost to start a new life. I feel like I'm in a Second World War movie. February has turned into a busy month at Buffalo Airways. The staff is scrambling to prepare two firefighting CL-215 water bombers for delivery to Turkey, on the other side of the world. Company President Joe McBrien made the $7 million sale with the Turkish government weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. But the deal has one proviso, deliver the planes by early March. I was pretty happy that it went through and everything, and uh, everyone was happy. Uh, on the other flip side is, no, we got a very serious job to do. The low-flying, short-haul CL-215s are not made to traverse continents, especially not in frigid temperatures. They're used in summer to scoop water off lakes for firefighting. And then there's the small matter of getting them across the stormy North Atlantic in winter. Once the boys leave Red Deer on the 215s, they'll cross Canada with stopovers in Winnipeg, Montreal, and St. John's. From there, the most dangerous leg of the journey to Turkey begins. A 2,200 kilometer flight across the Atlantic to the Azores with nothing in between but open water. And this isn't like your lake at your cottage water. This is rolling seas, high winds. That's got Buffalo's mechanics working around the clock to turn these boats with wings into intercontinental aircraft. We put a lot of time and effort into it, a lot of research, a lot of background. And uh, this is one we'll watch very closely. Good to go, boys. But a big family event is making things even more complicated. Well, my sister's getting married. Sister Kathy's wedding isn't at the town hall. It's in Las Vegas. Who we knew that had been to uh, Turkey, who had flown With over. Joe so focused on the water bomber contract, the rest of the McBrians are wondering if he'll be there to give Kathy away. Well, he's been told he's going, and he's trying everything to come up with an excuse not to, I think. Mikey, on the other hand, is looking forward to the trip. I went for lunch, and I got a frickin' fortune cookie here. It says, need some adventure and an enjoyment? Take a vacation. Mikey's following his cookie's advice. All I'm thinking right now is Las Vegas. But that means making sure nothing falls through the cracks while he's gone. Today is the day I got to train uh, Sandy here to replace me. I'm heading down to Vegas tonight. Sandy Sutton has been working at Buffalo long enough to be game for anything. So first, we'll, we'll talk to the airplane. I'm asking him. Just uh, what time you would be down? Yes, good morning, PNR. Just wondering what your ETA is. Everything you got is on these keys. The one's the ticket counter, one's the medic room. It's a critical time to be my, away. My, uh, yeah, keep lock on it. Mikey is betting that preparations for the dangerous water bomber delivery to Turkey is well in hand. 
Enough, he hopes, for some fun in Vegas. That's it. Might as well take these. Packing her up. Oh, I don't need a toque. This says Buffalo. My hat's Buffalo. Black t-shirt's Buffalo. Hoodie's Buffalo. Even my watch is Buffalo. From the land of ice to the city of lights. Imperial 125. Holy Holy shit. What the They got a sewing kit in here. Hello. Holy my sister. Carrie. Hey, How's it going? Oh, this. Are we related? We know it's apple juice. Yeah. That mine too. 50 of our closest friends are running around looking for you guys. Okay, just give her bye bye work, bye bye yelling. And viva Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas <laughs> stays in Vegas. Thank you, sir. And Mikey's not thinking about what's happening back in Yellowknife. It's when we leave North of 60, it gets a little crazy. No. The next morning, he's hung over and half awake when the office calls to confirm a booking. A customer is moving house and home to the tiny Arctic outpost of Politak the day after tomorrow. But right now, Mikey can barely tell the time. Uh, all only smokers. Uh, today's the day of the wedding. Uh, we're hoping it wasn't at noon. It's either noon or five. And then it's time for the wedding ceremony. Here comes the groom. Here comes the bride. And here's the father of the bride. Joe kept everyone guessing right up until the end. No, 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 no. <laughs> Do you take him as your husband? <laughs> It is Kathy Day, but uh, we uh, we really want to celebrate it. So we will dance on these tables tonight. Here, glass, I hope. I'm really happy you dressed up for the occasion. That means a lot. The McBrians know how to party. But it seems that Mikey is all partied out. Back from a wild few days in Vegas, Mikey gets some bad news. There's a scheduling screw up on the charter he booked, and Joe's not happy. Had we paid attention to Buffalo, there wouldn't have been a pull up in the charter. How long have we known about it? You can argue about it forever. It's a screw up. We did one charter this month and screwed it up. Before Vegas, Mikey sent two of Buffalo's top pilots south to Red Deer to stand by to fly the water bombers to Turkey leaving no one available to fly the charter to Politak. You know, that was supposed to be, you know what, the reason that thing is up there? Yeah. So it would go through this bullshit every day of maybe this, maybe that. Well, you guys are maybe and I got to off. I'm tired of this shit. Uh, uh, yeah, he's not in a good mood today. He yelled at me for 25 minutes. He leads by example, example of giving people shit. Now, Joe's taking charge of the situation, and that means another surprise trip, this time south to Buffalo's hangar in Red Deer, Alberta. Okay, Matt. You can pull them out. It's here that Buffalo pilots Arnie Schrader and Justin Simley are waiting to depart for Turkey on the CL-215 water bombers. Exciting for us, exciting for everybody. They've been trying to sell those airplanes for a while. And... Though the planes are prepped and ready, Buffalo still hasn't received a quarter million dollar delivery fee from Turkey. So Joe's decreed that no one is going anywhere. 
and he's furious that Mikey sent Arnie and Justin to Red Deer to stand by when a pilot is needed now for the charter. Do I need two? No. I think I said right outside there on my cell phone, I phone said, dig them shirt I'm covered before those two guys come out. I you know, here we are in Red Deer, there's somebody screwed up somewhere along the line. We talked to Mike and he, you know, we, we had, I thought it was arranged, they had enough well, coverage. Well, thought right? doesn't mean shit. Enough discussion. Joe takes action and pulls Justin out of Red Deer so he can fly the charter. You guys have a good time, we'll see you later. Still to come, the water bomber pilots prepare for the most dangerous journey of their lives. This morning, he was in Red Deer, Alberta. Now, Captain Justin Simley arrives in Hay River, Northwest Territories, 1,300 kilometers away. He's going to pilot a charter flight to the edge of the Arctic Ocean. At Buffalo Air, you have to be able to adapt to sudden changes. I'm surprised to be here. Justin came to Buffalo straight out of flight school. Eight years later, he has no plans to leave. You know, it's a bit of a frontier in a way, and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's where the excitement comes in. It's exciting. Who's this? This is Juno. His charter passenger, Keith Dowling, is at a major turning point. Can, you, uh, can we get someone to grab that, maybe? And I'll look after the dog. Although he grew up in Buckinghamshire, England, Keith settled in the Northwest Territories 20 years ago. For the past nine years, he's been working at a charitable society in Fort Smith. This is a huge life-changing uh, commitment as far as I'm concerned, where I'm moving from a place, my home of 20 years, to uh, Paula Tuck. Now, he's leaving Fort Smith, a town of 2,500 people, to become a housing manager in the remote Inuit community of Paula Tuck. Population, 250. It's a seven-hour flight from Hay River, north to Polituck. But Keith and his dog, Juno, might not be going anywhere right now. Forecast to be 45 knots out of the south-southwest, so I suspect if we carried on bravely, we'd probably get uh, stuck in a nasty-ass Arctic storm up there, so. Hey, Justin, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And you? Be nice You're to get out. somewhere, boys. No kidding. <laughs> well, we could go up there and. Uh... It's a bit. I just spoken to Paul Tuck like right now. Uh, it's fairly clear now, but the wind is picking up, and there is uh, a blizzard warning for later this afternoon. Yeah, we're we're uh, well aware of that. So it's going to be a few hours getting up there, and uh, Paul Tuck is not a good place to go when it's uh, when there's a blizzard happening. So I think we're going to sit tight today. It's supposed to clear up tomorrow. And uh, we'll get going first thing in the morning. When are you available to leave tomorrow? The soon as you are. Yeah, he was a little frustrated. Maybe a little abrasive at first. I should pick that up, Buffalo Airways, the Go Nowhere airline. For me, this is some like massive undertaking, right? I just want to get there and get the thing underway, right? Get my stuff unpacked. You can understand the guy's point of view. I mean, he was gearing himself up for a big move, you know, big change in his life. We'd get up there, and even if we get in in the blizzard, the locals wouldn't come out to the airport. Nobody goes to the airport if there's a southwest wind over 15 knots. I mean, that's, that's wind, yeah. It, because it throws a lot of turbulence, and they've, there's been a few, uh, few accidents up there because of it. Politux's fierce southwest wind is legendary. No one knows the dangers of the North better than that old bush pilot, Buffalo Joe McBrien. It's extremely turbulent in there. Airplanes become almost uncontrollable, which is very rare for airplanes to be un uncontrollable in wind. Nobody's been able to explain to me, and I've asked a lot of the experienced people around there, how come on, you know, I can control my airplane in any other wind, but this one, I seem to, seem to just be too violent for me. The Inuit residents of Politeuk believe a bad spirit is to blame. And Joe is not so sure they're wrong. Well, the myth has, has led the airplanes uh, not make it, getting caught up in that wind and, and busting themselves. The locals believe that, uh, you know, it's a bad omen. They've, they've, uh, there's been a few airplanes that have crashed there uh, in, those, in that wind shear. 
Keith is anxious to get to Polituck, but the move will have to wait at least one more day. We're not going to mess around with that, with that storm up there, and uh, hopefully it clears up in the morning. What can you do? Not much. Back in Yellowknife, it's a special day for Buffalo shipping assistant Janelle Glenn. It's my birthday! <laughs> my 21st birthday. Got the blankie? Janelle's yeah. getting treated to a day of dog sledding, thanks to her boyfriend, Buffalo captain Devin Brooks. Spoiler today, and I don't have to do it again for a long time. <laughs> The couple met when Janelle started working at Buffalo a few months ago. We started dating and here we are. She's living here. <laughs> That's it. He just likes me the way that I am and he's very smart and funny. At 28, Devin's the youngest captain of the C-46, the toughest plane to fly in Buffalo's fleet. It's a different airplane to fly than anything I've flown. It's one of the hardest to fly in the world, so it gives you self-satisfaction that I did go captain on it. I'll take that to the next job. <laughs> and Devin's not wasting any time. I'm ready for something new. My dream is to make captain at a major airline. And I know I will eventually. But first, he's lined up an interview for a job flying for the UN in Africa. Going to Africa and flying over there is just a different adventure I would like to do before the major airline. If he wants it, then that's good. He just has to make sure that he knows that he wants it, you know? And Devin doesn't seem to want to stay in the North. I think he'll miss it when he leaves, and right now he probably just doesn't know that yet. She needs to do what she wants to do and make her own life, and what happens between her and I, like I say, time won't tell. Soon enough, Devin's off to Vancouver tomorrow for the job interview. It's early morning at the Hay River Airport. Oh man, that sucks. And Justin Simley, the captain of Buffalo's charter flight to the remote village of Polituck, isn't liking the latest weather report. It's calling it locally half mile and blowing snow. Winds out of the south at 25 knots, it's too windy. Visibility's too low. The only storm in the entire Arctic is right over his destination. We're trying to get it done here, but uh, the weather doesn't seem to be cooperating, so. Buffalo Joe checks in before he heads to Yellowknife for the day. This afternoon it's supposed to be good, and tomorrow is, is good on the public forecast. Are you, It'll be tomorrow. Are you comfortable with that? Oh yeah, 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 I do it. Okay. Instead of waiting out the storm in Hay River, Justin decides to fly to the town of Norman Wells up the Mackenzie Valley. That should get them within striking distance of Polituck. You know, at least if we make it to the wells, we're two hours away as opposed to six or seven, eh? So that's why we're doing this. Justin gives co-pilot Sean Barry the go-ahead to prep the plane for takeoff. The DC-3 is credited with opening up passenger plane service in the 1930s. It proved itself in all kinds of conditions. In war, on remote airstrips, over jungles, deserts, and tundra. After a day's delay, passenger Keith Dowling is relieved to finally get going. Well, at least we're going somewhere today. We'll be a lot closer, and the whole point, according to the captain, is we should, even if we only get a little opening, we get straight in there. I think he was happy to be on the move, you know, to, to just get out of Hay River and get at least a little bit closer to, to his new home. On this charter flight, the expat Brit is moving house and home to a tiny Inuit outpost on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Everybody I know, my friends and people, think I'm quite mad um, to be going somewhere like Paula Tuck. I didn't want to go there completely alone, um, so I figured uh, I'd take my dog. 
She ain't gonna like this. Good. Come here. You did good. Now don't get off. <laughs> get off. Oh. Come here. You know. I'm just wondering if she needs to go to the toilet because she may be nerves. Come here, Gino. Ah. Coming up, it's all systems go for the water bomber crews. But a new problem grounds them. I don't know what to tell you there. We gotta get in the hangar. That's the big problem. In Yellowknife, there's good news. Buffalo Flight Ops Director Mike Hanley has just received the delivery fee he's been waiting for from the Turkish government. Now the water bombers can set off overseas. With that paperwork, we're fully approved and uh, the guys in Render have been notified this morning. But it's still not a go. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader has a new obstacle to overcome. I don't, I don't know what to tell you there. We gotta get in the hangar. That's the big problem. I sent you that sheet yesterday saying there's no space until Monday, so... They can't leave Red Deer until Sandy Sutton at head office can find hangar space for the CL-215 water bombers in Winnipeg. Their first stop on the cross Canada flight. Uh, you know, oh, okay, okay, thanks. Bye. Like that's Arnie. That's the head guy. He's fighting with me. Like we gotta get these planes. We can't go. And it's like, well, Arnie, I can only do what you can do, right? He's fighting with me, saying they gotta have two hangar spaces. But I've been telling these guys all along, there is not two hangar spaces like that. They said no. She's work still working on. Arnie talks it over with lead mechanic Corey Dodd. Yeah. One's no good. We have them both in. Yeah, it's going to take over, over half a day to warm it up, eh? Yeah. Of course, these airplanes are designed for summertime operations, and we're doing this in a winter environment. Normally, the 215 only flies in the summer months, fighting fires. This slow-flying boat with wings can scoop up 1,400 gallons of water in just 10 seconds. There you go. To get the water bombers to their new owner in Turkey, Buffalo must fly them there now, in February. But they're not winter planes. The 215s are vulnerable to extreme cold. These airplanes are not designed to be parked in those type of temperatures. You have to get them in a hangar to make them operate properly. And I'm just wondering if you might be able to have room for a couple of CL215s. If Sandy can't find two hangar spots to keep the water bombers warm after their first leg of the journey, there won't be any journey at all. So 95% booked almost everywhere. Different places have enough room for one plane, but they don't have room for two. With just 21 days left to get the planes to Turkey as contracted, this sale could already be in jeopardy. His friends think he's crazy, but now there's no turning back for Keith Dowling. Traveling on board a Buffalo Airways DC-3, he's moving himself, his dog Juno, and all his worldly goods to take a job in Politak, a remote Inuit village of 250 souls. We could reasonably describe the experience as rustic. A friend of mine actually said to me, whatever you do, Take a plastic bag with you, he said, because if the worst happens and you need to puke or take a piss, or if you absolutely can't help yourself that you either shit your pants or jump out the plane, he said, you'll be glad you took one of these. It will take five hours just to get to a stopover in Norman Wells. So Keith moves up to the cockpit to chat with Captain Justin Simley. So how are you feeling? You uh, you feeling good about the move to uh, Politan? Oh, I'm up for it. And, um, you know, obviously when you leave your home of 20 years, and for me that's Paul Smith, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you leave some people behind, or do you, you're leaving some friends behind, you're leaving all your comfort zones behind. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, Politan is actually really beautiful in the summer. The, the land around it turns green, and uh, every time I've been there, uh, you know, it's... Uh, 
and the reception has been warm, so I, I think you're going to enjoy living there. As long as you can get out every now and again, you know. Yeah, as I said, I'll be out and get out and on business and two or three times to see my psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, if you, you get there for two or three days and you want to walk out, just bonus will come get you. Don't walk back to Fort Smith. No, no. Keith has no intention of walking out. He just wants to get there and get settled in. In Vancouver, Buffalo's youngest captain, Devin Brooks, is cleaned up and dressed to impress. It's Valentine's Day, but instead of being home in Yellowknife with his girlfriend, Janelle, he has a job interview with an airline that flies for the UN in Africa. Yeah, this is a big one. This is 747. He's kept quiet about it at Buffalo in case things don't go as planned. You could blow it, say something stupid. They might not like you just for who your personality is. You, you might not get offered the job you want. In Yellowknife, Mikey's already on to him. He's leaving for two days in the middle of the week, and he didn't give an explanation. He just said he wants two days off. And usually what that means is that someone's leaving to, to do an a airline interview. I'm not saying that Devin's doing it. It's just I've seen it before. You don't really want to make it known that you're looking to get out before you're actually out. Still, after two years in the frozen north, Devin is looking for something new. I gladly trade in them snow pants and parka and beaver pelt of a hat or whatever they're called for a suit and tie and a pair of dress shoes. I'd trade that in pretty soon. I do really want this job. I'm thinking of it as a stepping stone, just like Buffalo was. And for now, Devin's trying not to think about the impact this job in Africa would have on his relationship with Janelle. He's taking things one step at a time. High above the Mackenzie Valley, Justin and Keith are already thinking about their next step. I think it's looking good for us to get over the today. Geez, I sure hope so. It's, it's tough for me to tell because it, nobody's picking up the phone and Paula touch, and that doesn't give me a good feeling, you know. When, uh, when nobody's at the airport and they should be there, 95107 on profile, showing uh, 750 down. After a five-hour flight, they make it to the settlement of Norman Bring Wells. Rep plus two. We need to down at three. Uh, Justin two. needs to check on the weather over Polituck. Maybe it's cleared up enough for them to continue on today. Keith and Juno have more urgent needs to take care of. What my dog is saying is, never mind that, I've got to go to the toilet. Juno. Good girl. Keith hopes this is just a short pit stop. Keith, my good man. Super, I've never been in an air traffic control place. Hello, air traffic controller. Keith is moving to Polita. Very slowly. We're just looking at the Polituck weather, and it's uh, it's still windy as hell. It's still 27 knots. So right. Pretty high to be going in there, but it is smartening up. I mean, it's come down about. 20, 30 knots from what it was. Doesn't look like the storm's gonna let up today, so... Uh, I mean, it's good for us tomorrow morning, uh, probably early. We'll call her a day at that and uh, try it in the morning. A bed for the night is in order. Go. Coming up, Justin and Keith look for shelter. <laughs> it's a fucking ghost town. But the crew is left out in the cold. In Yellowknife, Janelle Glenn is waiting to hear from her boyfriend, Devin, about his interview for a job in Africa. Her roommate and Buffalo co-pilot, Scott Blue, remembers when Janelle arrived in town. She shows up, and before she shows up, her auntie's like, ooh, Scott, you're gonna have to meet my niece. She's coming up, she's young, she's beautiful. You like her so much. I'm like, cool. I go on vacation, I come back. Devin beat me to the punch. <laughs> But it's Scott who's spending Valentine's Day with Janelle, although her mind is elsewhere. I'm gonna call Devin 
uh, to see how his interview went and uh, hopefully he answers or shut off his cell phone if he's still in the interview. Mm. Hey Devin, it's me. Just give me a call when you're uh, done your interview or whatever you're doing. Okay, love you, bye. The interview's over and Devin's facing a big decision. They offered me something that I need to think about. A job in the Congo, Sudan, or Uganda. One of the three. Oh, I'm excited, but I got thinking to do now, so I've already started that. He's got a four hour flight to consider his options. In just a few minutes before he boards to let Janelle know how it went. He got a job in Africa. He won't tell me what airplane or anything, but uh, it doesn't sound excited. I thought he'd be more excited or something, but. Africa's a long way from Yellowknife. Wandering the streets of Norman Wells, Justin, Keith, and the crew are discovering that there are only a few hotels in town. <laughs> it's a f***ing ghost town. I've never been here in the winter. <laughs> and it seems none are open year-round. What do you want to do there, Chief? Where's the next one? Oh, I don't know. Oh, we need a f***ing ride. Finally, after a frustrating search, success. Mm. Cozy, to say the least. Sort of. That's it, man. This is what it looks like. It ain't a lot for 229, is it? Uh, one of the other hotels we tried, we go to. They ain't. They're not even serving lunch today because it's Saturday. Make some sense of that. And but they are serving supper tonight. But it's only one menu, and it's the Valentine's menu. They had the tables all uh, set up. You know, all the couples were having dinner in there, dressed up in their in their suits, and we kind of come walking in in our oil stained and car hearts sticking like ab gas, you know, and sweat. It was pretty funny. Cheers to that. And it's uh, a pleasure to meet you, Keith. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Cheers, guys. I can think of a hundred uh, other places I'd rather be on Valentine's Day. Yeah. Cheers. All the stuff Keith has said. They're all smiles now, but the honeymoon will be over if they're still stuck here tomorrow. It's a new day and another chance for Justin and the DC-3 crew to get their passengers, Keith and Juno the dog, to their new home in Polituck. The biz is up now, it's uh, eight miles, so it's come up from a mile and a half this morning, so. The storm over the tiny Inuit town on the edge of the Arctic Ocean is dying down. This could be the window of opportunity that Justin has been waiting for. It's not perfect conditions, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was yesterday, and uh, and it's it's doable. Hopefully, we actually get into the air and get to Paul Attack. Keith finally gets his first glimpse of Polituck, where his new life is about to begin. And that's on the strip. Well, uh, obviously we just circled the runway to make sure it was clear. It looks like it's been recently ploughed. I got a little uh, glimpse of the, uh, the hamlet town. Uh, couldn't see much else. The reality of this life-changing move is hitting Keith. Well, I mean, I hope uh, I take to Paulatuck. I hope I take to uh, the people of Paulatuck, and likewise, they take to me. That would be a very nice situation. Final check. 75 over 879. Final check. Not bad. It's pretty cool. Yeah, 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 you're getting off in a minute. Come here. Just if I can disembark without dislocating myself. Whoa, 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 Gino. The local people come out to greet the new arrivals. Very nice to meet you. What's the dog? Hey, no joke, but the dog's name's Juno. 
Thank you, boys. Pleasure, man. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, anytime. A very, very interesting four days. A couple of days. Five days. Well done. <laughs> right on. See okay. you guys. Take care. Yeah. Fire hole. That goes in the bedroom too. I think his reaction was maybe a little bit nervous, but mostly excited and relieved that he was finally there. That's what the North's all about, is uh, meeting new people and new beginnings and a bit of an adventure. One of the last frontiers, you know. That's why all those guys are up here. Mission completed. Justin's flown to the frozen edge of the Arctic Ocean. Now, his mind turns to his next mission, flying water bombers on an even longer, more dangerous journey across the Atlantic Ocean to Turkey. Great to get the job done. Then your mind switches into turkey mode. That was the next thing. Coming up, Devin returns home with his mind made up. Returning to Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, Captain Devin Brooks has had a change of heart about the job offer to fly for the UN in Africa. Uh, the interview was good, but then I got thinking about it on the way back, and that wasn't the job for me. I'd rather stay in Canada. I think uh, it was a hard decision for him to, to uh, turn down the job, but I don't think he was ready to leave here anyway. I'm glad that he decided to stay, for sure. Oh, I'm happy. Not taking the job in Africa with the other company is no big deal. I don't know. It just wasn't for me. So Devin's not going anywhere, for now. And neither is Janelle. Here we are. The Hossie Emden in Red Deer. After flying a charter to the Arctic Ocean and back, Captain Justin Simley joins the rest of the Buffalo crew destined for Turkey. They did get her in the barn, right on. By contract, Buffalo only has three weeks left to deliver the water bombers. Problem is, they still haven't found a hangar to house the planes at their first overnight stop in Winnipeg. Basically, if we can't find hangar space, then, uh... You know, we can't leave the airplanes outside side to uh, freeze up. We started them in the cool, the engines will start. But it'll bust those, those lines got frozen oil and it'll bust those coolers up in the wings. So that's one of the big problems. Hey, Mike, Sandy, around? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Justin jumps right into the hangar issue. He calls Sandy at Buffalo HQ for an update. Hey, Sandra, how are you? I'm, I'm here and you're working hard. What have we got? Uh, where's the hope? You are tenacious, that is for sure. All right. Ernie, we got hangers in Winnipeg. Oh, oh, we got them? Yeah. Okay. Air Canada will take one for sure. Okay. Um, Kelly Western? Kelly Western may or may not, but if they don't, Air Canada will put the other one in. They got a jet going out at midnight. They'll throw it in. Okay. So, well, yeah, it was looking pretty sour there for a minute, but uh, yeah, things are picking up. But it'd be nice to get the show on the road for sure. Flying the two planes to Turkey will gobble up over 60,000 liters of fuel. Now that the Turks have paid up, Buffalo Joe's got gas money. 32,000. We got it all now, so we can go back to the airport and divide up among the boys. It's too much pressure for one guy to carry 30,000 in his pocket. You know, if he loses it, then all the guys are mad at him, eh? I got 4,000 a piece for everybody here that. We can't spend that for it, though. That's for gas. Just we'll, we'll, be burning, <laughs> we'll be burning it in the life raft to keep warm. Yeah. The guys can joke about the dangers, but this trip is not to be taken lightly. The North Atlantic's very difficult this time of year to fly over because there's all kinds of lows in there. And, you know, it's very difficult to get across. Their temperatures are, you know, 30 to 40 below. Weather's a huge thing. It's just real important when you're going on a trip like that. Everything has to be right because if you screw something up, Things can go very bad very quickly. Justin will be flying with Arnie. 
The other water bomber will be flown by Dave Poole from Red Deer and George Fury, just arrived from Newfoundland. Well, I gotta get a hot drop of coffee, man. Also arriving today is hey. Buffalo's cargo manager, Kelly Jurasevic. Bring it on. She's flown in from Yellowknife to give the boys a proper send-off on this dangerous journey. It's beer o'clock, my honey. Kelly's been at Buffalo just over a year. During that time, she's forged a strong friendship with Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader. He's 66, but he's my buddy, you know. He took me under his wing when I got here, and he's my, like, one of my best friends. And I'm fortunate to know him. Hi, I'm Kelly. Oh. So Kelly wants to say goodbye to Arnie and the crew in person. Hi, nice to meet you. This is a long trip for Arnie, especially at his age, too, you know. That concerns me. Well, you look pretty good and relaxed. Oh, yeah. And I think he's a bit worried, but I don't think he's, you know, letting everybody know that. <laughs> Arnie, good luck on your trip. And good luck, you guys, on your trip. I'm glad I got to be here and see you guys before you got to tick off. And after chewing out his pilots just days ago, Ooh. Joe is feeling good about the team he's put together for this daring adventure. If you look at all the different aspects of, of the background of all these guys, um, I don't think there could be a better crew assembled to do a job like we're going to start on right, right now. Well, I'll miss you guys. He said he's going to miss you. <laughs> yeah. Coming up, an emotional send-off oh, yes, really. for the crew of the CL-215 water bombers. Three weeks to deliver a pair of CL-215 water bombers to Turkey. The two Buffalo flight crews gear up for the journey of their lives. The first water bomber will be flown by two of Buffalo's best, Arnie Schrader and Justin Simley. Justin and I have flown along together lots. He worked with me on 215s for a few years. So it's, it's, it's just natural for us. Their in-flight mechanic will be Corey Dodd. Mechanics Norm Byrne and Matt Belanger will be in the second 215, piloted by Dave Poole and George Fury. It's an adventure for all of us to do this all right. type of a trip. We'll get them later. Yeah, we'll get another shot. For those left behind, like Kelly Jurasevic, it's a difficult goodbye. Take it easy. Oh, yes, we will be. I love you so much. We'll be good. Love you. Okay. I'm sure we're all just going to be sweating until we get the phone call that they made it. You know, because it's a long trip for those guys. Long trip. Smile! about Arnie and Justin going to Turkey. And I think they're real damn brave to do that for Joe. I just hope they make it safe and everybody's okay. Preparing behind them. Now it's finally time to fly. Uh, tower confirmed 299 plus one's clear for takeoff. Tiger 299 clear takeoff. 31 right turn out.
on the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. The Fed shut down Buffalo's flagship service. This is a notice of suspension for your flight. Wannabe pilot Rahman faces a life-changing decision I'm totally confused. that could scuttle his friend Jeremy's dreams too. And the water bomber crews face danger on a daring wintertime flight across Canada. We can't see with the weather ahead of us. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, the Fed shut down Buffalo's flagship service. This is a notice of suspension for your flight. And the water bomber crews face danger on a daring wintertime flight across Canada. We can't see with the weather ahead of us. It's been a tough winter at Buffalo Airways. The recession has hit the aviation industry hard, especially in Yellowknife, where mining exploration has dried up. That's left a lot of planes on the ground. To weather the hard times, Buffalo Airways President Joe McBrien and his two sons, Mikey and Rod, are gambling on an extraordinary contract. The 215 deal came at a good time, you know, with economic downturn. That's basically um, luck of the draw and Joe making the right decisions. The right decision Joe made was to sell two CL215 water bombers to the Turkish government for $7 million. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Yep, glad to but there's a catch. The deal requires Buffalo to fly the short haul low flying planes across the country in winter conditions they're not built for and then halfway around the world to Turkey via the stormy North Atlantic. Probably the toughest part of the journey is getting across Canada. Now in Red Deer, Alberta, it's takeoff time on the first leg of this marathon journey. Chief pilot Arnie Schrader is in the lead. Yes, what is what a big WG is, UIWG. Arnie's co-pilot is one of Buffalo's young guns, Justin Simley. Well, there had been so much talk and pre-planning, it was nice to just get the job started and get going. Crewing the second plane are Dave Poole and George Fury. Red your radio, it's uh, Buffalo Tanker 298. Two experienced pilots hired especially for this job. I don't think there could be a better crew assembled. I take a commitment to, to move these airplanes uh, halfway across the world, and, and they step up to the plate to get it done and get it done right. Uh, Tower, Tower 299 plus one, clear for takeoff. Tiger 299, clear for takeoff. Tower's coming up. Hey, fire's gone up, there's 30 inches. Hey, and we're rolling. Good to go. Zero. Their first stopover is in Winnipeg, Manitoba, 1,200 kilometers away, a six-hour flight. These low-flying, slow-flying planes are built for the heat of summer, not winter cold, and they'll need clear skies all the way. Tiger 299, uh, maintain 9,500 VFR. VFR, summertime airplane, is what we're dealing with here. VFR, visual flight rules. To fly this plane, they have to see where they're going. When you're going in a VFR airplane, it has no de-icing equipment. It has big fat wings that lights up. And so it's not just a walk in the park. It's a very dangerous trip. And to top it off, these 215s can only fly 600 kilometers before refueling. Each leg of the journey across Canada and the Atlantic crossing is at least double that. Mechanic Corey Dodd and his team installed four 500-gallon fuel bladders to extend the range of each plane. Now, it's time to test the new system. The 
extra fuel must flow from the bladders up to the main tanks in the wings. I'd like to get all the testing done before we cross the ocean. Make sure it all works. It's alive! <laughs> Good Bye there, George. Just checking to see you're still by. We transferred a uh, thousand pounds of fuel. Yeah, we're doing the same process now. We've got uh, we got the uh, left tank up to 3,000 pounds. We're just working on the right tank now. That's a lot easier than landing. Yeah, yeah. After a six-hour flight, the 215s touch down in Winnipeg. For nearly six months, Jeremy Dow has been paying his dues working long hours as a ramp hand in Hay River. His goal is to become the next Buffalo co-pilot. It's freaking loud, first of all. Second of all, it's been a long ass day. Usually for uh, getting into the co-pilot seat next is all based on when you arrived. They quoted me seven months from the day I started to when I start flying. And I now realize that might have been just a good way to get me on. Jeremy's been at Buffalo almost six months, but the boss says it's not just about seniority. Yes, I have a, a loyalty to look at his length of service. But just because his number's up doesn't mean he moves. So I have to look at what he is given in to see what he gets back. Right now, the rampy who Joe feels has given the most is Audrey Marchand. <laughs> Only a few months into her training at Buffalo, Audrey has impressed Joe with her keen attitude and hustle. I want to be in the cockpit because I deserve to be there. There's Audrey getting another flight. A girl with the same credentials as the next guy in line may get a boost up just because she's a girl. Sometimes you have to take advantage of what you got. <sighs> and what Jeremy's got, all 245 pounds of it, has gotten him nowhere. Now, he has even more competition. Buffalo's newest rampy is Wilf Dark. As far as rampies goes, I'm probably a little overqualified, but uh, as far as big planes go, I've got n no knowledge, so I'm really in the same boat as everyone else on the ramp. And he's willing to work the ramp without complaining, even though he's got the most flying hours of any rampy. There's no such thing as a little ice or frost, and they, they're pretty serious about getting it all off. There's just not a lot of excuse to have any on, so. They preach the word of God with boldness. A devout Christian, Wilf got his pilot's license at Bible college. Since moving to Yellowknife, he's joined a local church, and he's determined to find his place at Buffalo, too. I have faith that it'll all work itself out. I'm not worried. But Jeremy is getting impatient. Can I get on? Yeah, I guess so. Just this time. I've been here five months working the ramp and courier. I'm next in line for an airplane. Oh, I'm gonna catch hell. But if his bitter attitude doesn't improve, he may see Wilf move ahead of him in the pecking order just like Audrey did. It's the people that have a, an entitlement to being a pilot that hold themselves back. And you care less and less every day. <laughs> Basically, do your job. You're a good rampy. If you do anything that's not your job, or bitch, you're a bad rampy. And now, there's trouble brewing at Buffalo HQ. Joe's just received disturbing news. No, this is a notice of suspension for your flight. If you do nothing on that date, your license is suspended. Before that date. Yeah. And they can't hold it over your head, to, like a gun to your head, saying, oh, your 30 days up. Government regulators want to shut down Joe's pride and joy. 
the daily passenger service known as the Sked. The Sked runs from Hay River to Yellowknife in the morning and returns in the evening. For the past 27 years, Buffalo Joe has flown a 1940s DC-3 there and back every day. It's the flagship of Buffalo Airways. We have today two windows exit on the right. Federal regulations dictate that Buffalo has a qualified flight attendant manager on staff to supervise and train flight attendants for the SCED. But they've been operating without that manager for nearly a month. They said because we uh, fired our flight attendant manager in January on very short notice that we're author of our own problem. Joe's taking the notice of suspension personally. And I'm not going to forget it. And I'm not going to let them get away with it. So they better fire a really, really good bullet. Because if they miss, I'll turn that bullet around and fire right back at them. His first move is to find someone at Buffalo who can train fast to be the new flight attendant manager and pass the qualifying exam. Hey, Dan. Can you see you for a minute? Weighing the odds, Joe chooses co-pilot Dan Catoni. Dan used to be a high school teacher. You know how to write an exam in mid right? Yeah, because it's an open book, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So. I think we printed up 2,000 pages. Of course, there's no way to learn all this stuff. So what I've been doing is tagging and flagging everything so I can quickly lo uh, look up the required information. If I don't pass this exam, then the scheduled passenger service between Hay River and Yellowknife will be put on hold. So there's lots of pressure on this. The future of Buffalo's flagship passenger run is resting on Dan's shoulders. Coming up, Dan takes the exam, but the outcome isn't looking good. I'm totally in the dark. I don't know. I, I might have passed or I might have failed. In Winnipeg, Buffalo's water bomber crew prepares to depart on the next leg of their cross Canada journey. This is the most important part of the trip, lunch. We're ready for Montreal now. Let's do it. After a night in the Winnipeg hangar, the plane engines are warmed and ready to go. And the weather conditions are perfect. But they have to leave early, or else they'll reach Montreal after nightfall. Uh, I mean, the concern with flying those airplanes uh, at night, uh, in the dark, is that uh, you can't see the ice build up on your wings. The airplane's not equipped for icing, so that's the biggest concern. Icing, a serious problem for the CL-215, which is not intended for winter travel. It's designed to be a water bomber that's operated in the summer. Icing reduces the wing's ability to create lift, and without de-icing equipment, a buildup of ice on the wings of the 215s could be deadly. Uh, tower confirmed, 299 plus one's cleared for takeoff. Tiger, 299, clear takeoff, 31 right, turn out. 15 2. Ben, Tiger to 91. Take your ground, Ben, please. 2, 2, 2, 5 to 8, gear up. The two water bombers take off on the 14-hour flight to Montreal, 1,800 kilometers away, their longest stretch over land. Check 298. I wonder if I could get their forecast, please, for the rest of the day. Over the Great Lakes, they can't get high enough to fly over the clouds. Sure enough, they encounter icing. The pilot's only option is to fly around the clouds. Picking up a little ice. Toronto Center, it's Tiger 298, 55 miles out of North Bay. But rerouting could ruin their plan to reach Montreal before dark. Back in Yellowknife, government regulators want to close down Buffalo's flagship run called the Sked because there's no longer a flight attendant manager on staff. A regulatory requirement. Okay. Now go inside and hide for a bit. And that also means there's no one to teach the flight attendant course Jeremy Dow was counting on taking. Flight attending is sort of the intermediate step between rampy and uh, pilot. 
but Jeremy works at the Hay River Hangar. To take the course at company headquarters in Yellowknife, he needs to train his replacement. So he's recruited his good friend from flight school, Ramon Stravastava. He's uh, very intelligent. He's got a, at least one master's degree under his belt. But up here in the north, he's only got below zero degrees to contend with. Not the kind he's used to back in his home in India. Probably like, you know, two days, three days, you take time to get used to of this kind of weather. But after some time, yeah, you'll rock on it, for sure. A new challenging task, enjoying it. I'm getting paid just to do some manual labor, which is like <laughs> creating extra muscles, yeah. But Ramon isn't quite the human forklift that Jeremy is. The people are doing here, they are also human beings, right? Like me. They might be a little stronger than me, body-wise, but same kind of built and everything, so why can't I? But a positive attitude isn't enough to slog around hundreds of pounds of cargo and equipment all day. He's growing some muscles, but he's still, yeah, he's struggling a bit with the, uh, with the physical aspect of it. But today, the physical aspect of rampy work has taken its toll on Ramon. I'm not feeling too good. My back is hurting. That's the first time when I'm taking my off, actually, day off. I'm not feeling good, actually. I can definitely see where this kind of work would be easier for me than Ramon, because a couple of these pieces weigh about as much as he does. This one's all right. If Ramon stays uh, bedridden and I have to cover for him, that means I'm stuck down in Hay River when potentially the flight attending course is going on, meaning other people are getting trained as flight attendants, and I'm staying down here getting screwed royally. Like, really, really boned. Back in Yellowknife, Joe is feeling the same way. All the regulatory forces that you deal with, they make it miserable for you. They make it miserable enough that you wonder why you do it. But you can't cave in to them and, and be of a disservice to your communities. Joe's counting on Dan Catoni acing the flight attendant manager exam. Poor Dan Catoni, my heart goes out to him. He's sitting in there studying his ass off. Dan takes the written test and is grilled by Transport Canada in the interview. But even with all of his cramming, he's not feeling confident. I'm totally in the dark, I don't know. I, I might have passed or I might have failed, I don't know. Meanwhile, on their way from Winnipeg to Montreal, Arnie, Justin, and the rest of the crew are running late. They've had to divert their two water bombers over the Great Lakes to avoid clouds and icing. Now, 100 kilometers from Montreal, they're flying in the dark in VFR aircraft. There's no radar on board. They have to rely on what they can see out the cockpit window. All they have is a compass and GPS. Finally, they spot lights in the distance. Looks like a big city. Montreal arrival, it's uh, Tanker 298. Montreal Center, Roger. Now they have to pick out the runway from the spectacular nighttime view of Montreal. I got it. Field in sight, you got it? I got the right one. Okay. One over here, yeah, close just a little bit. I'll pick the little glider. All right, here's down, pre landing that was blocks just dead. Water bombers touch down after a long day's flight. But on the ground, a nasty surprise. You can't get two airplanes in here, and there's no use freezing one up. That's stupid. You gotta have enough room for two airplanes. Put one in, hold it nose that way, and put this one tail in this way. No.
But when push comes to shove, both 215s fit. With the night in the warm hangar, the planes should be ready in the morning for the final leg of their cross-Canada journey. Coming up, while the crew sleeps, the water bombers get the bums rush. Oh, Christ, she's all full of snow too, then, eh? Morning in Montreal. Hello. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader gets an alarming call from mechanic Corey Dodd at the airport. Oh, Christ, she's all full of snow too, then, eh? Last night, they tucked the two CL-215 water bombers away in a hangar. But sometime overnight, the planes were dragged out into the cold to make room for another aircraft. We're renting hangar space and we're buying copious amounts of fuel from these guys and they, they push our airplanes out into the snowbank to freeze up. And that's about the worst customer service you can have. So we've got frozen airplanes covered in ice we can't take off. These airplanes are not designed to be parked in the, those type, type of temperatures. You have to get them in a hangar to make them operate properly. So we push the airplanes back in the hangar, thaw them out, uh, get them ready to go. Before starting up the 215s, engine oil temperatures have to be above freezing. If not, the engine cylinders could crack. That's why they're supposed to stay in the hangar overnight. After hours in the hangar, the 215s are finally warmed up enough to fly. Clear skies over Montreal look promising, but the weather en route is not so sunny. So we're just gonna have this little crap in here, eh? It's we'll end up flying track. most of this trip at the night and we can't see with the weather ahead of us. Night flights in VFR planes are a huge risk. It's starting so late, that's why I didn't want to do this at all in, at night. Yeah. So what do you think? Well, I'll give it a whirl. What the hell? We'll go, we'll go down God that hates far. the coward. And if it, if it looks like it's going to... Gonna With the delivery of the water bombers to Turkey already jeopardized by delays, Arnie's ready to go. But then George Fury calls for a pilot's report from St. John's. Actually, I'm leaving uh, Montreal very shortly in a CL-215. We're, uh, we're concerned about some tops around Deer Lake area. Either way, it's Weather conditions way. along the route aren't looking good. So light snow showers? You gonna stay like that all evening, or? Okay, thanks. Taps 13,000 feet, light ice. And the clouds near St. John's are too high to fly over. It's not much sense. And if we're stuck in it for any amount of time, we're just gonna build up Halifax right here. Our concern with going at night into possible icing conditions was that we, we wouldn't be aware of it until it was too late. Their only alternative is to stay put in Montreal. So we've got Nolan Air for sure, it's no problem. Can you Justin finds their planes a new hangar at another local airport so they don't get bumped out into the cold again. Now we're just going over to Mirabeau. We've got a good hangar over there. They're not going to kick us out in the middle of the night, let our airplanes freeze up on us. Things have gotten complicated today. Back in Yellowknife. Joe here. Joe gets Dan's exam results for the vacant flight attendant manager position. Yeah. Okay. Dan passed the written test, but he failed the interview. The sked is shut down. Huge deal. Since 1982, we've been flying this thing. It's like 27 years. We don't have a flight attending manager, therefore, we can't have flight attendants. Therefore, we can't run an aircraft that's capable of carrying over 19 passengers, which is our DC 3s. The next day in Hay River, Buffalo Joe comes up with a temporary solution to keep the sked running. He's leased a twin Otter, a small plane that can seat up to 18, and hired a pilot to transport his passengers. But it means spending $4,000 per trip. Joe still insists on flying the DC-3, but he can only carry freight, which the smaller twin Otter has no room for. 
Joe loves passengers, makes them happy every day, so I don't know how, uh, how happy he must be right now running the freighter. First time in 30 years I couldn't bring those same people. Now those people I fly back and forth are second and third generation passengers for me. Watch your head, sir. And they just couldn't understand why I couldn't fly them. As Joe taxis towards the runway in the DC-3, his passengers follow behind in the Twin Otter. Well, that's what you get when you get uh, bureaucratic government against private enterprise. Adding insult to injury, Joe is greeted by a Transport Canada inspector when he lands in Yellowknife. He's ramp checking Joe to make sure the DC-3 isn't carrying any passengers. Oh, you're checking me. No, I'm just here to uh, observe and uh, admire the DC-3 aircraft. Of course I don't have any people on the airplane. I'm flying a freighter. Eh? There isn't even seats in that airplane, but they got to come out and verify that I'm, because they expect me to lie. Joe is playing by the rules. His passengers are all on board the Twin Otter that's just arrived. With Transport Canada breathing down his neck, Joe needs Dan Catoni to give the flight attendant manager interview another try. I hope it do better this time, second time around. Buffalo's flight operations manager, Mike Hanley, helps him prepare. These interviews are very persuasive where you have a fear of what you're gonna say, and I bet you that's what happened with you too, is you almost stunted yourself sometimes on saying something, oh, oh yeah. thinking I'm saying and, the wrong thing. And there are things in there like he, Joe wants to make sure like Dan he, gets all the help he needs to pass the interview. The process. There's no way that I, I said, yes, I do see them every day, we yeah. can talk, but the amendments are, are written. This will be Dan's last chance. If he fails again, Buffalo's daily passenger service will be history. The end of another day of turmoil at Buffalo Airways. With no daily passenger service, Jeremy Dow's ambitions of moving off the ramp and into flight attendant training have been stymied. But the SCED suspension may be a blessing in disguise. It could give Rampy Ramon's ailing back a chance to heal. Hey buddy, what's up? Feeling better? Feeling a little bit better? It's okay. It's okay? Joe wanted me to tell you that he would like you to stay here, still getting paid, just taking time off. He really appreciates the work you've been doing. He knows you've been working your ass off. I'm not gonna take free money. Definitely, if I'll stay here, definitely I will do something. But you hurt yourself on the company time, though. The company wants to be reimbursing you for it. Even if you are laid up for a couple weeks, they're still happy as hell with you, you know? You know, you're being supported through all this and yeah, definitely, I'll take some time to think about it, for sure. Jeremy needs Ramon to get well and get back to work so he can take over for Jeremy in Hay River. I got very good feedback from Jeremy, and he's really concerning about my injuries and everything. But Ramon is getting pressure from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How's everybody out there? I talk to my family members, actually. Even my fiance. she's saying, come back. I don't know. No, no, I'm totally confused, totally confused what to do now. The next day, Dan Catoni returns from his second try at the flight attendant manager interview. Hey, hey, Dan. Yeah. How's it going? Well, congratulations. Uh, thanks. Nice, everything? It's about time, eh? Oh, yeah, so this is a brand new day now, right? right? Yeah. Dan passed with flying colors. Which means that everything goes back to normal instantly. The sked is back in business. What's it feel like having your sked back? Well, oh, good, good, good. It feels good like finding your pants after a long night. Okay. Joe's DC-3 can carry passengers again, and Dan Catoni can begin training rampies as flight attendants. Audrey Marchand is already in the course. 
But who else? For Jeremy Dow, the answer is obvious. I meant to be at the controls of an airplane, not a driving courier van. But Jeremy's not going anywhere unless his buddy Ramon recovers from his back injury and decides to stick around. I came here for the x-rays and everything. At the hospital in Hay River, Ramon braces himself for the worst. This is your spine. These are the bones, the vertebrae. Uh -huh. And they all look completely normal. There's nothing crushed okay. and nothing out of line. And I don't see that it's bent or broken in any way. Uh -huh. So the main thing I would say is to avoid heavy lifting. For how long? Uh, another week. Another week? Yeah. But this is good news. That's great. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, that's good words. I'm happy. Happy, nothing major. Nothing major. No? What's the news? Nothing major. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, man. Excellent. Thanks. Feeling happy, man. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Happy. Oh, yeah. Got your place back in the company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> know what everybody I thinks of you now? Survive. So that's what I gotta do. I gotta get hurt so people appreciate me, too. <laughs> His spirits lifted, but ignoring doctor's orders to lay off the lifting, Ramon is a rampy again. Ramon's return is in the nick of time. The flight attendant training course begins next week in Yellowknife, and Jeremy wants to be there. I came back, man. You should appreciate it. I appreciate it very much, and I just feel like having fun with you now. <laughs> In Montreal, the weather isn't looking good for the water bomber crews. Well, here we are in Montreal. We got a, just a wicked snowstorm that's blowing through here, and it's going to hit uh, Newfoundland. So I think we're probably going to be here for a couple of days. Since they're snowed in, Justin, Arnie, and the rest of the crew decide to do a little shopping. What do you think? Come on, you guys. Then acclimatize their northern bodies to Mediterranean temperatures. We're just warming up from the yellow night winter. The life of an engineer. You know, waiting for weather is always a tough part of the job, but uh, you get in a nice hotel, uh, you know, you can relax, and uh, we'll get to St. John's soon enough. Across the country in Yellowknife, the sked is back up and running. But there's a new problem. An urgent piece of cargo is too big to fit on the sked flight to Hay River. It's going to have to be a rush delivery by truck. Buffalo's newest rampy, Wilf Dar, steps up to meet the challenge. Is there a deadline, Mike? Oh. Wilf just got promoted to first officer, cube van. Captain, cube van. With a five hour drive ahead of him, Wilf has no time to spare if he's going to meet Joe's evening sked flight carrying the rest of the cargo. The uh, road's been covered a bit with snow and ice and felt the wheels slip a little. Wilf has to take the long way around Great Slave Lake, almost 500 kilometers. Joe's sked will fly 200 kilometers straight across. In Yellowknife, the DC-3 is fueled and made ready for the evening flight to Hay River. 300 kilometers away in Fort Providence, Wilf is fueling up as well. Apparently the truck doesn't have the range that we thought it did. Thank you. A necessary stop, but this delay could cost Wilf valuable time to meet the sked in Hay River. As Joe lifts the DC-3 into the evening sky, Captain Cube Van hits the ice road, a 24-kilometer drive down the Mackenzie River. We are now about an hour and a half out of Hay River. We'll get there when we get there. I'm not gonna, not gonna kill myself for a load. But if he can meet his deadline in Hay River, Wilf knows it could help push him to the head of the Rampy Pack. There's definitely some competition. Most of these pilots have uh, dreamed of flying airplanes since they were young. Joe's DC-3 arrives in Hay River. Jeremy and Ramon are on the ramp to meet the flight. 
but still no sign of Wilf. If he's going to be a hero, he'd better step on it. As all the cargo was unloaded from the plane, Wilf arrives. Well, Wolf stepped it up, put a little extra coals to the fire, got the thing there on time, and, and he got an attaboy out of the whole thing, and which is he did, he really deserved it. And everybody's happy. And everything else could be somebody else's problem. It can be or is. <laughs> Wolf made his deadline, and Buffalo Joe is impressed. The job was to deliver the freight, and he did a good job of delivering it on time, so customers happy. Thank you. Another new rampy is out Sean Jeremy this time on his home turf in Hay River. Later that night, it gets worse. What's that? When? Ramon's parents delivered tragic news about a close friend. When I uh, about to go for the sleep, I heard that news, yeah, he committed a suicide. This news could change everything for Ramon and Jeremy. Girlfriend and parents want me to come back. So I made a decision now. Can't compromise with this now. It's bad news all around. Rampy Ramon Srivastava received a call from India. A close friend has died, and Ramon's family wants him to return. He makes a tough decision. After three months in the north, Rahman's giving up on Buffalo and going home. My dream was always to become a pilot. That was my childhood dream. It's like watch, Joe gave it to me, this watch. That is the best souvenir I got it ever in my life, actually. I appreciate this thing. Coworker Jeremy Dow is stunned. I wasn't expecting Rahman to say he was quitting. It's kind of crappy. Like, Jeremy, uh, I'm gonna miss him. Like, he was all the time guiding me, man. You know, you have to prove yourself. Uh, I'm gonna miss everything, every single thing, you know? Today is a really shitty day. Today, Ramon quit. Today, I'm screwed. And I can't find my boss. I get to do his, do his duties, do his tasks until, uh, until they can find somebody to replace me, or until I get frustrated enough being here to quit. In Yellowknife, Mikey has a job vacancy to fill. So basically what you're telling me is we need someone to replace Ramon, we need him now. Buffalo co-pilot Scott Blue has been helping Mikey recruit rampies. He also weighs in on which rampy gets into the flight attendant course. I believe if, if Wolf is harder working, and is himself a better position than Jeremy, I believe that Wolf should have the shot of getting into the airplane. Maybe Wolf's fresh, keen, ready to go, boom, boom, boom. Jeremy's been a little bit more worn down by, you know, the monotony of the job, repetition, long hours, all that crap. And I think it's only fair to give Jeremy a crack. You can't take away from the fact that you got, you know, months of work, you know, out of Jeremy. Yeah, you have to leave Jeremy out of the first flight attendant course and maybe stagger him somewhere else. But is that going to piss Jeremy off? Because he's been here longer than the other two? That's going to yeah, drag yeah. his gear something fierce, man. Mikey knows it may not be a popular decision. But without Ramon to replace him on the ramp, Jeremy can't move into the flight attendant course. Audrey's already been told she's in. <laughs> and now, Wilf will jump ahead of Jeremy, too. Wilf, he was a skydive pilot for the last two summers, I believe. He's got about 750 hours under his belt. A lot more experience uh, real world flying than I have or that any of the other rampies have, actually. Ah, it bugs me a little bit that Audrey and Wilf are going to get the, the nod before me, you know? But uh, I keep telling myself, suck it up, buttercup, I'll be fine. That works usually. Because that's usually what I tell other people. Jeremy sucks it up. Ramon is all packed and ready to go. He's heading home to India. 
At the Buffalo cargo terminal in Yellowknife, Kelly Jurasevic and Janelle Glenn aren't surprised he's leaving. Well, when he started here, he was he couldn't pick up anything. I think he blew a nut the first day <laughs> when he picked up that crate in the front office, man. It, holy, remember that? Yeah, well, I was it on was the DC hilarious. with him and Ian, and, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, he, I threw him a box, and he's, he kind of screamed. <laughs> yeah. He was freezing his ass off. It was too cold. So we kind of had a thing going that we knew he wasn't going to last. So we should have, you know, had a pool on this, and I should have won. <laughs> yeah. No sympathy for Ramon in the cargo terminal, but Buffalo Joe appreciates his effort. He did very well under the circumstances he's working under. From lions and tigers one week to polar bears and caribou the next wasn't bad. Joe was awesome. Like, he built himself. He built his name. Joe's used to the high turnover in the rampy ranks. I just want to say thanks to you for everything, Joe. Let me know. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's always a Ramon coming. Always one leaving. Sometimes the same one comes back for another try at it. It was really nice to be with you. Really nice. It's my pleasure, sir. I'm leaving so many good people. And then, one final you goodbye. Know? All the best, buddy. Jeremy's not only losing his friend. See you later. See you, man. See good you. Travels. Thanks. He's losing his ticket out of Hay River as well. Nothing, nothing better than this. Nothing better than this. Certainly imperfect. I wasn't expecting him to leave so quickly. They waited days for flying conditions to improve. Now, Buffalo's water bomber crew must make a hasty exit out of Montreal. They're on the final leg of their cross-Canada journey to St. John's, Newfoundland, before heading on to their ultimate destination, Turkey. It looks good. We've got a window of opportunity today to, to head out. Well, that one was sitting offshore there, I guess. There's one. Okay, so there it is. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's this morning at 7 o'clock. But a major winter storm is approaching St. John's, so there's no time to waste. Thank you, check. Uh, we're good to go. Hey, Let's just follow this one up. Tiger 299, ready for takeoff? Yeah, we're ready to go. Let's go. Okay, let's rock and roll. Speed 2, 5, 3, gear up. Here's the track. Water bombers must get there before the storm hits, or these summer planes will be caked in ice before they reach their destination. No real concerns yet, but as you know, that weather in Newfoundland is awful fast. So. Montreal to St. John's is a 1,600 kilometer flight. The pilots are hoping the clear skies last. That's good. So that's the Gulf of St. Lawrence, man. That water looks cold, eh? But as they cross the Gulf of St. Lawrence, they can see the storm approaching. Just uh, check the weather. Uh, of course, St. John's is still the same. It's uh, showing 2200 overcast here. Okay, thanks, George. The water bombers are traveling at 200 kilometers per hour, and they still have a few more hours in the air. Minus one. Now, it's a race against Mother Nature. They finally reach the edge of the continent. Nice way today. Yeah. They beat the storm to St. John's but just barely. We played it exactly perfect. <laughs> Holy smokes, did we ever, man. That's a, almost a hurricane out there. It's pretty windy. The crew and the planes made it across the country safely. 
but crossing the treacherous North Atlantic will be an even greater challenge. On the next episode of Ice Pilots and WT, the water bomber pilots prepare for the worst over the North Atlantic. Ditching, ditching, ditching. When tragedy strikes just offshore. So far, finding only one survivor. The North Atlantic is nothing to play with. AJ finally takes the plunge. And engineers prepare an Electra for its maiden mission. Why didn't we check all this sucking stuff before we went out of the hangar? Overpaid prima donnas. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, the water bomber pilots prepare for the worst over the Atlantic. The groom to be prepares for the big day. And engineers prepare an Electra for its maiden mission. Why didn't we check all this sucking stuff before we went out of the hangar? Overpaid prima donnas. As February turns to March, things are heating up at Buffalo Airways. The CL215 water bombers made it across the frozen Canadian landscape en route to Turkey in one piece. They tested their auxiliary fuel supply on the way to Winnipeg, got kicked out of the hangar in Montreal in the middle of the night, and raced a winter storm to St. John's, Newfoundland. We played it exactly perfect. Holy smokes, did we ever, man. That's a, almost a hurricane out there. Well, that must be that offshore survival. Now, Buffalo Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader, his co-pilot Justin Simley, and two hired guns, George Fury and Dave Poole, are taking part in a survival training course in case they have to ditch in the ocean. I mean, we all know that North Atlantic's not a very friendly environment, and especially in the winter. It's a 2,200 kilometer crossing over deadly cold waters in short haul water bombers meant to fly in the summer. Nobody traditionally crosses the North Atlantic with these types of airplanes that time of year. It's a dangerous mission. Today's training could save their lives. You'd be an idiot to not know what could happen before you take that trip. It's like a big problem. Let's call a full body job. <laughs> it's a son of a bitch trying to get those things on. They're so tight, eh, that they cut off your circulation. But I guess you keep the water out of, you know, the suit, so. If they have to ditch into the frigid ocean, these high-tech survival suits could keep them alive for up to 24 hours. The hood was worst once you put the, the hood on. Uh, chin strap kind of goes over, and that's bordering on painful. They had to make sure your sleeves were watertight. You had to make sure that it went up around your chin and around your neck and was totally waterproof. Now I'm ready to rock. <laughs> You've got uh, a body line right here on your suit. Yeah. You choke it onto your buddy's arm here, right? Kind of thing. I'll keep you together. Arnie, Justin, and the rest of the crew must wear these bulky suits for the entire nine and a half hour trip across the ocean. They'll keep the survival suits dry for now and train in neoprene wetsuits in the pool. No, we're not going to the moon. We're just going swimming. The mood is light. Because once, once the do is... But the underlying message isn't. We teach people stuff that uh, we hope they never had to use. We were taught how to maneuver, how to do certain positions, how to do the buddy system, how to uh, connect with a number of people. Okay, we're ready to rock. Okay, I want you to swim over to the side of the pool. So I'm okay, two arms. Two arms. Then it's into the simulator for a crash landing. Okay. You want to let your crew know we're going to hit the drink. We're going to hit the water. So. Ditching, ditching, ditching. Prepare to ditch. Ditching, ditching. Uh, brace for impact, boys. We're going down about a minute before we hit the water. You've got to make sure your 
your line, which is tethered to the aircraft, is cut. You need a knife too, eh? Because if the airplane you're in sinks and takes the draft with it, it's, it's going to be completely useless. You get spraying me with that hose. How do you like the Atlantic? That's a good point. I just give them an incentive to uh, put up the canopy. Time is critical when you're in cold water. It made us get the canopy up on the raft a lot quicker. It was really good, actually. I'm glad we did it. Learning how to survive ditching into the ocean is crucial. This is going to real, really suck in the Atlantic. You sure wouldn't want to be out there doing that stuff in 40-foot uh, in swells, that's for sure. Back at the hangar, the engineers on the crew, led by Corey Dodd, are doing maintenance on the two water bombers. Their number one engine on TXB had a massive oil leak because they needed a cylinder change. And our compass system was f***ed. They need the engines and the compasses to be working right before they attempt the North Atlantic crossing. We can test it right on the ground. So it's doing the same problem it was doing in the air, it's doing it on the ground, so it'll be easy to fix. You can't blast off for 1,400 miles with a compass system and an engine that's going to fail, right? So the engineers work on getting the planes ready and pray they won't need the emergency training they missed out on. Buffalo Joe sold the water bombers to Turkey for $7 million, a huge boon to Buffalo during a recession year. And Joe has two Ida Lockheed Electras that he'd like to see earning their keep, too. Powerful and fast, the turboprop Electra is the most advanced airplane in the fleet. People say, you know, you've been in piston pounders all your life and you've never had a turboprop and you don't know anything about turbines. That's sort of a myth that's around Buffalo, but we have had probably more experience with uh, the turbine engine than a lot of people. Joe bought this pair of 1959 Electras for millions of dollars a few years back. Once we get north of the Arctic coast, we're running out of fuel. If fuel wasn't like it was a few years ago, an uh, ongoing supply of, of avgas for piston pounding and airplanes, no, there'd be no Electra here. But Joe has only used one of his Electras a few times. And the second Electra has sat completely idle. Now, there's a fuel haul contract at Baker Lake and none of it, and Joe wants to press an Electra into service. Every aircraft that flies the north has the capacity to haul fuel. The man Joe is put in charge of getting the Electra flight ready is engineer Chuck Adams. Chuck's worked on all these different aircrafts, and uh, he, he understands Electra very, very well. Joe says I'm in charge of the Electra program, but he never told me what the program was. I still don't know what program is. All I know is I'm in charge. Chuck's task is to prep the Electra that's been sitting idle for the Baker Lake fuel haul. How much fuel can we carry in? Well, I haven't got that, but I'm trying to make, you know, trying to get the loads in there without breaking the floor. Ray Weber is one of the Electra captains, so and it's the pilot's job to calculate the plane's load. The airplane's got to be within the bounds of weight and balance, because if it's out of its weight and balance envelope, it could be uncontrollable in some flight regime. Okay, so how much can we... I need that number. I need that freaking magic number to take that. To the math is complicated, but the principle is simple. I want to be able to lift that nose when it's supposed to lift and kind of lift the way it's supposed to lift. We want to go in up there and turn it upside down. Chuck needs Ray's weight calculations to begin prepping the plane. Can't deal with test pilots, man. The Electra must deliver fuel to Baker Lake in less than a week, and that puts Chuck on a tight schedule. Did everybody quit? Did you see that blonde kid? What's his name? Rob Despins has been apprenticing with Chuck for several months, but Chuck has yet to learn his name. So he improvises. Where's Knob? I haven't seen him for a while. There's that little dog. Don't you be making a career of this. Every time I gotta look for something, I gotta find you. Before installing the fuel tanks in the Electra, all the extra parts that have been stripped out of the cargo hold need to be tracked and weighed. That ball mask gotta be weighed? Okay. That shit's all, all gonna stuff. be weight. All this has to be weight. All this here, this has to be weight. I don't know what the this crap is. This has got to be weight too. I think we would have better success of building a spaceship and going to Mars. Let's do it. Shut yeah, up. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in Newfoundland, Justin, Arnie, and the crew are doing some calculating themselves. 
Well, this is our weather package. Uh, it's got all our North Atlantic charts, all our Canadian charts. The 2200 kilometer flight to the Azores Islands on the other side of the Atlantic should take about nine and a half hours. Our departure time was slated for about five in the morning so we could make the Azores before dark. So we're out of it. Well, not too many miles, eh? Pretty well. But the pilots need three elements to come together before they can take off on this dangerous flight. Relatively clear skies, temperatures above the freezing point, and a tailwind. The winds are right. From their hotel room in St. John's, they check in with the region's weather office on the phone. We have no de-icing equipment. Oh, OK, so that's your big concern here is no, no de-icing in the aircraft. Correct, yeah. Okay. Most commercial aircraft have electric de-icing capability in the wings. Smaller planes have de-icing boots, a rubber membrane that covers the leading edge of the wings and expands to crack the ice that forms on them. The CL-215 water bombers just aren't equipped to fly in winter. If they ice up, they may plunge into the ocean. Well, everybody's nervous, I think, about that North Atlantic and airplanes that are not designed to cross oceans. Eh? They need a detailed weather forecast and need to pray it's right. For the majority of that trip, you're going to uh, be in the clear conditions. 21 to 06, and they're still forecasting cross temperatures right up to 9,000 feet. That deck of cloud that you see there, right? If you go out, you stay below 9, there you go, no icing. Clear conditions and temperatures above freezing, but the wind has to be just right. You know, you're looking at 60 west. Uh, 50 north. Looks like there are headwinds to fight, which would suck up precious fuel. No, so we'll be doing 130 knots whole way. That's going to bring it up to 10 hours. And then once we hit 40 degrees west, which isn't quite halfway, we're looking at 10 knots on the nose. We can't go in that. You know, we'll run out of fuel. Yeah, can't just pull into the nearest gas station. This is where the wind changes on us and goes to a headwind. We're just yeah, going to have can. to wait for a tailwind. The water bombers are expected to arrive in Turkey in a matter of days. But if the weather over the North Atlantic doesn't change, that deadline will not be met. Still to come, a catastrophe off the coast of Newfoundland. The May Day call came just minutes after the pilot attempted a return to their St. John's base. All the weight calculations are done. At least that's what engineer Chuck Adams believes. Calling, calling. Okay, backing up just a hair. Now he's installing three massive tanks in the Electra to haul fuel to Baker Lake. We put them in to see how they fit and get everything all arranged for the way we do, do this fuel haul. They stay in the airplane, we haul the fuel in these tanks. While Buffalo's vintage DC-3s, DC-4s, and C-46s are 65 years old, the Electra is a mere 50. Early in November 1957, the first Electra emerged from the production line. Each one of its Allison prop jet engines packs 3,750 horsepower. This engine's at 100% power all the time. They are jet engines, they, they just have propellers hooked on the front of them, so there's really no difference between flying the Electra and a jet. In fact, the Electra with its four turboprop engines was the stepping stone between the propeller era and the jet age. It made a big splash when it was unveiled. Several U.S. airlines ordered the planes, but then things started going very wrong. They've been a controversial airplane since the day they came out. The outboard engines, they didn't have enough structure in them, and if they got in bad weather, they'd start doodling the whirling, going like this, oscillating, the whole engine, and they'd rip the wing off. There were some tragic crashes, and the Electra was recalled. By the time the engine mount problem was fixed, jet airliners had taken over. The Electra became outdated before it ever really took off, and production was stopped. Only a few of the planes remain in service today. They fly well, they're good in this area, and it's versatile. Versatility is the most important. 
And with Avgas, the fuel used for Buffalo's piston-driven planes getting scarce, the Electra, powered by jet fuel, will keep Buffalo flying. We can go into northern Nunavut or into the Arctic with a little less uh, work. The airplane can refuel at most of the bases. But Joe has been a reluctant convert. Why is it so expensive? Because it's a very expensive airplane to maintain. Every hour, 5,000 pounds of fuel is done on those exhaust pipes. Joe's been resistant, basically because he has a love for piston engine aircraft. Joe may love his older planes, but he's got to start using the Electris. You get a big, expensive airplane, and it's got to work. It can't be sitting on the ground. There. Push. OK. There's a lot of fuel hauling goes on in the north. Right. And we just we want to get on the market. The three fuel tanks are installed in the Electra. Now Chuck has to get both pilots to approve the rigging. My biggest concern is not having them drift back on takeoff or anything. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's for deceleration. We've got we to make <coughs> sure that they don't, they don't move forward. Brian's focus is on tying the tanks down securely, but Ray is still preoccupied with weight. A 4x4x16, four by four by if I remember rightly, was 48 pounds. So you got 490 pounds of tank, virtually 100 pounds of 4x4 four four underneath it, and you know, another 5 or 10 pounds for straps. Ray still doesn't have it all figured out, so the Electra pilots put their heads together to crunch the numbers. Our, our, that's a revamp of the numbers. Frustrated that the weight issue hasn't been resolved yet, Chuck takes a hike. I'm out of here, brother. Quit. Across town, Mikey McBrien is on a mission, and it's brought him to a place he rarely visits. Yeah, I don't really like grocery shopping too much. Uh... Was it 17 bucks or 16 bucks? I'll see if I can make it for cheaper than that. We'll see. Mikey has never baked anything, but it's Joe's 65th birthday, and Mikey wants to do something special for his father. Uh, usually I forget the old man's uh, birthday, so this year I'm going to go ahead and try to make him a cake. I got to figure out what a cake looks like. I think this might be. Mikey's job at Buffalo requires a lot of problem solving under pressure. Uh, we're in the crackers aisle, yes, and meat. But this is different. This is kind of cake stuff. I'm, it must be pretty close. 12, three, are these three liter? It's a inches. What if I'm cooking that? There's a lot of different types of pans out there. I thought like a cake pan, it would say cake pan on it. There was stuff that looked like donuts. There's corn oil, sunflower oil, canola oil. Where's the vegetable oil? You know what vegetable oil is? Try to buy it. Sprinkles. Look at this green ice cream. This is like one stop shopping right here. Holy smokes. 65. Really, I thought I could make a cake for under 15 bucks. A $65 cake for Joe's 65th birthday. But Mikey still has to make it. Across the country in St. John's, Newfoundland, a string of bad weather has kept the water bomber crews on standby. Freezing rain. Didn't think it would be this long. Stop counting the days, it's crazy. I'm thinking of buying property. <laughs> <laughs> Going stir crazy watching weather forecasts on TV in the hotel room. How are you guys? Arnie and some of the boys decide to take in the sights. First time in Newfoundland? No? Not for me. Yeah. All right, you know, it's true. Newfoundlanders are easy to confuse. So if you say two answers together, it's going to screw me up. <laughs> this is the oldest city in North America. One passenger knows all about this part of the country. George Fury is from Newfoundland. You got a newbie right back oh, here. Yeah. Is there a girl trying to bullshit you, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez. First stop, Signal Hill. An historical site dating back to the early 1800s. The century-old Cabot Tower here served as a beacon for distressed ships caught in bad weather. Where are you headed to? Uh, the Azores first. We're crossing a body of water that's very extensive and we have no alternates. When we're halfway across, there's no going back and no turning around and no place to go left or right. We're gonna head into Cape Fair. Cape Fair is the most easterly point in North America. 
Over the years, hundreds of ships and propeller aircraft have been swallowed off this coast. The view of this vast gray ocean brings home the reality of the flight ahead. When you see those 30-foot waves, you think about it. It's, in my opinion, it's very difficult to survive if you went down the North Atlantic. Almost impossible. I haven't took that survival course. Coming up, the Electra finally takes a test flight. But Chuck isn't happy. Seven minute test flight, but we didn't even get the flaps up. A Buffalo DC-3 is about to make a run up the Mackenzie Valley. But for Captain A.J. DeCoste, this flight is not just about cargo. It's his last flight before getting married. And cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic's not letting him forget it. Last flight is a single man. I best <laughs> hug you. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good trip, buddy. AJ and co-pilot Gord Cooling are delivering food and supplies to the remote settlement of Delaney. No matter how many times he's flown this route, flying never gets old for AJ. And I'm really excited to go into work. You get to go and jump in this airplane that you love, and it sounds awesome. I'm like kind of a motorhead anyhow. If I weren't flying, I'd be riding my snowmobile or riding my motorcycle or doing something like that. So yeah, it's really exciting. Fortunately, AJ's fiance Candace fully supports his motorhead ways. Well, I met AJ uh, in Winnipeg at the bar. <laughs> uh, I, I guess, picked him up. <laughs> I was a pilot before I ever met her, so she knows all my stories and she knows, you know, what it is I do. When you are dating somebody from Buffalo, you definitely are looking at marrying into the company because it is a lifestyle. And Most of the company will be coming to the wedding. The dress code, more down parka than black tie. The couple is getting married at the Snow King's Ice Castle, a Yellowknife winter landmark. But first, AJ has nearly 6,000 pounds of freight to unload in Delaney. I'm getting married on this weekend. So uh, I think it's going to be a, a long marriage. She said it would be my last flight as a single man. I hope she's right. <laughs> AJ only has a few days to get ready for that walk down the icy aisle. All my family's coming up here, and uh, some of my close friends should be a pretty good time. And the wedding's not the only big change coming up for AJ. I think Candace is waiting to tell everybody here, but she's... Uh, Oh, five or six weeks pregnant, actually. Really? Yeah. Holy shit, dude. Yeah. Thanks, man. So Congratulations. Big, big changes, eh? Oh, my God. Uh, that's so awesome. Yeah. Candace is pregnant with her first baby, so we're not sure if it's a boy or girl yet, but things are changing pretty quickly, I guess. AJ's upcoming nuptials aren't the only big event on the Buffalo calendar. But also got sprinkles, too. There's also Joe's 65th birthday. There's a picture of this pan in that thing. Mikey is baking a cake for the occasion with his girlfriend, Gail. Mikey always does something different every year for somebody's birthday. He's always, you never know what is going to happen. She kept her distance and tried to help me learn the lesson of cake making. Now, how do I go to the third cup? Does it tell me? Yes, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's not a hard thing to make a cake from a box. I've been going out with Gail for like a year and a half. We're both taking um, business administration at Redyard College, and uh, we did four projects, and three of them got top of the class. He added his own uniqueness to it because he bought a marble cake and got some green food coloring and made the white part of the marble green. Green, the color of buffalo air. Now this is the frickin' ticket. Well, I hope it's edible when you're done. That's very unattractive. Never a dull moment with my gear on. I wanted to separate all the green ones out here. Well, this is not practical. I think the cake looks amazing. And I'm really proud of myself. I don't get to say that much. Mikey knows that Joe is pragmatic above all else. So this $65 cake better be worth it. I don't want people to think it's a $14 cake. 
That's a $65 cake. The question is, will Joe care more about his son's gesture or the $65 it costs to make a cake from a box? We're not a family that goes around and tells how much we love each other because, I don't know, it's just not how we are. Um, I'd be scared if you ever said that to me. I'd be like, are you dying or something? They don't openly show affection with each other, but it's the things they do for each other that show their affection for one another. I put happy birthday, this cake cost $65. But I could say that this freaking thing is coming out pretty awesome. In the Buffalo hangar, Chuck Adams gets a hand with an overhauled electro propeller from mechanic Juan Tesher and Rod McBrien. Take a line up there, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Thanks. Having two electros ready to fly will change the way Buffalo does business. Now we're going to be capable of hauling a little bit more fuel more often over longer distances. But nothing on the Electra comes cheap. More. Good. These props are worth about uh, 75000 just for the overhaul. Once the propeller is installed, the Electra should be ready for a test flight. This prop regulator is what controls the blade angle. That's why they call it a regulator. It regulates. It's like an alternator alternates, carburetor carbitutes. Generator generates. Come on, boys. While Chuck and the mechanics get things ready in the hangar, that? Yeah. right there, yeah. a meeting has been called to sort out the pilot's calculations. So how many times does 11,000 go into a million? A whole bunch. <laughs> Before we go talk to Joe, we should sharpen our pencil a little bit here and, and redo those numbers with the, the, the lighter weights. How's it going, partner? Oh, we're good, yeah. Top notch. The Buffalo Brass, Joe and accountant Dave Forbes, go over Brian's figures. If these numbers are right, that's what they are, and uh, I mean, we can't argue with that. But also, Joe, you got to remember that the damn strip is only 3,800 feet long. Well, they're just disagreement on the weights we're going to haul in on this fuel haul. I think they're trying to get it together now. But we don't, we don't have a whole lot to offer at those numbers. No, we got to be careful yeah, about that. Uh, we're not quoting. The outside our, that we did our limits. No. And that's why that's, it's, that's where it gets embarrassing. I may have made an error in my my landing calculations, and he may have made error. But in two, between the two of us, he went one way, I went the other. One's got this kind of weight, the other's got that kind of weight. What we're trying to do is reconcile what right. the differences are. I did my quote on 4,200 foot runways. Yeah, fine. And it turns out that the runways are much shorter than that. Okay, so that's does why that I, account for the whole difference? And I kind of suspected that it was somebody off the cuff said, What can we carry? and he just worked it backwards from our max landing weight without uh, realizing that the runway may be a limiting factor. I would have come up with very similar numbers of what Ray yeah, came exactly. up with if I would have had the runway lengths. Pilots? Well, I'm beginning to wonder. I used to have a little respect for him, but I'm starting to lose respect. It's Buffalo Joe's 65th birthday, so Mikey is baked him a cake. Look, I spent 65 bucks making this cake. I can prove it. Look at this. 65th birthday. There you go. I'll be submitting that in for to Mr. Forbes. Yeah, well, it should have been 65 bucks between the layers in hard cash for me. One for every year I put up with them. Would uh, come out 65 candles on it. I could blow 65. Around. I ran out of money. Get a knife. We'll cut her up. See what you made for 65 bucks. Did you put money in it? Is it like a money cake? No, look. I said he paid 65 bucks, I think he was bad money. It's freaking marble. You can't just go to the store and buy marble cake. Anyway, I gotta blow this out, eh? Yeah, Look at that. Good luck, I make another year. I didn't blow one. He played along. He cut it up, gave people pieces. Right. So you go around the circle. Yeah. Hey, you wait till everybody gets your cake. You don't start first, we're your manners. <laughs> he knows when people work hard for something, and when it comes from the heart, you can recognize that. I'll save that for one of the crew. Thanks, guys. Really good. Thanks, Mike. I was quite proud of him. I do everything just to see that smirk on his face. He gets that smile on his face. It's pretty good. This is the best cake I ever had. If you need any cake making, you can go look farther than here. It's takeoff time for Chuck and the Electra. Today, all his hard work will be put to the test. Everything's looking in here, Chuck. Top notch. 
Well, we just want to make sure all of our navigation equipment works, all of our radios work, and that the engines and uh, the rest of the aircraft performs the way it should. Both electric captains, Brian Harrison and Ray Weber, will be flying the test flight. All righty, let's get out here, boys. Oh, you better be. Chuck and two other engineers will be riding in the back seat. But immediately, there's a problem. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. The intercom system isn't working right. They can't hear each other. Hello, hello, hello. Why didn't we check all this stuff before we went out of the hangar? It was working before. Good, so why don't we just go with what we got? Not an ideal situation, but the pilots agreed to proceed with the test flight. Pilots decide to head back to the airport. Flight slow. Flight slow. 50. How long was that damn test flight? Seven f***ing minutes. A seven minute f***ing test flight. But we didn't even get the flaps on. And there's all kinds of little things that either won't work or won't work the way they're designed to. Ray and Brian aren't ready to give it the thumbs up. They want the little things fixed, and then they want another test flight. We're not going to get to the moon like this. This is f***ing horseshit. It's always the same, you know? You'll get an engineer who'll say, well, what do you need to do that for? Overpaid f***ing prima donnas. Chuck's a great engineer, but he's not a pilot, you know? And you see, you see things differently from the seat, from back seats. I'm tired of f***ing dealing with bullshit. They're telling Joel that we need another test flight. And Joel's waiting for my answer. My answer was, why do you want another test flight? I don't know where Chuck's coming from, but uh, uh, I wanted to do another flight on the airplane after we did the initial test. What, are we going to test fly the f***ing thing to China? How many times are we going to test fly a f***ing airplane? You know, pilots are just like a priest. They're right there at the same level. Never been there, never done it. Let's sure preach a lot about it. No, they're not getting another test flight. I got vetoed. Chuck said it wasn't necessary to do another flight, so Joe agreed with Chuck, so. A few minor bugs still to iron out, but this Electra is deemed ready to haul fuel to Baker Lake. Guys like me and Joe, we don't like anybody, eh? So we're just gonna be around and make everybody friggin' miserable. And the more miserable I can make them, the better I feel. That's where I'm gonna leave that, boys. Chuck's gonna have got him. Meanwhile, Mikey's busy with a project of his own. He's setting up a GPS monitoring system to track the water bombers via satellite. How in the hell is this supposed to go on? If that falls, man, that no, won't fall. It'll follow both airplanes. And uh, if for any reason if there's something wrong with him, we'll know right away. All right, hopefully she turns on. <gasps> it works. The system is ready. Now all they need is the weather to cooperate. Uh, the forecast is to get better for our arrival time. That's why we're going out. The water bomber crews are in the St. John's Airport making plans for departure. Uh, are you ready to file rooster or what, what do you want to do? You want to file formation or? I mean, let's go for formation. Fine. 
Back in Yellowknife, with his tracking system up and running, Mikey is pulling an all-night shift, waiting for the water bombers to take off from St. John's. Hello. Hey, Ernie, it's Mikey. Hey, Mikey. Hey, what's the latest, man? We're just fueling. Get ready to go. Final flight plan, we're out of here. Yeah, probably 4.30 is, is what we got to departure time, so. Perfect. It's too good to be true. Warm temperatures, clear skies, and an all-important tailwind. Fueled everything up, got everything ready, ran the airplanes up. Our weather briefing went good, and we were ready to go. We done a final weather check. Then, damn, a sudden change in the forecast. The weather in the Azores went for crap. We completely fogged in. It's going to be like that for a while, and it looks like Christ. No breaks for us today. We're ready to rock and roll. And at the last minute, we had to cancel. Well, it was perfect earlier. Hey, Mikey. What's going on? The weather has just went for hell in the Azores for us. Oh. The best that we can see is 200 feet. Oh, man, that sucks. Now the forecast has changed totally, so. Here, let's talk to Justin for a minute. Hey, Justin. You know, you got to feel pretty good about uh, taking $5 million worth of airplanes and seven people's lives, you know across the ocean and uh and with that forecast it was tough to feel good about it well i guess we better see if we can get back to that get those airplanes back in and get back to the hotel we better phone the hotel and tell them we still need our rooms i guess eh? coming up aj's wedding on ice and the buffalo gang show up in force i don't know what i was thinking <laughs> The day has come for the Electra's fuel haul to Baker Lake. We're in dust and oil, we just gotta take the plugs out and get her closed up. The pilots are looking forward to this flight. It's been kind of nice to see this airplane operate. We never hauled a load of it again. Yeah, exactly. See how fast she goes and how she handles. We'll be on our way this afternoon as long as the Baker Lake weather holds out. Engineer Chuck Adams has done his job. Just a quick tire check. Oh, they're hanging in, hanging in. And he's gone. Well, I'm not sticking around. Take care. We're aboard. That's a good thing. Today's also the day AJ is getting hitched at the ice castle, a structure made of just ice and snow. The gang from Buffalo makes a strong showing. Uh, I've been asked to be the greeter, keep the ruffians out, you know what I mean? It is kind of just an open door place and he lets people in, so anybody that doesn't belong, you get told to get 86. How you doing? You uh, coming in for the wedding, folks? Yes, we are, yeah. Awesome, just around here and hang a left pretty please. Uh, it was really nice to have so many people from Buffalo at the wedding. I uh, invited the whole crew that was up here, and uh, most of them showed up. You know, the people up here do feel like family to me. Everyone's in formal wear, Buffalo style. Janelle Glenn stepping out in open toe shoes. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but it's AJ's attire that's taking center stage. We have a few cat calls and some whistles there from, you know, everybody at Buffalo for the that wearing the tux. I don't know, I think that they are kind of a little bit shocked that, you know, I cleaned up so good. I remember the moment when Candace was walking down the aisle towards me as I was standing there. She had a big, huge, like, uh, shawl that she was wearing. She looked amazing, and she was smiling. It was neat to walk in and see AJ there waiting for me to walk down the aisle. <laughs> Learn to respect your individual outlook. Share your thoughts, experience, and dreams. We started actually saying uh, our lines there. I started getting a bit choked up. Hi, Anthony. It was probably one of the happiest days of my life to be married to Candace. Heartbreaking. The ceremony was great. A little chilly, but unique.
Across the country in St. John's, Newfoundland, the weather is finally looking good for a flight over the North Atlantic. Well, this is the first time that we've actually had a wind that was favorable to go. But the crew's enthusiasm is dampened as tragedy strikes off the coast of Newfoundland. With 18 people aboard, a helicopter headed to an offshore oil platform has crashed. The S uh, Sikorsky 92 helicopter ditched into the water approximately 30, 30 nautical miles east of uh, St. John's. Only found one survivor so far out of 18. The North Atlantic is nothing to play with, that's for sure. Coast Guard ships and military aircraft have searched the crash site all day. So far, finding only one survivor. Most of these people are from this area. It's a small area, so a lot of people would know those men that are on that helicopter. We're doing basically the same thing, uh, only going a longer distance. We're going 1,300 miles. But time is running out. That's because those mandatory offshore survival suits will only keep someone alive for 24 hours in the frigid North Atlantic. It's all fun and games and good training in the pool there, but the uh, reality of the whole thing is very tough to survive out there in that ocean. Arnie and his crew will have strong tailwinds if they fly tonight. A good thing, unless they have to ditch. Now they're going to have probably 25, 30 foot waves tomorrow with that wind. We couldn't even possibly land, you know, we might survive the landing, but the airplane would sink almost immediately in those type of waves. Weather's well, shit, helicopter just crashed out there. It's not very good, so. But we're totally prepared. The helicopter crash is a terrifying dose of reality. A little bit sobering, yeah. Send some chills down on your back, for sure. At this moment, the trip to the Azores is still a go, despite the helicopter tragedy which means the engineers' lives could soon be in the hands of the four pilots. We got the word, two o'clock this morning, we're gonna head up to the airport and go. The rough weather that's been making the rescue attempt so difficult is actually the window the Buffalo crew has been waiting for. There's an excellent tailwind. Well, we're leaving on Friday the 13th. <laughs> Friday the 13th, what else is there? We got 13,000 pounds of fuel, we gotta go 1,300 miles. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty good, pretty good odds. <laughs> Still to come, the pilots forge ahead with their plans to cross the North Atlantic. The stars are aligning tonight. Boys are just pulling the airplanes out now. It's off to work to go. It's 2 a.m. and the westerly wind is howling at St. John's Airport in Newfoundland. So we're going. It's a good tailwind, exactly what they need for this flight to the Azores Islands. Cut my hair and everything too, getting that survival suit. I see that, yeah. I, I wanted a tight seal. In a hurry to get their Martian suits on. Might as well be comfortable while you die of pipe therapy. Stop to work go. Pulling another all nighter in Yellowknife, Mikey's watching the satellite feed on the monitor. It moved. TXB fired up. Well, this is the first signs of life I've seen. Weather conditions aren't perfect. It's not the greatest right now, but it's improving. We need the tailwind, so uh, we got it tonight. It's good. This is the farthest the crew has come so far. And unless a last minute weather warning is issued, they will be airborne in a few minutes. So it looks like to me they're actually in the aircraft doing a run up. Both airplanes are lit. We got both planes fired up. I just got a text message. I'm waiting for Oceanic clearance before takeoff. And they get it. Here are clear for takeoff. Oh, here we go, boys. Two knots. Get excited. TXB's heading down the runway. She's 11 knots. There she is. F and F should follow right behind her. Oh, 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 oh. TXB's taking off. Look. Well, she's in the air now. Just gotta wait to make sure both of them get 
up there. There she goes. Both of them are now in the air. We are in business. It will take over nine hours to reach the Azores Islands. But in less than two hours, they'll reach their point of no return. And then, there will be no turning back. Your adventure has just begun. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, the Rampy conflict escalates. I'm pretty unhappy with it all. And the water bomber pilots face danger over the North Atlantic. We got an overspeed. Okay, Santa Maria, Santa Maria. We're declaring an emergency this time. The North Atlantic takes no prisoners. We're flying into this stuff. This is gonna be icy in this. The water bomber pilots face danger over the North Atlantic. We got an overspeed. Okay, Santa Maria, Santa Maria. And all of a sudden, ticks be turned around. And we don't know why. Confirm your intentions. We're declaring an emergency. the moon. But not for long. In St. John's, Newfoundland, Buffalo's water bomber crews get set for the most dangerous leg of their mission, a nine and a half hour flight over the frigid North Atlantic to the Azores Islands. Chief pilot Arnie Schrader has flown over 37,000 hours in his career but he's never piloted a summertime water bomber over the ocean in the dead of winter. Well, everybody's nervous, I think, about that North Atlantic and airplanes are not designed to cross oceans. Well, I've never done a flight uh, that far with that type of an airplane. You like that suit? Don't yeah, rip it. Like it. You might need it. Arnie's co-pilot is Justin Simley. Uh, are you ready to file rooster? Or what, what do you want to do? You want to file formation or? Justin is trained under Arnie since he started at Buffalo eight years ago. I've seen him, you know, grow from a very inexperienced to a very experienced pilot in the last six or seven years. For that, anyways, we got two hours after that, our clearance will be valid, so. Hello. They're delivering these two water bombers purchased by the government of Turkey. But an Atlantic crossing in winter in these low flying short haul summer planes is a sobering prospect. You'd be an idiot to not know what could happen before you take that trip. And if you didn't know what could happen and you agreed to do that trip, you're stupid. My policy has always been the North Atlantic takes no prisoners. In fact, just yesterday, there was tragic news. A S uh, Sikorsky 92 helicopter ditched into the water approximately 30, 30 nautical miles east of uh, St. John's. The helicopter radioed a A helicopter like this one was on its way to an offshore oil platform when it crashed into the ocean killing 17 people. Only one man survived. But Arnie, Justin, and the rest of the water bomber crews have to put the danger out of their minds. But that's not so easy for the anxious friends and family they've left behind. A month ago in Yellowknife, engineer Corey Dodd said goodbye to his wife, Sonia, a pilot herself. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. Look forward to the day we see each other again. Um, I'm not sure when that is. Of course, worry about all the different things that could go wrong with the airplane. I can't worry like that every day because there's nothing I can do about it. The pilots at the helm of the second water bomber are Dave Poole and George Fury. I don't like the suit, but it's a must, must have. The two water bomber crews must fly 2,200 kilometers to the Azorean island of Santa Maria. Weather delays have put them way behind schedule. I, I don't know if my eyes are playing tricks on me, but I think I just saw F and F move. 
At Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, General Manager Mikey McBrien is keeping a close eye on the action. Doesn't get much bigger than this. This is sort of like the Super Bowls of Flight Watch. Mikey set up a monitor to track the water bomber's location, speed, and altitude in real time using GPS satellite technology. He'll keep close watch. It's nine hours in the air in a relatively slow airplane. So much can happen. And there's two airplanes, double your risk. Still before dawn at St. John's, and it's go time. With Arnie and Justin in the lead, the 215s finally take off and head east over the North Atlantic. This is the biggest leg in the 12,000 kilometer odyssey to transport these planes to Turkey. The trip began weeks ago in Red Deer, Alberta. They flew across Canada, stopping in Winnipeg, Montreal, and then St. John's, Newfoundland. Dawn breaks over the North Atlantic. The two water bombers have been in the air for 90 minutes, zooming at 370 kilometers per hour thanks to a powerful tailwind. It's the push they need to reach the Azores before their fuel runs out, but as a result, they're also about to pass their point of no return earlier than anticipated. We'll go out about an hour and a half, two hours, and turn back. That might take you four and a half hours to get back. We have a 50 knot tailwind. So your point of uh, no return is not very many hours out of Newfoundland. We're only going to have enough gas at one point to just keep on going. There's no turning around, and uh, that's pretty scary. What's scaring Mikey even more are the radar images of the weather over the North Atlantic. As you look from that nice, calm picture, it's peaceful and serene, no weather. Here's the reality. We're flying into this stuff I'm not too happy about. It's kind of like a wall. They're right here. They're going to hit that wall. That wall is a layer of clouds filled with super-cooled water droplets. There's going to be icing in this. Now we just got to skip ice on the leading edge. Ice is a hazard for 215s because the airplane is not designed to take icing. So if you get it into ice inadvertently, it's, a, it's, it's pretty serious stuff. If too much ice forms on the planes, they could lose lift and drop from the sky. With no onboard de-icing equipment, it's up to the pilots to steer clear of the clouds. Arnie and Justin take the low route. We encountered some ice. We just dropped down into some warmer air to get out of it. Dave and George do the opposite in the second plane, attempting to climb above the clouds. Well, we might get on top of this, eh? Yeah, it looks pretty thin, eh? Up a little bit, come on, our feet are diving. The maneuvers work. Both crews manage to skirt the danger. The good weather is holding, and the, the forecast has improved. The pilots escape the threat of icing, but with six hours of flying over open water still to go, there's no escaping the survival suits. They have to be tight to be waterproof. So they're very tight, very uncomfortable because they're extremely hot. The suits will help them survive in case they have to ditch into the icy North Atlantic. No, and this isn't like your lake at your cottage water. This is rolling seas, high winds. Not The airplane behind me is not set up to be in a rock and roll and wave fest. And you look down and there's 50-foot uh, swells below you. That's, uh, you know, that's something to see. I said, I'm not going to look. So I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> A world away in Yellowknife, Sonia Golding is glued to her laptop. Using the same GPS tracking as Mikey, she's following the 215's progress and trying not to worry about her husband, Corey. They are... Very close to their destination. F and F, that's the one that Corey is in, is 
approaching the island first, and then uh, TXB, the other 215, is just north of them. There's still a couple of hours away from Santa Maria, the last of the group of islands that form the Azores. I can't wait to hear from him when he lands. Across town, Mikey's feeling the effects of his all-night vigil. But fresh from flying in from Hay River, Buffalo Joe wants an update on his water bombers. So, so do we know exactly what time they took off? Two o'clock. Exactly two o'clock. Yeah. Our time. Two fifteen. Our time. Our time. So they've been in here seven hours. Eh? Are these are these islands highly inhabited? I assume so. Why don't we live out there? Joe has a point. Winter in the Azores is pretty sweet compared to Yellowknife. The temperature never comes close to freezing. Before the era of jets, this Portuguese archipelago was a regular fueling stop for transatlantic crossings. The Santa Maria airport doesn't get the same amount of traffic anymore, but it still serves that purpose on occasion. It is the safe harbor for any pilot which, who is making a, tra a North Transatlantic travel, and if he has a problem, he can always land at Santa Maria's. By late afternoon, the air traffic controllers at Santa Maria have Buffalo's 215s within their airspace. And within uh, more uh, one and a half hours, they will be both in, in Santa Maria. There's just one obstacle ahead, and it's a big one. At over 7,800 feet, the volcano Pico Alto dominates Pico Island. And Arnie and Justin choose to fly right over it, taking the most direct flight path to Santa Maria. In order to save fuel and expedite our trip to Santa Maria, once inside the uh, Santa Maria control zone, uh, we request a direct Santa Maria. They instructed us to climb to 10,000 feet to clear the volcano. It's the highest peak on, on uh, Portugal uh, territory, so uh, it means that to overfly safely, flights must be at least 10,000 feet. But peaks like Pico Alto create a dangerous condition. As Arnie and Justin pass over the summit, they suddenly start to lose altitude fast. Pretty downdraft on the back side of the mountain. Eh? That's what mountains are like. Get the lee side of them and you'll get a downdraft. That's exactly what we got from 10,000 feet. When air is forced up over a mountain, it cools, gets heavy, and plunges down the other side, creating downdrafts. In extreme cases, these powerful winds can force an aircraft to the ground. The downdraft on the other side of it was, uh, was incredible. We had climb power on, it was still going down. Even at full power, the 215 is no match for the pummeling downdraft on the lee side of Pico Alto. They're being forced down. The airplane was just sinking. There's a problem over the North Atlantic. En route to Santa Maria, the easternmost island in the Azores, pilots Arnie Schrader and Justin Simley are flying over a volcano on Pico Island, and it's bringing them down, literally. Up here. We had a severe downdraft on the backside of the volcano, and uh, we had climb power on, it was still going down. Just over an hour from their destination, they're in the clutches of powerful wind systems over an 8,000 foot high active volcano. Arnie and Justin managed to hold out at 9,000 feet. It's low enough to give them a bird's eye view of the volcano as they pass over it. It's kind of neat. You look down, there's a big lake in the middle. Pretty scenic. Yeah. Well, I thought it was pretty cool. Big volcano, yeah. Back in Yellowknife, Mikey McBrien's been glued to the screen for nine and a half hours, watching the tiny registration numbers that represent the two planes crawl across the map. You gotta make sure TXB and F and F are both sitting there safe and sound before we can go home and wait for a phone call. F and F is up on the, the approach of the shore. Ooh, they're really close. Sonia Golding is also riveted watching her husband Corey's plane on her computer screen. 
This is so exciting. This is a really big deal. After a 2,200 kilometer flight over open water, Arnie, Justin, and Corey begin their approach to the Santa Maria Airport. Charlie Weber, Fox Roger, to your official approach runway 18. Report established on flight. We can proceed with a manual approach, sir. Uh, we have a field in second. Oh, they're right over Santa Maria now. They've landed. They're on the runway. There they are. They just landed. 38 knots. They landed, man. So that's awesome. I'm very relieved. And I'm, I'm, I'm much more relaxed now. They're just taxiing off. Isn't this fantastic? That was nice. Nice to put that ocean behind you. The big chunk of ocean behind you. Fifteen minutes later, Dave and George prepare to land the second water bomber. TXB is 153 knots. He's on the descent now into it anyways. As soon as they come to a stop, the guys have just one thing on their minds. The best part of touching down the Azor is getting that damn suit off. We just have to get out of these suits, and we'll be laughing. Good times. Once they've shed the suits, Arnie checks in with Buffalo HQ. Hey, Mikey, how you doing? How was it, man? Well, we're down. It was not bad. We were literally watching you the whole entire way sitting here at the hangar. Yeah, that's what I figured you guys would be doing anyway, so. Kind of like a candlelight visual. Yeah, cool. Cool. Okay, Arnie, congratulations. And Sonia gets the call she's anxiously been waiting for. Hello? Hey, what's happening? <laughs> did you kiss the ground? No, I didn't kiss the ground. What did I kiss the ground? <laughs> I see you made it. Yeah, did you watch all the whole way or what? As soon as I got up this morning, I was watching you. And your mom's watching you too from uh, Winnipeg. What time did you wake up this morning? Uh, 7.30. Oh, that's good. Anyways, thought I'd just, oh, so just give you a call. Tell you I love you and all that good stuff. I love you too. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. After calling home, it's time for some rest. Tomorrow, Arnie and the boys hope to continue on over open water to get from the Azores to mainland Portugal. It's not just a little hop from uh, the Azores to Cascades, Portugal. It's still another 800 miles over the, over the ocean. At Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, the focus shifts to flight attendant school. Keep on practicing and we'll do... Rampy's Wilf Dar and Audrey Marchand are in the course. But Jeremy Dow is not. Joe wants both. That really hurt. Joe wants both Wilf and Audrey to take the flight attending course. While Audrey and Will are relatively new to Buffalo, Jeremy has been slogging it out at Buffalo's terminal in Hay River for six months. Uh, flight attending is sort of the intermediate step between Rampy and uh, pilot. But Jeremy's plan to take that step was scuttled when his hand-picked successor, Ramon Srivastava, packed it up and returned to his native India. See you soon, buddy. See you soon. See you, see you, see you. He was sort of supposed to be my replacement in Hay River, so uh, when he left, I had to be the Hay River guy once more. Ramon's gone and quit due to some personal reasons and uh, sort of left me holding up down the fort. I'm uh, probably going to miss my chance at uh, flight attending here, which, uh, which sort of sucks and means I get stuck in Hay River for a bit. Unless a qualified Rampy is assigned to take over for him in Hay River, Jeremy's dreams of getting promoted will be gone, possibly forever. Still to come. An engine problem over open water. Got an open speed. And the 215 crew scrambles to get to dry land. Stalling. Down. 
After successfully crossing the treacherous North Atlantic, it's time to celebrate. The Buffalo crew hits the town. Word of their adventure is spread through the island, and they're greeted like celebrities. We're happy to be in Santa Maria. That's the longest leg of the journey right there. Welcome to the Azores. A lot of pilots like you have been through here. I had a cold beer that night. It tasted pretty good. They have good reason to be happy. The worst is behind them. Or so they think. Cheers, cheers. In Yellowknife, it's day two of flight attendant school for Rampy's Wilf Dar and Audrey Marchand. Emergency, bend forward, uh, grab seat top, heads down, stay down. Time to show instructors Dan Catoni and Ian Bottomley what they've got. Next. In preparation for landing, I remind you to get your seat back in the upright and locked position. Just to try to do it a bit smoother, to practice a bit more, and it'll come, right? Good afternoon, welcome to Buffalo Airways uh, flight and scheduled service. Uh, Public speaking isn't coming easily to the shy guy who got his pilot's license in Bible college. Um, in preparation for departure, at this time I uh, would like you to put on your seatbelts. Uh, as well, they need to be on for takeoff, uh, or taxi takeoff and landing. But Wilf will do anything if it means he'll get closer to flying one of Buffalo's vintage aircraft. I do love aviation. I love the planes. I, I love everything about them. I love the freedom they, they represent. Piston founders are music to my ears. They would probably, they're a siren's call. They'd call me quite a ways. While newcomers Audrey and Will for making headway in their careers at Buffalo, Jeremy Dow is going nowhere fast. Pretty unhappy with it all. With no Rampy to replace him, Jeremy is still stuck in Hay River. So, well, it looks like Audrey Wolf will be doing the flight attendant course instead of me. And so, they get to be flight attendant rather than me. Which is just so, so nice. His growing resentment isn't getting him much pity from general manager Mikey McBrien. If you want to be a pilot and you have a bad attitude, I don't know, win the lottery and buy an airplane because you won't make it any other way. For all I know, I'm being held back because of my attitude. I don't know. I hope not. I don't think so. But you never know. Only a former Rampy like Buffalo co-pilot Scott Blue can really understand Jeremy's pain. Mikey's ever worked the ramp. He doesn't totally grasp how much it can, you know, screw with your head and how, you know, they can break you down, wear you down. So I just need to make that clear to Mikey. Let's go through the old ones first. I think the old ones are junk. Scott convinces Mikey it's time to hire some new rampies. This could be Jeremy's ticket out of Hay River. Chronologically, he's been here the longest, you know, for the other guys, and he may gripe a little bit, but he's also a hard worker. So, for sure, give him a shot. Why not? Okay, we need people that can work now. Like, we call them and come up next week. Uh, okay, who's this guy? Okay, this one was mailed. By the way, I think we should give him bonus points for actually mailing it. I'm presently looking for a job in Canada. I am now gathering information. No, no. I'm a recent graduate. Of no, he's garbage, garbage. Garbage. Is he in college or something, or is he just in jail? Goodbye. Do you really need to write garbage on it when it's about to go in the trash? Yes. See you later. Lots of pilots need work, but Buffalo's looking for someone who is willing to bust their ass for peanuts, doing everything but flying for the first year. Man, that would be awesome if you picked a better choice of fonts. Basically sacrifice yourself for the year and say, hey, I have a job to do, and if it's wiping dog crap off the ground, well, that's my job. It's necessary in this day and age that they have to come work the ramp, and it's, oh, you got a commercial pilot's license, yeah, you know. Great, here's a box. And when you're done with that, there's a thousand more. So I think that's a good one. Crap. What do you think? You think it's a good one? I, I like this guy. But he's got forklift and heavy construction equipment up for him. Propane certified. That's good. That's good. You know, like that's that sort of stuff. So I would put this on the, you know. Good, good pile? Just have a look. I love writing on the resume. Give him, give him a shot. Give him a shot. They better find someone quick. 
Jeremy's misery over missing out on flight attendant school is growing. Stay dirty whore. Today, he's come up from Hay River to work at the Yellowknife hangar, and he's brought his bad mood with him. It's just off, you sucking piece of shit, stupid, idiotic piece of damn fabric. Can't manage a piece of fabric in the wind. <laughs> he gets all upset. Get off. I'm off. Good. I think we're there. Wilf's now oh. at Jeremy's line of fire. I think you were looking at it right there. No, except I can't get that one up. I'm gonna you use can't the... get it up. Well, that's... You know why I can't get it up? Because it's on something that, you know, won't drop down. Oh, hey, hey, found another one. That's what I just pointed at. Yeah, but I wasn't paying make... attention to you. Uh, why does it surprise you? Why does it surprise you the least? I'll listen to you guys. I don't listen to you guys. Meanwhile, on the sunny island of Santa Maria, the Buffalo Boys are playing tour guide. To look at now, I think he's for 68 or 69, yeah. somewhere in there. That's the we're built. Justin and Arnie are showing off the water bombers to curious airport staff. So you see those doors there that are open? That's where the water drops out. It takes 10 seconds to pick the water up. Right? Then you're off. Awesome Let's go inside. inside. We can check it out inside if you want. Yeah, people love coming and looking at airplanes, so. Of course, 215 is a fairly large and noisy airplane, so it draws a little bit of attention when you... Yes, yes, for me, they're just dots, and yeah. uh, it's great to, to actually be here. Well, they're amphibious airplanes that are not seen that often, so they're quite interested in them. Uh, and it's isn't it interesting uh, knowing how yeah. they work. Well, it's kind of a tin can, there's no insulation or anything in here. Yeah. It's tough to get These low-flying water bombers were built to fight forest fires, not cross oceans. The airplane would sink if it was to land in 30 or 40 foot waves, of course. For these guys to cross at the Atlantic Ocean on this airplane, uh, they must be <laughs> very courageous. Must be crazy. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> must be crazy. The other pilots along for this crazy journey are George Fury and Dave Poole. They are hired guns specifically for this risky mission. Well, I hired Dave Poole, the, the guy they call Rooster. And he had experience on uh, Atlantic crossings. I like adventures. I got my wish. Rooster wanted us to take a picture of him next to the palm tree so he could send it home to his uh, wife. Nicknamed Rooster, Dave has a family back in Red Deer. This is this for the folks back home sitting in uh, minus 30 in a snowbank? <laughs> I hired George Fertigore because he had experience in flying an international contract. I've done a bunch of varied stuff, but I always wanted to go back to the water bombers. Based in Newfoundland, George never married and leads a journeyman life. That's the reason I got into uh, into flying in the first place, because of the fact of, uh, of bush flying and, and basically the adventure of going places different and, and experiencing new things. The two met flying water bombers for Buffalo a few years back. The uh, water bombing business, you know, you get to do uh, Lots of takeoffs, lots of landings, and uh, actually get to wheel the airplane around uh, instead of just going from point A to point B. And they still have four more point Bs to hit, covering another 5,000 kilometers before they reach Turkey. Now the fun part of the trip starts. That's right. But their next leg, 1,300 kilometers over the ocean from the Azores to mainland Portugal, will turn out to be anything but fun. You bent my bolt. I've been doing it for like six months. I haven't bent the bolt. Despite all his grumbling, things are starting to look up for Rampy Jeremy Dow. You know how to fold these things, eh? Jeremy is training Graham Ferguson, freshly hired as the new Rampy to replace him in Hay River. When Graham showed up, it was, it was one of the better days. It was a nicer day. A light at the end of one of the many, many tunnels in Buffalo. I thank God for every day he gives me in Buffalo. Okay, well, uh, I'll go in there with you then, Wicked. If Graham works out, Jeremy could get into the flight attendant course in Yellowknife. I knew he was sort of slated to be my replacement, and that was uh, that was definitely a good thing. I'm going to show him how to not get his head cut off by a DC-3. Not yet. Oh, God. Oh, 
Oh, that's lovely. Who likes crop wash? I do. I think that's the only thing we have for downtown. Everything Inside Buffalo's Courier cool. Depot, well, Jeremy well, fills well, Graham in on the day's pickups and deliveries, a task he'll be more than happy to pass yeah. off. Top one's MSS. Anything that gets me away from Courier is a good thing. So if you stick around, I get to be flight attendant, and then from there I get to be uh, first officer after that. It's sort of my next step is to find a replacement for down here, and that's you. So. Don't f*** it up. On a tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean, it's time to fly again. What do you think of the palm tree? You like it? The pilots are looking forward to getting today's leg over open water out of the way. We still had another 756 mi nautical miles of water to cross, so we wanted to uh, get gassed up and uh, blast off for the coast of Portugal. The two water bombers will fly 1,300 kilometers from the Azores to the coastal town of Cascais on mainland Portugal. A six-hour flight, if all goes well. Just looking at the weather map here now, it looks like uh, we've got uh, fair sailing, so it should be good. In a few weeks, this journey will be over, and Dave can return home to his family in Alberta. And George can get back to Newfoundland and his garage of vintage motorcycles. Arnie and Justin will be at the controls of the lead water bomber. Request extract alerts. George and Dave will be flying the other 215. Request, uh, and we're clear on the With a shorter flight, the pilots choose not to wear the uncomfortable survival suits. Check, uh, Charlie Foxtrot Tango X-ray Bravo is cleared for takeoff, runway 18. Runway 8, clear for takeoff. Okay, we're ready to rock. Both George and Dave are qualified captains. It's Dave's turn to fly today. George will be the co-pilot. Engineer Matt Belanger is riding along to supervise the fuel transfer. The bladders in the cargo hold are filled to the max with 3,000 pounds of fuel. Everything seems normal. I'm gonna go back to back and have a quick piss. Less than an hour out of Santa Maria, George takes a break. But that's when all hell breaks loose. kilometers away from Santa Maria with no land anywhere nearby. Their only option is to turn back. Okay, I'll just roll this up here and you're up here again. Flying a few minutes ahead, Arnie and Justin hear the emergency call. Now we got over speed on the uh, left engine here now we're just, uh, just barely holding on to it. Okay. We were worried about him. I mean, uh, you know, uh, an engine failure in a CL215 at that uh, that uh, at that weight and those temperatures is uh, is a serious deal. Are you going to make it back here, George? Yeah, we're working on it. George is busy right now. Okay, we're flying at a higher gross weight than would normally be done because we're, we're fearing the airplane with extra fuel. So you know, on one engine, it won't stay in the air. It'll gradually be coming down. 
stress on the engine is incredible, like driving a car at top speed and suddenly slamming into first gear. Worst case scenario in a prop over speed, if a propeller sheds its blades, it could go through the fuselage. There was nothing we could do for them, we just carried on. Okay, left side, may as well further it out here if we can. Yeah. Far back. Well, do we want to feather it? Hold the heading now. The overspeeding prop is reducing the aircraft's lift. It's dropping 500 feet a minute. Charlie Foxtrot Tango X-ray Bravo, you are cleared to descend five levels, 60 at pilot's discretion. Probably do just a slow descent so we won't lose. Well, I'm trying to, Gert. Yeah, okay. They're fighting to control the plane's rate of descent. We're supposed to level at 6,000. Oh, I can't hold it. We are uh, requesting lower altitude. Yeah. Yeah. If the plane loses too much altitude, they'll never make it back to Santa Maria. They'll have to ditch. And their decision not to wear their survival suits could prove fatal. One thing you don't want to be doing is going into the water. Sage, we got an overspeed. 4,000 feet over the Atlantic, and a big problem. Pilots George Fury and Dave Poole in one of the CL-215 water bombers lost control of the propeller on the left engine on their way to mainland Portugal. We're requesting immediate uh, come back to uh, Santa Maria. At Buffalo HQ in Yellowknife, Mikey is following the surprising change of flight path. Look at this. Uh, this morning at 7 o'clock, they took off going to uh, Portugal. Um, F and F and TXB were together, and then all of a sudden, TXB turned around, and we don't know why. Turning back was their only option, but they're still out over open water 80 kilometers from the Santa Maria airport. With a half hour to go, the pilots struggle to slow the plane's rate of descent. They'll only have one shot at the landing and need sufficient altitude and airspeed to come around Santa Maria and approach the runway from the north. If they lose too much altitude, they could crash into the cliffs on the east side of the island. The crippled 215 is loaded with enough fuel to fly all the way to mainland Portugal. So even if Dave makes it to the runway, a bad landing could be disastrous. Well, we'll get the uh, trucks there. Yeah. Yeah, you can stand by with the emergency services. Yeah, well, we can take whatever they got. Yeah. Airport staff prepare for the worst. I need more power on dirt. Coming up. Slow on jet. George and Dave have kept the overspeeding engine running, hoping to gain a bit of lift from it. But now they're close enough to the Santa Maria airport to shut the engine down. Left that mixture, boost pumps off. Oh, as soon as we turn final, we'll feather it, okay? Yep. Nope. Feathering the propeller means rotating the pitch of the blades to a neutral position to reduce drag. Maria approach. I got the runway in sight, George. I'm just trying to stay high. Check. Uh, Tango X-ray Bravo, check the wind. And we're short final. Landing gear is down. Left engine is feathered. With one good engine and the propeller on the other turning in the wind, they have to make a perfect landing. Bypass coming in. On low and on slope. Mixture, boost pumps off. Going on it. I don't know. Big pull up. Pull. Yeah, we're gonna I have the stick. You have the brakes. Oh, 
Safely on the ground, Dave goes over what happened. We got an overspeeding truck. It means the governor let go, wasn't working, and then it just, the RPM spools right up, and you, you can't, they're uncontrollable, eh? Like, they tried controlling it with the, uh, the prop control, so we couldn't control it, so all you can do is put it in a climb to try and slow it down, eh? You know, I wasn't sure it was going to maintain altitude all the way in here without feathering it, and normally you feather them, but. Uh, we got a lot of extra weight on board, so. Right now we need some fresh air. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, George. Once those two wheels touched the runway, it was a nice feeling because uh, you, know, you just dealt with 45 minutes of stress, so let's let's relax now. Yep. I gotta find a way to get a hold of Arnie so they're not worried about us. Yeah. Sixty-three hundred kilometers away, Mikey gets an update. Shit, an engine. Oh. All right. Shit. Here, let me talk to him first. Okay. Hey, Dad. I just got word they they lost an engine. Uh, all we got right now is just uh, the preliminary reports that there was an engine problem. That's why they turned around. So basically, yeah, right now, there's an engine problem. We don't know what it is. Uh, they don't know what it is until they do their checklist of stuff to figure out what actually the problem is. So all we can do is wait. While one water bomber is stranded in the Azores, the second one touches down in mainland Portugal. On the tarmac, Arnie and Justin get the latest report. When we heard they landed safely, Real happy with that. Couldn't get two better guys than uh, Rooster and George. So they know what they're doing. So well, I'm glad it happened where it did because it was right close to the Azores. So glad it didn't happen over the North Atlantic out of St. John's. If the engine can be repaired quickly in the Azores, the two water bombers will be able to complete their long journey to Turkey together. On a tarmac farther north and far colder, Jeremy Dow is late for class. I'm here to finally start flight attending training. No goddamn time. You're aiming towards being a pilot, and that's going to be one of the steps. And here, here's your ticket to do that. Now that Jeremy's got a capable replacement in Hay River, he's finally getting the chance to move up the ladder and chase his dream, becoming a Buffalo pilot. So I, I got the call uh, on the cell telling me that I would be uh, be able to attend the flight attending course and catch up to my peers there and or not peers underlings but fellow rampies audrey marchand and wilf dar are well ahead in their training but now you got to check to see if they're conscious breathing remember your abc's tapping and checking today a first aid class go for five cycles not only does Jeremy have to make up for lost time he's got to stand out above the rest you're always kind of trying to one-up the person next to you. You try to work harder than them. You try to be more proficient at everything than them. Do you treat every dummy that way? Only you. <laughs> and then what we're going to do is we're going to move into choking. Just on choking the We're friends and competitors at the same time. But I'm always going to win. Still to come. The crew stranded in the Azores try to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it 6,000 kilometers from home. On a beach in sunny Portugal, Arnie, Justin, and mechanics Corey and Norm are making the most of their stopover in Cascais. He says that that is the most eastern part in Europe, or the most western part in Europe, that rock over there. We were on the most eastern part of Canada, North America. Now we're in the most western part of Europe. They've flown 3,500 kilometers over the North Atlantic. An incredible feat in slow, low-flying water bombers. But they can't be beach bums much longer. They have a plane to deliver to Turkey. Of course, the company wanted us to carry on, and so did the Turks. It likes to finish the trip as a team, but you also have a customer here that wants his airplane sick, so at least get one of them there as quickly as you can. 
For the first time since they left Alberta, the two water bombers will be traveling separately. Marooned back in the Azores, George, Dave and Matt are under the gun to get their 215 back up in the air and en route to Turkey. It's uh, pretty good so far yet, because usually if there is a problem, you'd, you'd see all sorts of particles here, shiny, shiny metal particles. But figuring out what went wrong and how to fix it could take a long, long time. the next episode of Ice Pilots and WT. Buffalo pilots scramble to shuttle cargo to a remote mine site, but the ice strip there is melting fast. What the f are we landing on? Arnie and Justin contend with icing as they try to get their water bomber to Turkey, while the other water bomber crew struggles to get back in the air. And Mikey stands up to Joe. Say we're all useless. Pilots and WT. More problems with the water bombers headed for Turkey. A scramble to get two planes ready Clear. to land on an ice runway before the ice melts away. We have an airport that's disappearing. What are we landing on? Out of your hat, boy. It's a big day in Yellowknife. The annual closing of the Mackenzie River Ice Road, the link to the south. The first sign that a spring thaw is around the corner. Over the next month, the ice and snow will all disappear. And at the Buffalo Airways hangar, the spring thaw is forcing a rush on the maintenance of one of the company's two C-46 aircraft. We're going to change ice shields over and basically it's a strip of skin in the prop area that the ice flings off and dents it. Engineer Adam Smith is handling the overhaul. This damage is uh, pretty serious with the ice shield here. The ice shield protects the fuselage from ice flying off the propellers. This C-46's ice shield hasn't been replaced in nearly 50 years. I would say it's about time to change it. Adam and his crew have to get the work done fast. Buffalo needs this plane for an urgent job. The plane has to haul tons of mining equipment to a remote site where the landing strip is disappearing. Frozen lake, man. <laughs> it's not a runway. It's not a dirt strip. It's, you know, that much ice and water. You know, and the surface can change in a matter of an hour or two. A mining company needs 350,000 pounds of supplies delivered from their base in Geraldton, Ontario to a remote mining camp further north. Buffalo is sending a C-46 crew 2,200 kilometers from Yellowknife to Geraldton. They'll have to take multiple runs from there to the remote mining camp. And the only place to land is on a frozen lake. This job entails probably the hardest thing you could do at Buffalo. You don't have the luxury of saying, well, we'll go tomorrow or we'll go next week and stuff because it can be gone. Buffalo President Joe McBrien is pushing for the quickest possible departure. The mechanics have to pack every spare part the crew might need for at least two weeks of flying. Any delays due to mechanical problems could fuel Joe's wrath. So you need something, we're gonna send it down there and somebody's gonna freak out. You like, you know who, eh? No names. And let me know when you see him around because I'm gonna go off and hide somewhere. When the old man is running around the hangar, what he's trying to do is amalgamate everybody's focus to get the airplane to the job so we don't lose the job. The urgent priority is patching the C-46's fuselage back together. This delay couldn't have come at a worse time, because Joe's already frustrated by another delay. 
6,300 kilometers away, one of Joe's CL-215 water bombers is grounded. He sold two of them to Turkey, but an engine problem has stranded this one on the Atlantic island of Santa Maria in the Azores, just over halfway to its destination. Mechanic Matt Belanger has spent days trying to determine the problem. The good news, he now knows what it is. Well, that governor uh, doesn't work at all. The bad news, he can't fix it without a replacement prop governor, a key part that regulates propeller speed. It's unfortunate we got to waste a beautiful day like this. I mean, the conditions are perfect to go. Meanwhile, the other CL-215 with Captain Arnie Schrader, co-pilot Justin Simley, and mechanic Corey Dodd on board is on its way to coastal Spain. They still have two more legs and over 3,000 kilometers to go on this extraordinary journey. Garcia, Spain. That's where we are. This is just a refueling pit stop. Arnie wants to wait for his colleague still in the Azores, but under orders from Joe, he's pushing onward. Well, you'd like to finish the trip as a team, but we were actually encouraged to keep going. If I can put it that way. I'll call for the clearance. We got boost pumps and the taxi checklist. Run the the crew will fly 1,400 kilometers to Malta today, and then another 1,600 kilometers to their final destination, Ankara, Turkey, tomorrow. After crossing the treacherous North Atlantic, flying over the Mediterranean should be a breeze. Uh, it was pretty, very scenic route. It was very nice. The first probably hour was good, and then what into the hour and a half, second hour, we ran into a bit of ice, a bunch of crappy clouds and stuff. Ice. Oh, yeah. Nice. It was minus 10 or something, and we were going through a lot of clouds, so we, we picked up quite a bit of ice. The water bomber has no systems to shed ice, because water bombers normally fly in summer. Ice could bring the plane down. All they can do is try to keep away from the clouds. This airplane does not like ice. Back in Yellowknife, Rampy's Wilf Dar and Audrey Marchand are working the ramp. Later this morning, they have flight attendant school, the vital next step in their careers at Buffalo. But one of the Rampies in the course is missing, Jeremy Dow. Yes, he just called. Who? Jeremy. Why? <laughs> He's not on the plane. <laughs> not joking. <laughs> Jeremy Dow is currently the longest serving rampy at Buffalo. He's been working hard at the Hay River Terminal for over six months. This morning, there was no room for him on the daily passenger flight to Yellowknife, 200 kilometers away. I've had a string of some rough luck, I suppose. As a result, he'll miss another flight attending class. He's already way behind Audrey and Wilf, who were based in Yellowknife. Flight attending, that's an intermediate step between uh, Rampy and Flying the Sked, which is sort of the stepping stone to the entire company. The Graham's the FNG. <laughs> you guys. Even with Rampy Graham Ferguson ready to take over in Hay River, Jeremy is still struggling to get to Yellowknife where the action is. But today, he's stuck here. In some of these situations, the best man doesn't always win. They try to be as fair as they can, but in the end, it's there's a fair bit of luck thrown into it all. In the Yellowknife hangar, the clock is ticking. The delay getting the C-46 ready has Buffalo Joe worried because the ice runway in Northern Ontario was rapidly thawing. 
And Joe's also not sure C-46 Captain Devin Brooks is the man to lead this job. Uh, Devin and Joe always have a rocky relationship. Devin uh, is the type of person that stands up for himself, and Joe's the type of person that stands up for the company. And uh, that type of thing usually clashes. With only a few ice landings under his belt, Devin's feeling the pressure. In the back of your mind, you're wondering how thick the ice is. You gotta take in consideration how slippery it is. So Joe's brought in a ringer, a second, more seasoned captain named Ghislaine de Rocher. Even though he hasn't flown the C-46 in months, he knows ice. Warm it up five degrees, keep it five degrees above, and when you get to the ice strip over there, you're going to regret seeing it. Well, yeah. this is going to be some slippery, man. <laughs> but solving one problem could cause another. Every time you have two captains on a, on a trip or on a job, uh, you get two bosses. It's kind of like saying you have two prime ministers, and they're both with different parties. That no one would get along. Uh, sometimes you need a sole person there to make a decision. Devin wants to know who will be in charge. Joe gathers the whole crew to sort it out. What I'm going to do is send you guys down, and you have the most experience. He's going to be the captain in charge of going down. Devin's been here for, like, fine, every day, 40 below. Uh, and then you have someone on, like, just who comes in who's got insane amount of experience, but he hasn't flown in eight months. I'm going to put... Uh, the most experienced guy on the first couple trips for the ice. It's not the news Devin wanted to hear. Flying that airplane, you have to fly it. I was off for three and a half weeks, four weeks. And that plane is difficult to get back in the groove, even for me. He knew that he could do the job by himself, and he didn't need to be monitored at all. Ghislain wastes no time taking over. On the forecast for the morning. That's the best scenario. No, no. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't like that one. And I don't care if Divin likes it. The cracks are starting to show, even before they hit the ice. Coming up, the crew faces a treacherous situation on the ice airstrip. It's a race against melting ice. Buffalo's own Rosie the Riveter, Christina Besson, is still patching up the C-46 that's supposed to fly today to a slushy landing strip on a northern Ontario lake. Trying to get it done for Joe. He gets in at uh, 8.15 and it's 7.20. <laughs> yeah, the rush is on. I don't want to see him get bad. <laughs> And there's still friction over who will fly the plane. Buffalo Joe made an unpopular move, making Devin Brooks the junior of two captains. Even Joe's sons, Mikey and Rod, don't agree with his decision. I was, I guess, I guess a little bit politically pressured to uh, use my voice of reasoning with my father to uh, get Devin on board. Oh, I just wanted him to change, change it to Devin's the captain. The people in the company wanted to support Devin because Devin spent all winter pushing pallet jacks and was here in the morning at four or five, getting the plane ready. A thousand hours a year, 60 hours a year. Who's the captain? Ghislain de Rocher's lack of recent flying time isn't the only concern. When Ghislain's here, he works hard, right? But he is, an, he is older, right? So in the physical boom, 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 go, go pace, you know, he's going to get a little more worn down than, you know, say us in our, you know, late 20s, early 30s. Joe's DC-3 touches down in Yellowknife. He's heard about the tension in the hangar. He needs to get it resolved and get the C-46 in the air and on the job before the ice landing strip in northern Ontario melts away. You want to go into a meeting with a bunch of pilots? That'd probably be a closed one. And this won't be a very pleasant one. So we're all wondering, what's the final call going to be? There's like five people that have their bags packed. But it's like, who's going? I don't want people going off if you're not comfortable with experience levels, background levels, or whatever. What I want to know in a closed meeting, and there's no cameras in here, and nothing, what would you guys be comfortable doing? No, sir, you did. 
Jeremy Dow flew in with Joe this morning so he can finally attend the flight attendant course with the other rampies. I am sort of next in line, so me not being part of this course is a little silly, so may as well do it right now when we can. If I do all the flight attendant course, become the, the primary flight attendant, then uh, it'll mean a faster progression into a pilot seat. Jeremy's been focused on this step up the Buffalo ladder for months, but it might not be as easy as he thinks to keep up with his rivals. And uh, if you smell fuel, fumes in the cabin, what might be another good idea to do? Turn off cabin lighting. Is using switches a good idea when you've got fumes? You Just open the vents. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to know your your emergency calls, all of your emergency procedures. Right. You have to know number of exits for number of people. You have to know just weird, inane crap. I'm so confused. Jeremy's starting to realize how far behind the other two he actually is. Sure. Downstairs in the office, the meeting to sort out the C-46 flight crew is over. Joe had thought about it overnight and had come to the conclusion that the two-captain idea was not good. Uh, definitely Joe was pressured to only send Devin when he wanted to send just Len and Devin together. Oh, Joe and I get along pretty good. I just tell him my opinion. That's me. I don't say it in a brash or rude way. I just get my point across, and he gets his across first. Joe understands that a united crew is essential, so Devin is made captain, and Scott is now co-pilot on the Ontario job. And Gislan is going home. I think it's Gislan, but he hasn't flown the damn thing in seven months. I know how rusty I am on it after you know a couple of weeks. Like I wouldn't feel comfortable with Gislan being in control. It's all settled. A few final touches to the ice shield, and the C-46 is ready to fly. So now we can load this pig and, I guess, hit the road. The crew needs a rampy to prep the plane. Since Jeremy is the last one into the flight attending course, he's the first one pulled out to help on the ramp. I'm enjoying myself with the Frost Fighter. Warming up the 46, getting them ready to getting it ready to maybe go to Ontario with any luck. Ontario would be nice. Apparently Ontario's warm. But warm isn't a good thing. Not when the landing strip is made of ice. It's the end of the line for Arnie, Justin, and Corey in the CL215 water bomber. They're about to complete the final leg of their 12,000 kilometer journey from Red Deer, Alberta to Ankara, Turkey. On the tarmac, Turkish aviation officials await the arrival of their new plane. Oh, it is. First amphibic aircraft to Turkey. Charlie, November 4th, you may continue to step 205 in April 4th. Can you get that figured out? Uh, I don't even know what he said. Cool, man. We're here. How was it? Awesome, man. Good trip. Great trip. Welcome to Turkey. Hi. Oh, nice to meet you, Arnie. <laughs> You can tell hey, they're quite excited about these airplanes. Eh? It's a good boat, it's not a very good airplane. Hi, how are you? Good, finally here. I mean, we look probably like a bunch of rednecks getting out of our, our flying boat, but uh, yeah, they, uh, they take it pretty seriously around here. After a 1,600 kilometer flight from Malta, the crew could use a rest, but the Turks have more business on the agenda. Good evening. Yes, eight pilots. And uh, I think it's about, it takes about uh, one month or something like that. Uh, no, we're going to do it. I prefer to do it a lot quicker than that because I have to be back to train our guys. <laughs> <laughs> the delays getting to Turkey have messed with the schedule. 
As soon as Arnie and Justin finish training the Turkish pilots, Buffalo needs them back in Yellowknife to train water bomber pilots for their fire season. Once we get the other airplane here, then everything will be good. So once they show up, then. But they won't be showing up anytime soon. Even if I put that governor on the governance, we still have to put it underneath load. That's all we can do. And then you're going to have another new governor on the right engine. Yeah. They're waiting for a replacement propeller governor that's been sent from Yellowknife. It's a lot of work, right? That's all. But it's stuck in customs on the Portuguese mainland. Coming up, Justin is pulled out of Turkey. Ready to go to Ontario now? Let's get going. To come to the rescue in northern Ontario. In Yellowknife, Buffalo Airways C-46 crew is finally heading off on a major contract to haul equipment for a mining company in northern Ontario. But co-pilot Scott Blue has just learned that their load has nearly doubled. Original job was for 350,000 pounds. Um, with a limited time frame, we can only go into the ice road as uh, our ice strip is melted. So now we're up to 600,000 pounds. So. The C-46 has a maximum hauling capacity of 14,000 pounds. To complete the job, it will have to make more than 40 trips between Geraldton, Ontario and the mining camp with the ice landing strip. We had a big longer time frame we could do it, but the time is running short, so we might be sending another plane. We have a, an airport that's disappearing by the day. Every day we don't fly, it's getting worse. Pretty clear. From a business standpoint and from a standpoint of getting the job done, two airplanes are better than one. So they're pulling a second plane, their backup DC-4, into service. We got to get two airplanes ready to go, maybe to Ontario. Another one of those last minute things that happens in Buffalo. And if the DC-4 also heads to Ontario, Jeremy Dow will lose his teacher. Flight attendant manager Dan Catoni is the DC-4 co-pilot. Well, if Dan leaves and ends the class, then I'm uh, kind of screwed for flight training for a bit. Without Dan, the class will be on hold, and Jeremy could lose his chance to graduate. Another speed bump on the road to his dream. I don't worry about roller coasters. I don't worry about getting too pissed off about anything. So it's just, well, OK, I was a little pissed off. Here comes Spanky. On the tarmac, C-46 oh, Captain Spanky. Devin Brooks is ready to fly the lead plane. Yeah, Dunkin Donuts. He won the popular vote over a more experienced flyer to captain this mission to northern Ontario. Now we're on our way to Thompson. First stop, get some fuel. Hope the weather gets better in Ontario. Hey, see you later. Better means colder. The ice strip he'll have to make repeated landings on is melting fast. Bye -bye. After two stressful, challenging days, Devin and Scott's real challenge is about to begin. 2,200 kilometers away on a narrow strip of thawing ice. Now, the focus turns to prepping the second plane for the job, the DC-4. The plane needs to follow the C-46 to Ontario as soon as possible. The two planes will share the workload and the ice strip landings before the rising temperature makes the job impossible. But there's just one problem. We don't have a cap. We have a co-pilot, which is Dan Tony, and a secondary co-pilot, which is Alex Wagner. The ideal DC-4 captain is over 8,000 kilometers away in Turkey. Hey, Justin's Mikey. Hey, what's happening, man? Hey, I'm just on the computer here. I'm supposed to get you uh, home as soon as possible. Justin, right now, is the highest time ice work guy we have with the DC-4. And uh, so we need him here. And we got to do whatever it takes to get him here. Um, it's going to be Ankara, Istanbul, Chicago, Edmonton. Yeah, you're trying to do the right, Jen. Justin's sudden departure leaves Arnie in the lurch. There's a lot of work to do, yeah. A lot of paperwork and a lot of training to do. The other water bomber crew is still stuck in the Azores, waiting for the replacement part to clear Portuguese customs. So Arnie has to begin training the Turkish pilots on his own. And then we'll just kind of repeat it again. And then we'll go to the airplane and look at it there and go over it there. Look what's 
But all Arnie can do is ground training. He hasn't received permission from Turkish authorities to fly yet. And the scoops are down here, and the, you know, that's a that switch inside the, they just go down and hydraulic the end. The Buffalo C-46, piloted by Devin Brooks and Scott Blue, along with engineer Adam Smith, arrives in the northern Ontario town of Geraldton. From here, they'll load the plane and begin shuttling supplies to a remote camp on a frozen lake that's melting fast. It's supposed to be beautiful up there, so try to get a couple trips in at least. Devin and Scott are used to making cargo runs. But neither of them have much experience landing on ice. First time I've gone as a co-pilot to land on a frozen lake. We wanted to get it done as soon as we could because it was starting to melt and starting to get warmer. You could feel it. Right now, the ice on the lake is just over three feet thick. But if the spring thaw melts it down more than a few inches, the fully loaded and fueled C-46 could crash right through. But even if the ice thickness holds, just two hours of warm spring sun will melt the top layer, creating a slippery film of water and a treacherous landing surface. But the landscape is dotted with lakes. As they get closer, the pilots get a better look. They spot the lake, but it's not as wide as they expected. And neither is the narrow landing strip. That lake's gonna go up quick, eh? Pretty f***ing thin. It's tiny. Uh, there's a slight bend in the runway. Not 100% straight. Okay, you're down four lines, two of our carbine's cold. Pressure's up there. Devin and Scott are about to slam the 47,000-pound C-46 down on just a few feet of ice. The only true test of whether the ice will hold. In northern Ontario, Captain Devin Brooks and co-pilot Scott Blue are about to land a fully loaded Buffalo Airways C-46 on a frozen lake. But they have no idea how thick the ice is and if it can hold the 47,000 pounds of vintage airplane. 6th strip, you need margin for error, you know what I mean? Like on the runway, and there was very little of that. Well, my wing is right on the edge. My, the tip of my wing is on the snowbank, like where it's high, but there's still snow about a third of the way out of the wing. Well, it looks to be the same all the way, eh? This thing sucks. Halfway around the world, Arnie Schrader is in a jam. Turkish authorities haven't cleared him to fly, so he hasn't logged a single hour of actual flight training with the Turkish water bomber pilots. 
So, instead of a cockpit, today he's in a waiting room with engineer Corey Dodd. Yeah, we need uh, permission from the navigation department of, uh, of Turkey just to commence uh, flight training. So that's what we're trying to get. I don't know how long that's going to take. They seem to take their time with it. So. Politics. So, while waiting for that permit to come through, Arnie and Corey take in the sights of Ankara. Golden arches. I like their flag. It's going to look pretty cool on the airplane. They're putting it on there right now, I think. Geraldton, Ontario, co-pilot Scott Blue and the rest of the C-46 crew wake up to another day of cargo shuttles and ice drip landings. Time to go. It's 6 a.m. Saturday morning. The is good. We're going to go fly our ass off today. Well, our schedule was get as many trips in and as many loads as we could do in a day. Dust till dawn if it was nice conditions. But with the ice runway melting on them, time is not on their side. But it's already starting to melt with just that sun on it. Yeah. Slick as shit right here, yeah. I can see it. Shit. Like yeah. Turn any engine any better. The ice strip is turning to slush. They don't know how much longer they can land here. The daily flight from Edmonton lands at the Yellowknife Airport. Bringing home Buffalo Captain Justin Simley from Turkey. He's crossed nine time zones to get here. This is the best part about going on the road is coming home, you know. But this homecoming will be brief. Ready to go to Ontario now? Let's get going. <laughs> Under Joe's orders, yeah. he has to get the DC-4 to Geraldton, Ontario right away. So jet lag Justin jumps right into the scramble to finish prepping the plane. Justin and his crew will join the C-46 shuttling mining supplies to a remote camp on a frozen lake. Watch the top! With the addition of the DC-4, Buffalo will now have a chance of getting the job done before the ice landing strip melts. But Justin's not so sure about the narrow runway. When you're working the ice this late in the season, if, you, if you've got no traction and you've got a runway that's got a turn in it, uh, you're off the side of it. But there's no turning back now. It's a good thing Justin's DC-4 is on the way. Because there's a serious problem in Northern Ontario. The C-46 is out of commission. The left wing tip was dented during an ice strip landing. In a local hangar, engineer Adam Smith is making a speedy repair. We cut the old piece out and we're riveting it into a new piece. Because all the cracks in there are not exactly good. Luckily, the old Warbird was built to take a beating. But the accident is going to cause big trouble for the plane's captain, Devin Brooks. The mining company that contracted Buffalo on this job has seen the wing damage. Mining companies uh, in the 21st century are a new breed. They are extremely safety oriented. And they've called Buffalo Joe to complain. I want you to move so far. So we're only half done. I guess we screwed up a little bit down there. Maybe I didn't report it to the right person. And the person I reported it to didn't report it up the, up the ladder either. It just got blown out of proportion. Whether it's been blown out of proportion or not, Joe's been caught completely off guard. The job's gone side, uh, sideways on me. Shit happens. I can't help it. I wasn't here. I wasn't there. The upsetting part was trying to get the proper information. 
you know, we're getting the information secondhand and backward. Okay, who wants it replaced? The client is so upset, they want Joe to send out a new pilot. Right now, he's mad at everybody. He's mad at the pilots of the C-46, everybody down to the person filling it with gas. And this report just came through on the facts. But one fact is clear. No matter how many people share the blame, in Joe's eyes, only one bears responsibility. It's the captain that has to report it, right? We and Devin and Adam and the co-pilots and the other captain all sat in that room up there with me with all the reasons why Devin should do it and the Frenchman shouldn't. Everybody had their say. He's got to get that job done because he put himself in that position by saying he was the best to do it. I could fire him, which, which you're probably going to have. That night, Justin's DC-4 hits the runway in Geraldton. I was turkey. Delightful. Devin's relieved that reinforcements have arrived, but he's completely unaware that back in Yellowknife, Buffalo Joe is calling for his head. Coming up, Mikey stands up to Joe. Just one little thing, and you can say we're all useless. But is it enough to save Devin's job? Another tense day at Buffalo. It's exam time. Rampy's Audrey Marchand and Wilf Dar have completed the flight attending course. Now they're writing the final exam. While Jeremy Dow, in Yellowknife for the day, is stuck working the ramp. It's certainly an imperfect situation. I'd like to have the opportunity to be keeping up with them. Uh, it's too late now and it's gonna be pretty darn tough to, to keep up if I'm not in Yellowknife. Despite seniority, he's become the low rampy on the Buffalo totem pole. Well, I have to go back down to uh, Hay River tonight because uh, one of the guys, Dwayne, is uh, taking a few days off for uh, medical reasons, so I'm going to be covering for him, so I can't stay here. Being based in Hay River is clearly not working for Jeremy. He'll have to seriously consider a permanent move to Yellowknife if he has any hope of catching up to his rivals. Meanwhile, in the hangar, mechanics prep the Beechcraft Baron. The Baron will fetch C-46 Captain Devin Brooks from Northern Ontario. After damaging a wingtip, the client wants him off the job. General Manager Mikey McBrien has to break the news to Devin. Hey Devin, it's Mikey. Hey man. Hey, uh, did, did anybody tell you the Baron's coming? I have to sympathize with the customer. And if the customer wants something done, um, we just do it. If they want yeah, keep cabins updated. replaced, you just do it. But. Okay, cool. So that was Devin. He understands and that we're replacing them. It's kind of hard to see. I know these guys on a personal level. Sometimes I wish I didn't. I wish, uh, wish I had uh, a different uh, different relationship with them because it's hard, uh, this stuff. But we got to uh, yeah, keep everybody happy. One person who's happy is Rampy Wilf Dar. He's just finished writing his flight attendant exam and is getting a chance to fly today. Being airborne makes me very happy. I start to smile like an idiot. Wilf has hundreds of hours flying small aircraft and is co-piloting the Baron. The twin-engine plane is taking C-46 Captain A.J. DeCoes to Geraldton. A.J. is replacing Devin Brooks, who will return to Yellowknife in the Baron. No one at Buffalo knows what Joe will do when Devin comes back. Yeah, well, you know, accidents have happened before, man. I don't understand why this is such a nightmare. In Buffalo's cargo terminal, People Devin's talk. girlfriend, Janelle Glenn, is upset. That's craziness. I just talked to Devin, Devin said it's not a big deal. You know, and then all of a sudden, oh, he could be losing his license over this one, and we'll be surprised if he has a job over this one. I guess it comes with the territory, <laughs> but I think it's horseshit, personally. And the fallout from Devin's accident is complicating things even more. Janelle's boss, Kelly Jurasevic, was counting on Captain A.J. DeCoast to fly a food delivery up the Mackenzie Valley. My 48 hours is up tomorrow. I have to get them their food. 
Now, AJ's gone, and there's no other C-46 captain available. So, I don't know what the hell we're gonna do here. I guess we gotta hope and see. I gotta do it, do it now. Buffalo Joe's still on edge over Devin and the damaged wingtip. Now, he has to deal with this latest problem. It's not an extraordinary situation. What's extraordinary about it? Joe's coming down hard on Mikey and Kelly, insisting the food shipment should have gone out before AJ left for Ontario. So we knew about this 44 hours ago. And now we gotta do it because we're out over 48 hours. See what I mean? He tends to point people out and, and focus all his negative energy in one source, and uh, I don't believe that's right. I don't think that we should be in shit for anything. A lot of times, He's mad about other things, and he kind of takes it on people, and uh, I don't think that is fair either. But there's more weighing on Kelly than getting food up the valley. Just worried about Devin. I know we'll get the food up to the communities, but I'm concerned about Devin. Because he's, you know, he works so hard for Buffalo. And, you know, he doesn't want to lose his job. In Geraldton, a worried Devon makes a long-distance call to Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader in Turkey. Oh, it just hit the tip. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's all. Why are they getting so uptight? Oh, I wouldn't worry about that too much. That's Yellowknife making a mountain out of a molehill. Eh? That's exactly Devon's concern. He knows Joe has a tendency to overreact. Back in Yellowknife, Mikey takes a stand. He wants his father to think about the way he treats his staff before he confronts Devin tomorrow. Standing up to me is pretty intimidating, uh, as you can imagine. All the things that we do, all the time, that we do, and it's the one little thing, and you can say we're all useless. And what I said is basically quit folks on negative and actually give a little bit of positive back. I would just love for one time to say, hey, you didn't f up on this. It was kind of good. Basically, I think he was taken back by that a little bit and actually gave him a chance to step back and, and think about what happened. Joe's got the night to let Mikey's words sink in. And Devin has a long flight home to think about his future. Morning in Yellowknife. C-46 Captain Devin Brooks returns to face the music. Hey, did you hear me, Devin? Yeah. And Buffalo Joe. I didn't really know what he was going to do. And it was just the whole thing of the rumors going around. Well, he hit a tree with a wing tip. Yes, sir. There's procedures in place to follow up after. You know? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't like it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging either way. I'm not happy with the way it turned out. When Joe's angry, uh, you better watch out. Unless you're dead perfect, you're gonna, you're gonna get it for sure. Find out how we can best handle this and prevent it from happening again. And if it does, Mikey's words seem to have hit home. He tips off. Well, what do you think? Yep. Go fly your miles and, and don't worry about it. Okay. We'll Joe lets Devin off the hook. I believe the end result talked that he, he gave Devin a little bit more slack. Um, and, and actually kind of put himself in Devin's shoes for a while. Hey, I've been wingtips too, and I, I've been in situations. I mean, the situation Devin was in, I'd been there myself before, so I knew. Don't worry about it. It surprised me that he was nice about it. Yes, we dinged the wing, but he was pretty calm, and I was flying that day. Nine o'clock, gotta get going. Joe's sending Devin right back into his C-46 to make Kelly's food delivery up the valley in the nick of time. I don't know if Devin deserved the break, but he got it. A week later, the DC-4 piloted by Captain Justin Simley returns from Ontario. C-46, with A.J. DeCoast at the controls, follows close behind. The 
two crews finished up the job, making a total of 35 runs between Geraldton and the ice strip. An amazing feat. And since his talk with Mikey, one that even Joe has to acknowledge. Looking at the tonnage, the days, the conditions you worked under, the size of your loads, um, it was a remarkable job physically. You know, feel good he did a great job, all of you. Yeah, I, I truly believe that I made him think over the situation. We send you guys out what I believe very, very half clocked, unprepared. And this was my mistake because I was so wound up trying to figure out the ice conditions who was going to fly the airplane. Joe just might be turning over a whole new leaf. But on the other hand, that's just a short-lived thing. It'll be something next week. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, Rampy Jeremy Dow gets into the cockpit of a DC-4. They're gonna do a landing. And has to land the big plane for the first time. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader hits the water in Turkey. And the other water bomber hits the tarmac. On this episode of Ice Pilots NWT, a water bomber engine springs an oil leak over Turkey. They look at this as just normal. No, it's not normal. Trainee pilots get put to the test. Right. Pull back to my Chief right. pilot Arnie Schrader hits the water. Get right like that. And the other water bomber hits the tarmac. A military base on the outskirts of Ankara, Turkey. A Buffalo Airways CL-215 water bomber is getting rebranded by its new owners, the Turkish government. That's a big balloon. It took Buffalo Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader six weeks to bring this $2 million water bomber to Turkey. But the only thing getting up in the air today is a hot air balloon. <laughs> trying to get me in there. Yeah. Arnie is still waiting for official government permission to fly training runs in the CL-215. Anything about balloons? I think I'll stick with aircraft, you know, with the engines. <laughs> Buffalo mechanic Corey Dodd is also trying to pass the time and blow off steam after nearly two weeks of waiting at the base. Well, today we started off with a 10 o'clock workout, and now we're on the way to the, uh, I think it's the 12 o'clock uh, bacteria fest. <laughs> so we'll see what they offer us today. I imagine it'll be uh, one of three things, sheep, sheep, or sheep. Corey joins Arnie in the military base cafeteria. I don't know what the hell that is. Sheep in a sheep in a pickle. Not bad. Almost <laughs> After lunch, Corey checks out the water bomber parts that have just arrived from Canada. Getting the Turks up to speed isn't going to be simple. One jack for two airplanes. Things get lost in translation. Paperwork. What? Just records, like documents. Mistakes can easily be made. This one here we'll have to take out to the airplane. Air cut off side, uh, left side. There is a, there is a uh, small uh, plug. That's yes. for the foam and ah, the pressure. So it's okay. We change the valves and the pump will suck. Ah. Uh, same pump? Yep. I'll show you. Uh, As you can see, there's a bit of a language barrier. This is one big adventure. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Corey supervises the tank installation on board the CL215. This tank holds fire retardant foam spray. The tank is ready to go. But for now, that's as far as things will get. Corey and Arnie are in permit limbo, tangled up in government red tape. Meanwhile, on Santa Maria, an Azorian island in the Atlantic, 
Buffalo's other water bomber bound for Turkey is getting set to take off. It's windy here today. Pilots George Fury and Dave Poole have been stranded here after a hairy emergency landing two weeks ago. They tried to leave, but encountered an engine overspeed problem. Six. We got an overspeed. They turned around and shut down the engine, making it back to Santa Maria. Then, they were stuck there waiting for the engine to be repaired. Now, as they leave this island once again, it's all systems go. Or so they hope. Okay, you just hold on Henny and I'll just punch her in. They're headed for their first stop, mainland Portugal. In Yellowknife, Rod and Mikey McBrien are tracking the water bomber's course over the Atlantic. Now we can see that they're doing fine, they're going fast, they got a good wind. There's, they've maintained 9,000 feet now for four hours, so we know it's running good, simple. It's not long before George and Dave begin their approach to Lisbon, Portugal. There she is. This is TXB, and it just did the uh, last oceanic flight, which was from the Azores to Portugal. Tomorrow they're going to Spain, hang out in Spain for a day, and then make their way to Turkey. Just outside on the tarmac, the daily Buffalo Sked flight arrives from Hay River. Rampy Jeremy Dow is on board. He's come to Yellowknife to work for the day. I forgot, forgot to tell Yellowknife that it was spring. It's 15, no freaking two. As Jeremy curses the cold, his rampy rival Wilf Dar is pulling out all the stops. Today, he's making his debut as the Sked's flight attendant, and he's sprucing up for the occasion. Now what have I done? If Wilf's gambit works, he'll jump ahead of Jeremy, get his flying skills checked out, and move up the ladder to the co-pilot seat. It's always a competition between rampies as to who gets picked for a checkout. The sooner the checkout, the more flying you do, and the faster you progress. Wilf is very keen, very eager, you know, very straight-edged. He is eager. Eager to please, eager to do whatever looks good, so be it. Wilf wastes no time taking charge behind the ticket counter. Wilf, I just saw him, he was wearing a shirt and tie, eh? You, you gotta be shitting me. Like, he didn't actually, he's actually wearing a shirt and tie. Oh yeah. Oh. A shirt and tie. Jeez Louise. Can you give this to the lady back there? He's actually wearing a suit and tie. Uh, uh, you know, freaking Wilf wore a shirt and tie to his first day of uh, flight attendant this kid. Is that, that that must be a Buffalo first for sure? Probably gonna be a Buffalo last since he does it for two days. This is an appropriate level of dress for you know a commercial operation, and I don't think that uh, you know looking like a hobo is necessarily appropriate. I'm not hobos, hobo him. So your first uh, day flight attendant, what did you wear? Probably something like this. Maybe grubbier, I don't know. It's a dirty job, man. But Wilf is quick to point out that flight attending is a cut above working the ramp. I'm also not doing the same work as a rampy. Rampy. <laughs> oh, really? He's calling me a rampy now. <laughs> I intend to run it for all it's worth. Yeah, so just leave it like it is right now. As flight attendant, Wilf has to make sure all the passengers are present and accounted for. Here, but Jeremy throws his rival a curveball. He told a customer that she could run to Walmart and come back, and we'd hold the plane for her. And that's, and she hasn't paid a ticket, she hasn't nothing. Just, she did leave her ID here, which is even more confusing. Wilf had, uh, had a rather imperfect first day for a flight attendant. If I take it to the plane and she doesn't show, we're hosed. Yeah. If I don't take it to the plane and she hops on last minute, 
still hosed. All of a sudden you've got a really confused, stressed out, first time flight attendant. Joe's chomping at the bit to get in the air like he always is at 10 to 5. Is everybody, you need pre-boards? Uh, pre-boards already on. Come on, so get out. Don't be scared. Everybody was on board except this one passenger. She hasn't shown up yet. Her luggage is in the van if she's not on the plane. I sort of thought it was funny as hell. Whatever. <laughs> Minutes before the DC-3 is set to taxi out, Jeremy shows up with the missing passenger. Luggage ID. Rock on. And I got you covered. I got you covered. But Wilf is still flustered. Good evening, folks. Welcome aboard Buffalo Airways. Uh, this is my first flight, so if I mess anything up, please forgive me. I'd like to prepare for departure. Please ensure that your seat backs are locked in your upright position and your seat belts are fastened. Already messed up one thing. Flight attending is a step, but that's, no. Nah, being in the cockpit's the right place. But to reach that place and to catch up to his rival, Jeremy realizes he has to make the move out of Hay River and get closer to Buffalo HQ. Looks like I definitely have to get to Yellowknife. I really have to get this ball rolling to advance in the company. Eight thousand kilometers away in Turkey, Arnie Schrader has received some very good news. Thank God. I've been sitting here for 12 days waiting for permission. So I'm glad to get it started. With his flying permit approved, Arnie can now give his Turkish trainees their first lesson in a Canadian water bomber. Finally, after a long wait, it's time to fly. Arnie has the trainees touch down and then take off right away. A maneuver called touch and go, the best way to get them used to the airplane. Training day ends, the Turkish pilots are thrilled. Uh, it's very nice. One of Arnie's trainees named Cenk is delighted with his first experience piloting the 215. It can turn for sure. Yeah, it was awesome. Well, he's pretty, he's pretty experienced piloting. Yes. He's not gonna have any trouble with this. Very intelligent, eh? they all are. Kind of slewed around a little bit, you know, but it's pretty good. Hey. <laughs> Coming up, we have the, runway for Tango. the two water bomber crews reunite. Got it back. And hit more than just the water. Just a little shift right there. Out over the Mediterranean, water bomber pilots Dave Poole and George Fury are on their last leg to Turkey. Finally. At the military base outside Ankara. Corey and Arnie are tracking the other water bomber's progress using GPS satellite technology. They got up to the border of Tunisia here and they sent them straight back down to Malta, so there must be some war exercises or something going on there. They didn't give them clearance through uh, Tunisia. The plane is already over a week late to reach Turkey, and today's rerouting has caused further delays. They should arrive here somewhere. PM. We're going 169 knots. You haven't really started slowing down the land either. Yeah. If they're down around there, you know they're about to touch down. But 169, they still got some. In Yellowknife, Mikey and Scott Blue are also tracking George and Dave's water bomber as it approaches Ankara. And here they came down here and duped up here. Now they're in the mountains, so they stayed pretty high. And then and they just dropped off how much altitude. Yeah, they're only about 700 feet above, right? So they're really starting to slow it down, dropping the gear, starting to drop the flaps. Next time it updates, they'll be on the ground. There you go. You're done. We landed. Yay! Champagne! It's Friday. Let's get drunk at work. Screw it. At the Ankara airport, George, Dave, and engineers Matt Boulanger and Norm Byrne are finally setting foot in Turkey. Hello, hello. It's 
time for this trip to be over. But their journey isn't over yet. They're headed for the military base outside Ankara to join Arnie and Corey. Two hours. But to get there, they'll have to cut through some red tape. I guess we're waiting for some kind of permit to land after we already landed so we could take off to another airport. <laughs> after a few hours, they get the clearance they need thanks to Chink. He's showing up at the airport to translate and pave the way for their departure. It's been a long day. Uh, we take care of all the problems. We solve all of them. So we go on home base, finally. What's ground here? 121.9? Yeah, 121.9. It's only 20 minutes across Ankara to the base. But after flying all day, another flight is the last thing the pilots want. Oh, you need a cold beer, Rooster. Ah, head knock. All day. Confirmation, sir, is closed, sir. She's calling for confirmation. Say confirm. That's her. Yeah, we have the runway in sight for Tango X ray problem. Copy, sir. Continental protocol for its frequency. And now pull her nose up and get a bit of flat on. Look, Roger. We'll call you over the marker. Well, gear check. One, two, three, down. Yeah. Finally, they reach the base. Let's go. Good to see you, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> I made it. I made yes, it. finally. Hi. Jesus sent you all over today. I know, yesterday too. We ran into a lot of problems, so I mean, you can, you can accept, you know, I suppose you can expect some of that, but, but uh, we had too many delays really, so sort of catches up with you after a while. Arnie tries to cheer them up with his good news. Well, we just got approval to fly now. Really? Yeah. So just got their insurance straightened out and stuff. But George won't be sticking around to train the Turkish pilots. He has other commitments back home. I've been on the road now since uh, February the 11th. I think I deserve a break. Homeward bound for me. <laughs> Starting from the top. He's found a roommate, but now all Jeremy Dow has to find is an apartment in Yellowknife that they can afford. My name is Andrew. Um, I just moved up to Yellowknife, and I'm looking for a two or three guy apartment. Seems like a nice guy. He's from BC. Therefore, we have a bit in common there. Next one. Unfurnished condo. Andrew Vike was working the ramp in Hay River like Jeremy. And like Jeremy, he wants to be in Yellowknife where he has a shot at a pilot job. You can't be in Hay River and expect to fly like you want to. We need to rework in here. All the advantages are here. Just everything's here and nothing's in Hay River anymore. That doesn't help us. 1500 a month for a three bedroom. Ready? Yep. The only thing that isn't here is an affordable apartment. Prices are ridiculous here. Absolutely ridiculous. Well, they're like Vancouver, but without the Vancouver. Uh, immediately, as soon as possible. Oh, it's been rented. Thanks very much for your time. The Rampies strike out. But fortunately, there's an angel of mercy in Yellowknife. <laughs> Kelly Jurasevic. Thank you very much. Oh, no Buffalo's problem, cargo manager and resident mother hen. The kitchen is your guys' in the morning. Just get up. I got toast. There's eggs. There's whatever there you guys is. want. You guys make Kelly it. has been great to me. I didn't have a place for a couple days, and she insisted that I stay with her, which was more than kind it was it was great if you run out of toilet paper ass wipes in there i just put a fresh roll on kitchen's yours make yourself at home that's the way it is if you don't i'll be pissed deal deal okay when you guys get your place it's fine you gotta invite me over for a game of poker not bad the next day in turkey arnie and dave put the turkish training into overdrive it's the last phase of this $7 million sale of two Buffalo water bombers to the government of Turkey. Cenk is flying with Dave today to translate for the other trainees on board. Instruments, 
Okay. Arnie takes off with his trainees. Okay. Ready? Okay. Here's your rudder to keep it straight now. Yeah. Yeah. The two water bombers are heading for Izmir, a port city by the Aegean Sea 500 kilometers away. There, they can begin practical exercises scooping and dumping water. Ground 6 climb to flight level 170. Laps up? Yeah. After takeoff. Suddenly, en route, Dave's Turkish trainees spot trouble. An oil leak on the left engine. He says, they look at this, is this normal? So I took a look and I said, no, it's not normal. This could be trouble. You run out of oil, the engine is Dave will have to decide whether to land at the nearest airfield or try to make it to the runway in Izmir. After a string of delays, Captain Dave Poole is finally in Turkey training water bomber pilots. Oh, okay, we're up. Power on? Yeah. Everything looks good, so. But on his very first flight from Ankara to Izmir, a serious problem. An oil leak. So they say, look at this, is this normal? So I took a look and I said, no, it's not normal. Dave has to decide whether to find a place to land right away or push on another 150 kilometers to Izmir. We'll just keep an eye on the oil pressure if I have to oil feather it. Dave chooses to keep going, but can he reach Izmir before the engine overheats? Yeah, they changed the cylinder and it may be, I don't know. They'll look at it when we get out. Right there, right? The Izmir airstrip is in sight. Actually, I have control. Just tell my I have control because we're high on it. Get her down. Okay. With the engine bleeding oil, Dave throws the water bomber into a steep approach. Don't normally do this, uh, Jake, but because that oil, I don't want to burn out. By the time Dave puts the plane on the tarmac in Izmir, the engine has lost a lot of oil. Fixing a 2,000 pound engine on a remote airstrip isn't going to be easy for Corey. There's not a freaking stand or anything around here. These people are completely unprepared. It's actually getting quite uh, frustrating now. Oh, I gotta go talk to Mikey and Mike, see what they want done with me. He's only been in Yellowknife a few days, but Jeremy Dow is about to catch a break. A Buffalo DC-4 is scheduled for a freight run to Hay River. And Captain Justin Simley needs onboard crew. Jeremy is the rampy in the right place at the right time. You're there to assist the people in loading and unloading and whatnot, but really, you're there because you really want to fly, and with any luck, you're going to get a chance to do that while you're on that flight. We're all set, boys. All set. Sure enough, shortly after takeoff, Justin calls Jeremy into the cockpit. Where's the uh, seat adjust? It's just off to your right side. There's two handles. It'll be the uh, bottom one. 
I was hoping that I would get to fly during that flight. I didn't know if it was going to happen or not. I thought it might, and uh, lo and behold, it did work that way. Getting some stick time, getting to fly something like that, DC-4 straight out of school, that, that's awesome. And the only way you do that is by getting from Hay River to Yellowknife. It's requesting your latest, sir. We're inbound from uh, Yellowknife, 40 back, 3,500 feet. As they approach Hay River, Justin surprises Jeremy. They're going to do a landing. It was quite surprising to me, anyways, that he was going to let me land it. No, he's going to land. You think we learned to be pilots by pretending or what? That's how you train guys. you got to get them in the seat and uh, let them get the feel of the airplane. Here, take it into a pretty small airstrip and land it. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I hope you talk me through it. You're two miles from the threshold. A little low. Oh, coming on profile, actually. The DC-4 is in the hands of a 21-year-old rookie pilot. Five. This is Jeremy's big moment. All right, up and down. Selectors on the mains, cross streets are off, quantity checks, gear selectors up, landing weight checks, gear approach checklist complete. Roger. So a mile and a half from the threshold out of 500 feet, profile check, slowing through 100. Anything is heels on the floor, don't touch the brakes, okay? Roger. When you touch the brakes, we'll skid all the fucking main tires off, so don't do that to me. You got it. Look down the runway and make sure the airplane's straight. If it's not straight, it's gonna do some crazy shit. Jeremy, let's get on that center line. Come on, baby. Come on, down. In a matter of seconds, this novice flyer has to bring a massive four-engine aircraft down onto a runway for the first time. Bring it down now. Bring it down now. Okay, flare. 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 Right there. Just hold it. Bang on. That's money. Nothing to it. Good job, my man. Thanks. I don't know if you guys heard me talk about my shit-eating grin. Yeah, this is gonna be it. <laughs> oh, Jeremy did good, yeah. yeah. I was happy with the way he, uh, he flew well. It's good to get the guys that are working hard on the ramp some, you know, a little bit of stick time. That's what they come up here for, is to, to get into the seat and, and be a pilot. I'm happy that I was able to uh, perform well enough that people thought it, said it was a good landing and whatnot. After a success like this, there's no doubt in Jeremy's mind that he's made the right move. It was the right decision to make, getting up to Yellowknife, and immediately I saw the, the benefits and the rewards of doing so, and I was starting to fly. Coming up, a training flight skids to a calamitous end. Put all the off down. Oh, yeah, we put landing gear down. In Yellowknife, things are looking up for Buffalo Rampy's Jeremy Dow like and Andrew like, oh, Vike. Up and over. I would say watch your step, but I know you can't see anything. Andrew and I were able to find an apartment, but it was pretty darn expensive and it pretty much drained me financially. <laughs> this will be interesting. Yeah, this will be interesting. We're going to put it this way and right in that room. While unloading the few pieces of furniture they have, they're greeted by the neighbors. We're moving in. You guys suck. Not for free. <laughs> Scott Blue and Janelle Glenn share a place upstairs with Janelle's boyfriend, Buffalo Captain Devin Brooks. See you in a bit. Moving up to Yellowknife was a good thing for Jeremy. Oops. It's going to cost him more money, but at the end of the day, it's a necessary expense in his life to progress as a pilot. <sighs> nice. The next day at the Buffalo cargo terminal, Kelly and Janelle are on a mercy mission. Okay, we're off to the dump to shop for Jeremy. Kitchen chairs, presents, pots and pans, porn. <laughs> Everything's at the dump. Kelly and Janelle uh, took a drive over to, you know, the, the yellow knife shop for people starting up here, you know, which is the dump. We just like to go shopping. Shopping? <laughs> yeah. We have a sale on today for <laughs> t-shirts. Awesome, thanks. 
They just want chairs for poker, so. When I came up here, I was pretty lonely for my family, and Buffalo became my family. And these kids are the same way. Their families aren't here. Sometimes I think of the mother for them all. There is one kitchen chair. Yeah. Shoot, they don't have to match, do they? You sit on it, see if it works. Sit. We just thought we'd surprise them. It was great shit from the dump. Whatever. Load up this truck. What the f Where'd this shit come from? No names, no nothing. Surprise. I love it. Quickly get this shit in there before he sees us. Back at the Buffalo hangar, Kelly, Janelle, and Al load their found treasure into Jeremy's truck. Beer cooler. So you get to star today. They clear out just as Jeremy returns from a courier run. Other stuff in the back of my van. Hey. Neat. Andrew also notices Jeremy's packed truck. Where the hell did you find this stuff? I didn't. You're seeing where I just found it. Huh. I have cool friends somewhere. I need to go talk to them. Hey, Jack, did you have anything to do with that? Oh, I was part of it. I figured it was something to do with my great buddy Kelly there. Yeah. Kelly's like our mom. Thank you. It's awesome. It's like family here. Yeah, you guys rock. <laughs> I got friends in high places. In Izmir, Turkey, there may be one water bomber down for repair, but that still leaves one ready to fly. Arnie, how you doing? So Buffalo's chief pilot, Arnie Schrader, can do what he does best. Here comes the fun. We're going to the water put his trainees and the water bomber through their paces. Get up. Be careful when you're about to strain it. Throw it in hills. Fucking fly into it. Yeah, go and then I can do it. The Turkish trainees are all experienced pilots, but skimming the 215 along a lake will be a new experience. Kind of go like this. Bring your boat down, on the light, behind the doors, and you're ready. You carry that thing so you memorize that. Okay. Then you give me 1524. Okay. When they hit the lake, the water will enter through a pair of shoebox-sized openings on the underside of the aircraft. It then passes into two 2,700-liter tanks located on either side of the fuselage. Any overflow drains via the outlets at the top. Once the plane lifts off, the intake closes and the belly doors are ready to open to release the water. Try right, going get your speed too high, but... Yeah. That's right. Ah, uh, your ball's out of the center there, buddy. Yeah. No good work work here. It's good, eh? I want you to get the attitude, eh? Oh, tell me the attitude is about like that, eh? Speed's good. You got 110 on there. You got to get down to about 80. Draw the back. Okay, right, there's, right. there's the attitude. Oh, okay. come. Okay, no power. Oh, oh, don't pull back too much. Right there, you just hold it down. Oh, the unique hull design allows the CL215 to sit five feet deep and skim along the water. When skimming, the aircraft maintains a speed of about 150 kilometers an hour, scooping an incredible 5,400 liters of surface water. Here comes the rope. Oh, it's gonna go up. Check it slightly. All right, set. Rope's up. Rope's up. Hey, there's your 80. You're passing and you can tug it out of the water. After a bumpy ride, they lift off the lake with an additional 10,000 pounds of water in the tanks. Is arm? Yep. Okay. Set. Up. 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 There you go. Take your hands, brother. Oh, you're the pilot. 
That was fun, eh? yeah. <laughs> Now that they've had their first taste of what the CL215 can do, Chank and the other trainees are eager to master this new aircraft. But not every training flight is going to go this well. Water bomber flight training has finally started in Turkey. But the steady stream of problems combined with extended delays have pushed engineer Cory Dodd to the end of his rope. I'll be happy when we arrive back on Canadian soil. Hopefully next week. Should be there. Drink Canadian beer. Cory managed to repair an engine oil leak under difficult conditions. They didn't have a forklift or anything and we had a major oil leak on this engine which we fixed. We would use the fuel truck as a work stand, which is kind of a pain in the ass, but, well. With the leak fixed, the water bomber is ready to fly. All the way up, already. Yeah. Arnie and Corey look on as the Turkish trainee pilots practice runway touch and goes before heading to the water. The first Turkish trainee touches down perfectly. Another trainee takes the stick. He executes an excellent touch and go and raises the landing gear. As the 215 comes around, a third Turkish pilot takes over. From the tarmac, everything seems to be going fine. Arnie and Schenk warm up the other 215 for more training runs. But then, as the other plane descends towards the runway for one more touch and go, something is wrong. The landing gear is not down. The plane careens toward the end of the runway. At the last second, our cameraman scrambles for cover. As a last resort, the water bomber pilots throttle up to get back into the air. Everyone is stunned. What's up with our car? Like, they put landing gear down. Landing gear. Oh, right. Landing gear down. Fire, man. No one knows how badly damaged the plane is, or if it can make a safe landing when it comes back around. The crew lowers the wheels, but the hydraulics may have been damaged when the plane scraped along the runway. They do a flyby to get a visual confirmation from the ground. Give a thumbs up, gear is down. It's gonna be a great training for them. Oh. I didn't want that type of training. Chank is in radio contact with the Turkish pilots in the water bomber. They say it shows all down and locked right now. Okay, it looks... But I'll, I'll confirm that. They had no hydraulics? That's what they say. Oh. If the hydraulic lines are damaged, the gear could collapse under the weight of the plane when it touches down again. A crowd has gathered on the tarmac, waiting for the plane to land. We'll have to see what damage has been done to the hull. The damaged water bomber makes its final approach. Everyone holds their breath. Holds, but now there's a problem simply steering and stopping the plane. It's so bad that the nose of the plane rolls off the runway before coming to a halt. Can't steer it. No hydraulics. 
Oh yeah. There's a 10 foot gash in the bottom of the airplane. Yep. And hydraulic lines have been damaged as well. Yeah, we gotta tow it backwards. Oh no, we'll just keep everyone out of there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey. yeah Away from the door. Uh, okay. Doors open up. Kill you. It's a crushing blow for the Buffalo crew. The Turkish trainee pilots are dumbfounded. He's open up. As Corey and Norm assess the damage. Okay. See the daylight. Yeah, that, this is a bad yeah, that's sign. Not, uh, that's not normal. Yeah, no picture of this. Corey jumps into the cockpit to try and figure out what happened. Yeah. If you get in the airplane right after, you need to tell what wasn't done properly. Since the gear worked, this could be a clear case of pilot error. Someone will have to report the whole incident to Buffalo Joe. Oh my god, you don't even want to know what Joe's going to do. <laughs> Coming up, Corey calls Joe. How are you doing? Not very good. Yeah, it's Corey Dodd now. We had a bit of an incident this morning. It's a, it's a pretty bad one. It was the most shocking landing in Buffalo Airways history. A few hours later, engineers Corey Dodd and Norm Byrne wait until it's morning back in Yellowknife to give Joe the bad news. What time is it there? 8.30. Corey makes the call. It's a call you never really want to make. How you doing? Yeah, it's Corey Dodd now. We had a bit of an incident this morning. It's a, it's a pretty bad one. They took out TXB, they did a uh, couple circuits. On their third circuit, they came around. And they landed gear up. That's a sick feeling in the old gut, man. When you see the gear up and you can't do anything, you can't do anything about it. There's a long ways between a hydraulic leak and a gear handle not being put down. Despite his fiery temper, when Joe faces a crisis, he's cool as a cucumber. See, Joe under pressure is really good. He's really a smooth thinker, he's really, uh, that's when he's at his best. All right. Still, Joe's disappointment is obvious. That is a kindergarten of flying. If you're going to launch your boat, be sure it's in the water. You know, or if, 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 if you're going to ride a train, make sure there's a railroad track going that way. But if, if you're going to land an airplane, make sure your goddamn wheels are down. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's pissed. I mean, I'd be too, but, you know, he wasn't freaking out or anything, so I mean, nothing he can do there, nothing we can do here. Just. You know, move forward. Back in the Buffalo hangar, the brothers McBrien crawl under a 215 to get an idea of the damage. This part is wore down, just basically because, I mean, the runway is a huge piece of sandpaper and their planes at 30 whatever plus thousand pounds. They have to drag it 2,000 feet down this piece of sandpaper. In the aviation world, maintenance guys tend to bond with their planes. For Rod, seeing the actual pictures of the ripped up water bomber hull really hurts. Why does it hurt the most? Because the time investment and the stupidity of the incident. Well, Rod's pretty upset. Um, Rod's under, he feels the pain for everybody. Why is it all open like that? Because that's where the off? skin was. Did they take the skin off or that's No, it ground off. off. Oh. Nothing got ripped off. Ground down to nothing. The CL 215s are equipped with a fail safe system to prevent this kind of mistake. I'll tell you what, you should have heard. Yeah. <laughs> Long before you got to the runway. Joe's take is simple the pilots should have known something was wrong. Well, this airplane doesn't feel right, I gotta be missing something. 
This is before the bells and the whistles and the horns and all the audio displays and all that bullshit. It's in your feet and in your ass and in your arms. She's down for a while. The deal was to deliver two water bombers to Turkey and train pilots for the start of their fire season. Now, with the fire season just weeks away, there's only one working plane. So Joe gets on the phone. Yeah, I just want to talk to you before I talk to the turkeys to see which airplane it is. Which one's ready to go first? He brokers a deal to get another water bomber to Turkey right away. We got another airplane ready to, to meet their, their, their deadline time. A stopgap measure to keep the program moving forward. But it'll be a few months before this plane flies again. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, hooray, hooray. the Electra gets caught in a whiteout. We're flying blind. Joe's on the rampage. I want that cheap bottle of my office right now. I'm not anybody around Joe. Okay? And someone's going to walk. The rumors are starting. I do not give a shit. This episode of Ice Pilots and WT. I hear about it once more. Tempers boil over as Buffalo readies the Electra for a big job. I want the chief pilot in my office right now. Jeremy's flying chops get put to the test in front of the boss. Giant pile of stress. And the Electra flight crew gets lost in a whiteout north of the Arctic Circle. We're flying blind. Oh, ah. returns from his stint in Turkey. He's happy to be home and see his wife Janet again. But it's back to work immediately. <laughs> Buffalo has landed a hefty contract. They need to haul diesel fuel to remote locations in Nunavut. The plane for a job this size is the turboprop Electra. It's the only one available that can do that kind of work in those kind of strips. Yeah, they're gravel airstrips, so it's got to be a, a gravel equipped airplane. But the Electra isn't ready to go yet. I'm going to hook this up. Chief Mechanic Chuck Adams is finishing work on the APU. APU stands for Auxiliary Power Unit, which is AC power and air to get the Thing started. It's just to get it running. The APU gives the Electra the jump start it needs to power its systems. Designed this in my head. So if I die, they're The APU is loaded onto the Electra. That there, got to go on to that. 115 volts, 400 cycles though. To plug a vacuum cleaner into this, take off like a UFO, eh? I've seen it done. Next, installing the tanks. Bang it up, Mr. Hare. The Electra can carry a maximum of 12,000 liters of fuel in three onboard tanks. The contract calls for over 400,000 liters to be delivered to stations along the dew line. The dew line, or distant early warning line, was a system of long range radar stations set up during the Cold War. Starting at the northernmost tip of Alaska, it would stretch 3,000 miles across the continent to Baffin Island, opposite Greenland. The stations were designed to detect incoming missiles or planes from the Soviet Union, but that threat never appeared. By the 90s, many stations had been closed, leaving an environmental mess. Extensive cleanups are now in progress, and that's where Buffalo comes in. 
we were taking them uh, diesel fuel, fuel oil, to run their earth moving equipment where, where they're uh, digging up the contaminated soil. They're also digging holes and burying the garbage. And they also have a lot of heavy equipment to dismantle the buildings and the radar sites. The fuel haul contract will take weeks to complete. We got a big job. We got like a you know half million dollar job. We got to get done. One of the flight engineers prepping the Electra for this mission is Juan Tresher. I call him the flight engineer extraordinaire. Hey, okay? flight engineer extraordinaire, that guy. Since the Electra will have to make many landings on gravel strips, the tires and brakes must be in peak condition. Well, we're going to change this brake package. It's worn out. We run out of pedal. It's bad. You're in the aircraft industry. You're not there because you want a job. You're there because you like to work on airplanes or fly airplanes or be around airplanes. Juan came to Buffalo to work on the Electra, but in the year and a half he's been here, he's only flown once. I came here because I like to fly and I like Electras. Juan's wife is Kelly Jurasevic, Buffalo's cargo manager. He hasn't been flying at all. He's just been wrenching. So, well, he needs some mileage. And he's depending on that, you know, shit, that's what he's hired for. At home, Kelly and Juan take care of others in the Buffalo family. He has no money, I'm worried about. I know. He's got nothing in there. No furniture, no shit, no food, and he's got those kids. It's, um, go over and help him out or something. Kelly's like a mother hen here, but she and Juan are far away from their own kids in Calgary. I have great kids, and I have an awesome granddaughter that means everything to me. How's my granddaughter? I'll let her say hi to Grandpa, see if she'll say hi to him. Hi. How you doing, Sophia? Yeah, we're going to come down. We'll come down and see you soon. Can you see ABCs yet? They never expected to be away from family so long. <laughs> the good, good job. But the promise of flying in the Electra has That's kept Juan good. at Buffalo. This fuel haul contract is his big chance to get off the ground and into the air as the Electra flight engineer. Electra flight engineers earn additional pay when they fly, $3,000 extra for this contract. There is no story yet. What, you know what you're going? Not yet. I got groceries though. Check out this feed bag. If he gets the green light, Juan will be ready to go. Right now, actually, the, the crew itself is still unknown uh, who's really going. It's up to Buffalo Joe to make that decision. A meeting has been called to go over the plans for this half million dollar job. And there's just some information for you guys. Yeah. Hey, what up? Back from Turkey, Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader joins Joe and the crew. So I made a deal with the client, safety first. Now, if the client says, come here, have a look, then the client pays. All go to your captain. All right. Final say. The Electra pilots are Captain Brian Harrison and co-pilot Sean Barry. Anything to do with maintenance, truck, go to run. So that's the way that's going to work. The other way it's going to work. And then Joe drops a bomb. On this airplane, I'm going to send one flight engineer, not two. And that will either be Juan or the only other Electra flight engineer, Czech immigrant Luby Lobos. So my decision to, to send uh, Luby, I'm holding Juan behind. Juan was counting on being a flight engineer on this electric contract. Now his pride and his wallet have taken a hit. Whatever, I'm sick of this place. I'm sick of this. Coming up. Well, at least rumors. Rumors throw the Buffalo staff into turmoil. The politic and and gossipy cause me problems. And Joe tries to put a stop to it. Shut those hanger doors right now. They should have to come in here on Sundays, too. What did we do that time? 70,000 pounds. Me and you? Yeah. And then who got in shit? We got in shit for doing it. Yeah. Well, it had to be done. In the Buffalo Airways cargo terminal, Kelly Jurasevic is getting squeezed by management. So can we, like, figure out something that ramp has got to be here? Uh, see, this is where we got to sit down and write it all out, because it's very... 
Mikey is cracking down on her staffing like, levels. Like, say for a Sunday, who do you usually have? Yourself, Janelle, Gail, Uncle Jack, Al, and Steve? Oh, six, do you need six people for it? It's been working fine. But convincing Mikey isn't the issue. Kelly's worried about Joe. Because we don't have enough help. And then if I don't have enough help, then what am I supposed to do? Then I phone over there, oh, we don't have anybody. So then the plane's going to be late, and then your dad's going to bitch, why the f*** is the plane late? Well, because I don't have enough help. Why didn't you ask for help? I mean, this whole thing yeah. happens all the time. If the plane doesn't leave, like I said, till noon, do not blame us. Okay? Mm -hmm. If that works for you. And Kelly has more than her staff problems on her mind. Her husband, flight engineer Juan Tresher, has been told that he's not part of the electric crew on the fuel shuttle to Nunavut. Instead, Luby Lobos from the Czech Republic will be the flight engineer. And that's a lot of money out of Juan's pocket. He was hired here to fly that aircraft. And, you know, it's bullshit that he's not on the, on the frickin' plane. Everybody's pissed about it. Yo, Juan's... Uh, I thought, dude, I was happy taking both of them. So one can do a little bit and the other can do a little bit. People around the hangar are criticizing Joe's decision. He wants to send four and everyone else is trying to push for five, which makes him really mad. Your politic and, and, and Gosby and Gosby problems. Well, how would I know who's qualified and who the is Yeah, you would. I have no idea. I'm not on this side. Joe thinks that Kelly and Arnie are the source of the gossip. So right now, we'll, uh, we'll can the bullshit right now. Those that don't like it can go on the bus. You see both of you guys? Well, these rumors, they start. And there's all kinds of shit goes on over nothing. We put a crew together and sent it out. Okay, we had a bit of a kerfluffle about because there is some friction in this company because Luby's on the airplane. That crew going out was my decision. If you guys want to gossip bullshit? Gossip all you want about who should be on the airplane, who shouldn't, I can give a shit. If it doesn't stop, I hear about it once more. Joe hopes he's finally stopped the gossip. Let's stop the bullshit and get the job done. All right, just get out of your mouth. So it's back to work getting the Electra ready to go. Captain Brian Harrison and mechanic Chuck Adams make final preparations. All you have to do is just check the tire pressure style and everything. Yeah, and we're done. Okay, let's try and get ready here in the next little while, and then we're, uh, then we're just waiting for Joel. But there's a sudden snag, a rumor that Luby may not have the necessary work papers to be on the flight. So, Luby's going home? Is that what I hear? What? You never know what's going on here, Dave, Dave. We do a ride on. On Luby? Like, is he certified? I have no idea. If Luby's papers aren't in order, Juan might get on the flight after all. Well, see, right now they're saying Luby's not certified. Who's saying that? Who's they? Juan brought it up to me. Shut those f***ing hangar doors right now. Okay, and we'll straight over right now. I'm not putting up with this bullshit. Huh? Joe has had enough of the rumors. I want that cheap part of my office right now. Oh, I'll find him for you. Oh, yeah, you'll find him. As Buffalo's chief pilot, Arnie is ultimately responsible for all flight crews, including making sure the work papers are up to date. Why is this crew not ready to go? You're the chief pilot. want a f***ing job done. Luby is not ready to go. Why isn't he ready to go? Can okay. If we had to toss too much, you guys, you guys, you guys go sort it out because I'm shutting it down. Everybody get on the airplane, so I'm gonna go home. Let's talk to Debbie and see what has to be done. Everyone waits for the brass to get to the bottom of things. Bullshit, man. See? Funny games, eh? Arnie and Electric Captain Brian Harrison meet with Buffalo Administrator Debbie McGuire in the he's office. No, he's all legal. He's got a work permit. He's got everything. There's no reason he can't go. I'm not the one causing the fuss, Arnie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the job's back on. We're going? Yeah. 
Luby's on the plane, while Juan's left on the tarmac. It can't be easy seeing the Electra off, and with it, $3,000 in additional wages Juan was counting on. The Electra leaves Yellowknife for Hall Beach, 1,600 kilometers away. From there, they'll shuttle fuel to the Dew Line stations. Cruising along at 600 kilometers an hour, the Electra is the most advanced aircraft in Buffalo's fleet. This turboprop plane demands a lot from her pilots. They got a little bit more on their hands. It's faster, it's pressurized, flying higher, a lot more complicated prop system and everything else. Prop 78, please. We're not far from the airport, so. Yeah, there's open water. Yeah. I didn't realize there was. I thought it'd still be frozen. Yeah. You got the rest, you got the strip of sight. Yeah, I'm just. Bye. The Electra is also the only Buffalo aircraft with a ground proximity warning system. 100 which kicks in as the plane approaches the Hall Beach landing strip. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Over here, Hall Beach was established in 1957 when the Dew Line Station opened here. The updated radar site is now part of the North Warning System. Other than the workers stationed here, the majority of the 700 residents of Hall Beach are Inuit, making it one of the most traditional towns in Nunavut. At the airstrip, it's time to start the fuel shuttle. Put 4,000 liters in the middle tank, shut it off, and then we'll put 3,500 in the back tank. From here, the Buffalo crew will fill the empty tanks on board the Electra and begin transporting fuel to stations up the dew line. Beautiful. It's like a more dark. Man, my goodness. Working? Yeah. Oh, yeah, everything's ready to go with the town. Man, you think y'all nice to relax. This, this place puts a machine. We got drive in movies. You see them down there, drive in theaters. <laughs> The tanks are filled with a total of 12,000 liters of fuel. Everybody's on board? The Electra is ready to make the first of many fuel deliveries. Turn the on, please. They tell me that the weather's good. They're not actual weather reporters over there. We don't have any people that can give us real, a real official observation. So, But they say the weather's good, it's flyable. They know what we need to, uh, to get in there. They're headed to Makar Inlet, a dew line station 190 kilometers away. The crew was expecting clear skies. But it's not long before the Electra is enveloped in a blinding whiteout. The clouds white, the sides are white, the ground's white, everything's white. Good down to 1200 or so now. Sure speed. Like you can't see anything. It's a, like you're flying around in a bowl of milk. You don't know if you're going up, going down. Still looking for it. The Electra's instruments indicate that they're approaching the Makar Inlet airstrip. But Brian and Sean struggled to find some visual reference. We kind of got disoriented there and didn't know where we were. They descend, hoping to punch through the fog. Suddenly, the Electra's warning system kicks in. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up, pull up. North of the Arctic Circle, 
Buffalo Airways Electra, piloted by Brian Harrison and Sean Berry, with engineers Luby Lobos and Chuck Adams on board, is caught in a whiteout. Flying blind. It's not easy work. Their instruments tell them they're descending to the airstrip in Makar Inlet, but they can't see a thing. Suddenly, an alarm Five, goes three, off. Three, three, three. Full, stop, full, stop. The Electra's ground proximity warning system three, alerts them three, to what they can't full, see. Stop. They're too close to the hills below. Captain Brian Harrison pulls back the yoke and throttles up. Steering clear of a near collision with the rugged Arctic terrain. As they clear the clouds, they search for any sign of the runway. Keep your eyes open, Sean. Line up tight, sir, Luby. Roger. We're landing with all the landing aids and other little runway lights. It's hard to find until you're right on it. Finally, they spot the right valley. I've got the strip. Flop 78. That's our distance, Sean. We are one line. Really nice. They can barely make out the gravel runway. 500. This is the ultimate in northern aviation. 50. Landing a 100,000 pound aircraft loaded with fuel on a short gravel strip in the middle of nowhere. 30. 20. 10. That's where the pilot earns his money. Let me assure you that. Brian earned his money there. I gotta clean this runway before I come back in here. These clowns here, they gotta mark this runway better, man. We don't know how wide this runway is. If it snows, we're fing doomed. I don't see a fing marking on this runway. No lead in, nothing. Brian's a little more diplomatic <laughs> with the guys running the camp. When you're coming in, the runway's very hard to see. Did you run the loader up and down? Or, or no, just pick up, pick up. Pick up. Yeah, maybe. With the loader, with the loader, you can. Yeah, maybe a few more times after we leave. You, you can do that a few more times after we leave. If visibility drops any further, Brian and the Electra crew won't be able to return. So you can see that the hills are actually starting to disappear here now, so it's uh, not a good sign. So they take off, quickly breaking through to sunny skies. It's back to Hall Beach to refill the onboard tanks and continue making fuel deliveries to other stations up the dew line. Back in Yellowknife, Rampy Jeremy Dow is happy to finally be working at the main Buffalo hangar. I just gotta prep two airplanes as skids. Um, gotta prepare all the stuff inside, make sure they all have seats and stuff. Uh, all the seats all have everything that a uh, skid requires. He's next in line to get checked out, to take the written and in-flight exams to start as a Buffalo co-pilot on the skid. That's Buffalo's daily DC-3 passenger flight. If he gets checked out, he will be our skid guy. That's the only thing that keeps you going at this job, is knowing that you're going to be flying something. Anything that's not sharp, don't worry about. But Jeremy's pilot dreams have hit some turbulence. Okay, we're gonna add that now. Cargo manager Kelly Jurasovic is solving her staffing problems. We don't have enough people right now. It's just a lot of work. By calling in rampy reinforcements. God. Oh, Kelly just uh, told me that I was going to be the, the food mail 
as were the exact words, I believe. Jeremy's gonna have to help out whether he likes it or not. He's quite pissed about that, but I don't really give a shit. It's not like I like it, but, you know, it's a job and that's what we gotta do. Well, it wasn't tragic that I was going to be a food mail, but uh, this job's all about doing everything rather than just pilot type duties. It's just do whatever needs to be done and make everybody happy. That's the way to go. But it's not long before Jeremy catches a major break, courtesy of Buffalo Joe's unpredictable nature. There's a DC-3 sitting on the tarmac at Buffalo's Red Deer, Alberta hangar. Yeah, my father's impatient. He wants a DC-3 back home. And uh, even though it's been there for six months, he's just picked this arbitrary day that it's super important. And Joe needs someone to fill the co-pilot seat on the flight from Red Deer to Hay River. So uh, the only guy available is Jeremy, which worked out pretty perfect because he needs the training hours. So as they're faring, they could be training. If Jeremy can impress Joe, the next Buffalo co-pilot position could be his. You don't want me to go on Saturday? No, he wants it now. I need somebody to give me the, the crash course of Joe. Oh, I'm stressed. <laughs> but impressing Joe won't be easy. Every once in a while, a guy grabs that airplane, he's 19, 20 years old, and he needs a natural. That's what we're looking for. The question is, does Jeremy fit that profile? Will do. Thanks. Bye. He's really got a, a situation right now that he's got to prove himself, and he's got a target on his head. It's a big opportunity. It's also a giant pile of stress. Like, God, I've, I've got to get it right, you know? Jeremy doesn't have many hours in a DC-3, and he's never landed one. But he'll have to be prepared for anything with Joe. It's like going from the minors, and then you get put right on the first line on the playoffs. Welcome to the big league. Jeremy flies commercial to Edmonton, and then drives to Buffalo's hangar in Red Deer. Well, if you impress Joe well enough, he'll say, yeah, I get that guy checked out. He can fly an airplane, let's make that happen. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. The four and a half hour flight to Hay River is scheduled for first thing tomorrow morning. Jeremy doesn't have much time to get ready. Mm, shiny. <laughs> Positive outcome would be that he nails it. Um, negative outcome that he'll crack. Look at that, two jump seats. It was certainly nerve-wracking trying to be prepared for a flight with Joe. Yeah, I better figure out my way around this one. Because every DC-3 is different. Coming up. An engine problem on the Electra forces a sudden change of plans. Listen to this. She's poof, buddy. It's morning in Red Deer, Alberta. Rookie pilot Jeremy Dow is ready to take center stage. Oh, I'm just heading over to the terminal to do the weather. Get all the uh, weather and the information for our flight today. Figure out what the best altitude for winds are and the quickest way to get there. He's feeling confident about his upcoming training flight with the boss, yeah. Buffalo Joe McBrien. I figured I knew enough to get through the flight and I was as prepared as I could be. But the forecast is not in Jeremy's favor. So uh, just to have gone from an 8,000 foot ceiling to a 1,500 foot ceiling in the last hour and a half. That's a bit bigger of a deal. So much for this being a run of the mill easy flight. And that only adds to the pressure Jeremy's already feeling. His future as a Buffalo Airways co pilot is riding on this flight with Joe. Gonna be looking at a fair bit of turbulence thanks to some uh, developing thunderstorms pretty much the entire way. It's gonna be bumpy. And there's more. We got, uh, looks like icing to Edmont, uh, through Edmonton now. Uh -huh. And uh, to 15,000, freezing up to 15,000. Are you scared? Not in the least. Oh, nice. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but, uh, that's right. I was a little nervous, I'll admit, because yeah, it was gonna be a workout and I knew it. It was going to be a lot more stuff having to think about. And you know that you're gonna be copying the clearance. Roger. As they taxi out, Joe doesn't waste any time testing the rookie. You know the number? Yes, sir. Where's their initial heading? Uh, 336, I believe. 336 is their initial heading. Roger. Straight to Hay River. They're on their way.
away from Red Deer, Alberta to Hay River Northwest Territories, 1,000 kilometers away. Easier said than done. Jeremy's only had a handful of short training flights in a DC-3. He wants to take a look at me to make sure that I'm good enough to fly his airplanes, at least as a, as a Kojo. It's a lot of pressure for a 21-year-old. He's got to show Joe he has the right stuff. Give me your, uh, give me your map, sir. There's Alberta. I mean, a map like MAP. This is a low and root chart. No, I don't have a uh, VNC stick. A VNC is a visual navigation chart that shows aviation information superimposed on a ground map. No, I need a map, and so I can see the ground on the map. And I was like, oh, yeah, he wants a, that map, right? <laughs> Just kind of Joe tries the onboard GPS. This is a navigating person. Oh, that's why I need a map, eh? I don't even know what the winds are up there. On the flight, I didn't have the right maps with me, and I didn't have the right weather with me. I thought you guys had a better hat on schooling than that. No, no, I know better. It's just I didn't do it. It's my bad. I got angry at me. It certainly wasn't as angry as he has been with me before. Jeremy's not off to a great start. As the DC-3 is struck by turbulence, he gets another chance to prove his merit. I was putting a fair bit of muscle and effort into flying that thing around. Just fighting with the damned airplane, trying to keep it going in the same direction it was before. Then, just as forecast, they encounter icing. Ice build up on the wings can severely affect the plane's lift. Joe leaves Jeremy to deal with this problem, a true test of his flying acumen. Jeremy takes the DC-3 to a lower altitude to escape the icing. The move works. They descend out of the clouds and the icing. Jeremy has worked his way through the ranks to reach this opportunity. Now, as they close in on Hay River, Joe has one more challenge for him. Oh yeah, I want you to take over here. Jeremy is going to bring the plane down in Hay River. He recently landed the much bigger DC-4, but he didn't have the boss breathing down his neck. Now go over and get in the center line of the runway, sir. Oh yeah, I got lights in front of you right now. Yeah. Stay on the control. I want to make sure you're on the floor. You don't touch your brake. Use your feet. See this? I yeah. have my feet. See that? I like a pedal car. Remember your little kid you had a pedal car? You went like this? Yep, same thing. If Jeremy can nail this landing, it will leave a lasting impression with Joe. It's all come down to this moment. Fire back. You're just going to hold it right there. You're just going to hold it right there. Then, one final test. You need to land the main one. See what you're doing with the tail. Jeremy brings the DC-3 in like a pro. All the months slogging it out on the ramp. I love my job, I love my job, I love my job, I love my job. In freezing temperatures. I love my job. For crappy pay. I love my job, I love my job, I love my job. Will have been worth it if it means Jeremy will soon become Buffalo's next co-pilot. Good fun. I like my job. I like my job a lot. This time he means it, but did he impress Joe? It was a good trip, nice trip. Yeah. Well done. Don't tell him that. Then they want pay and shit like that. It was good to see that he uh, he wasn't too unhappy with my performance. I'm sure if I screwed up miserably when I was flying with Joe, there wouldn't be a uh, a checkout, uh, a flight test in my future or near future, anyways. So, yeah, doing well on that flight was sort of the last uh, one of the final hurdles. Back 
Lincoln Hall Beach, the base for Buffalo's fuel delivery, the crew continues transporting diesel up the dew line. I'm gonna go sit in my cage now. Captain Brian Harrison and co-pilot Sean Barry are ready to fly. Instead of going to Macar Inlet this evening, we're gonna to go to Dewar Lakes. Uh, first trip into there, we're bringing uh, 11,000 liters of fuel, and uh, we'll go check it out. Flight engineer Luby Lobos checks the Electra's fuel level. They're set to go. But there's a snag. Four engines no good. An engine problem at a distant location is something you can't plan for. You can't, you gotta deal with it once you get here, right? It's like when uh, Neil Armstrong went to the moon, you f think he had it all planned before he got there? I don't think so. We didn't want to go into Dewar's Lakes and have this engine fail on us on the ground. Because that's what happens. Usually once you shut it down and try and start again, you can't get it going. Oh, we've got a problem with our number four engine. We've got to take the airplane home in order to get it fixed. So that's what we're doing right now. Oh, engine problems. Get your shit together, buddy, because we're going over. Better off to get airborne, take it back to Yellowknife, change the engine, and finish the job. Let's get that one off. Get it, just leave it hanging off that ring. Chuck gives Juan a heads up. They'll be coming back to Yellowknife for an engine repair. See what you can do. Okay. Bye. Juan sprints into action. He's only got a few hours to prep a good engine before the Electra arrives from Hall Beach. But he's about to hit an obstacle. Joe. Coming up, problems with the replacement engine. And Joe blows a gasket. You guys just f***ing me around. I'm not f***ing anybody around, Joe, okay? The Electra crew is heading back to Buffalo for an engine replacement. They take off. They'll be in Yellowknife in less than four hours. This detour is a setback for Joe. One that could trim as much as $50,000 off the profit margin. The old man, once he knew the plane was coming home, he wasn't in the best of moods, of course. Oh, everybody got it bad that day. It was just, Listen. yeah, everybody even. Probably someone who took his order for lunch probably would got in trouble that day, too. Juan still smarting from Joe's decision not to include him on the Hall Beach contract, but he's a professional. The faster the aircraft gets back to doing that job, the better off it is. The spare Electra engine in the hangar is missing some parts. But Buffalo's other Electra has four good engines on it. It's just easier and faster to take the whole QEC, quick engine change unit, off the whole other aircraft, throw it on the aircraft that has the problem. There's not enough parts for that. Now, I don't know. But Joe what? doesn't okay. think so. Why well, gearbox and turbine and they say we don't have enough parts? Well, I'll show you what's missing. You know, he's, he's got a big knot in his face because his engine that was supposed to be a spare is sitting on the floor. Joe expects the spare engine to be used for the repair, but for months, the mechanics have been poaching it for parts. What do you want me to do? There's no, there's not enough parts for that. And all, the hours, all the hours you're going to spend putting that air engine on and taking it off the waste of time. It's sitting on the floor in pieces. Looks like a big pile of bolts. You guys just around. I'm not f***ing anybody around, Joe, okay? I don't take this f***ing thing apart. I ask you, you say talk to Booby or Chuck. I don't know. Well, I'm not the one that took the f***ing thing apart. Well, you guys better have an answer for me tomorrow to treat you. know, because I'm getting pissed off. You know, I have a better temper when it comes to dealing with assholes. You know, if you want to be an asshole, I can deal with that, and I'll be an asshole right back. Tired of getting shit on for not f***ing no reason. Juan's ready to walk, but he knows there's a crew flying in. And they're counting on his help. The sooner the aircraft's back in service, the sooner it's gone back to finish its job. So it's, you gotta get the job done, you can't lollygag around, right? Straight. How far into it? All the way. Back from Turkey, Corey Dodd and Arnie Schrader lend a hand. Go 
those things don't turn any, eh, Phil. Juan's taking the high road despite his clash with Joe. Because that's my job and that's what I do. You know, I've done it for 30 years, so I'll keep doing it for another 10. Maybe not here. By the time the 2,000 pound engine is removed, the Hall Beach Electra crew returns. They need a fast turnaround or Joe will hit the roof. I'm not going to die for that shit. By the end of the day, the swapped out engine is in place. The next morning, the Electra is ready to head back to Hall Beach and continue the fuel haul up the dew line. Look out, buddy, there's a freaking lunatic on the loose, man. How's my air? Anything out of place? The engine's all changed over and uh, we're, uh, we're on the way. Juan got the job done, but as the Electra takes off, he has a decision to make. I came here to be a flight engineer, not Joe's You know, but Joe likes to have everybody under his thumb. And then... I quit. I just had enough of this shit. He had an issue with me and I had an issue with him and he elected to, to quit. And that's fine with me. I don't like being yelled at. 50 years old and I'm not one of his kids. At the end of the day, Juan's wife Kelly finds out. Well, Juan, I phoned him because I was finished work early. And so I asked him if I could have a ride because he had the truck. Well, we were driving away. I said, hey, I'm a little rhyme with Joe today and I quit. I really didn't think Juan would do that, you know, to be honest with you, because considering we're both at Buffalo, but he just had enough. So it was quite a shock to me that he actually did quit. With Juan quitting, Kelly's faced with a dilemma to stay on at Buffalo or leave with her husband. A rainy day in Yellowknife. And Kelly is pondering a possible future without Buffalo. Looking at real estate in Alberta somewhere, or BC, so I can start making payments on something so I can get the hell out of here. I want to get somewhere where we can have our farm again, because Walt and I were really happy when we did that. The uncertainty of things is weighing on her. I just don't like the unknown, and change is very hard for me. I've never dealt with it well, and it just worries me, and I can't sleep, and get all freaked out like an idiot. She's, she's not happy. She doesn't like change, and she doesn't. She fears that Joe's going to come down on her. Juan's concerned that Kelly will pay the price for his issues with Joe. You got a problem with me, you come to me. You know, don't be a bully and pick on a girl. I was really worried about how Joe would react to the whole thing, and I didn't know how he'd react to me, actually. It's not long before Joe surprises her in the cargo terminal. He's all worked up about one courier package not being delivered on time. Jack delivered it. Yeah, why did it sit here for two days waiting for him then? I'll find out. Yeah, let's find out now. What are you guys doing here? I was just in a bad mood. And I kind of thought it was towards me and the Juan quitting and all this. That's why, the, I, you know, I didn't really ask. He was just in a pissy mood. Yeah, fear was just in him. Mm hmm Not friendly. Nope. 
Just asked about that thing you delivered and why the f it didn't go uh, yesterday and went off and find out and stormed out and grabbed the Kelly is the most loyal, energetic, caring person he's got in that company over there making that system run. If he starts to pick on her, she'll hit the fan. I've had too much turmoil in my life that I can't deal with shit like that. I, I get extremely, extremely depressed and extremely worried and it's not good for me. And if Joe makes life difficult for her because of what happened with Juan... I'm sticking up for my husband and I'll walk the hell out of here. I do not give a shit. I put up with enough, I work my ass off over here. Big decisions, and lots to think about right now. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT... An aviation gas shortage leaves Buffalo scrambling for fuel. They put a freeze on the gas for non-essential service. A failed bid puts Scott's North Pole flight in jeopardy. We got outbid by everything. And Kelly makes a decision. There's no law that says you can't quit if things get shitty. On the season finale of Ice Pilots NWT, a fuel crisis threatens to ground the whole fleet. They put a freeze on the gas for non-essential service as Buffalo scrambles for a rare flight to the North Pole. Turmoil in the ranks me off they don't show up. shakes up the company. I recommend it if fires out. Some will stay and some will go. Summer in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, land of the midnight sun. The buffalo take full advantage of the extra light. And so do the buffalo pilots. Though playing golf in the north does require some adjustment. You said you gotta like dig it down so it's flush with the dirt. Classic Yellowknife style, golfing with mats. Good one, Scotty. Right on. That's a little straighter. It doesn't go as far as green grass, we'll tell you that much. But where else can you get in a midnight round? It's a welcome distraction for co-pilot yep. Scott Blue. The club's long enough? Probably not. Probably missed on my first stroke anyway. With business down at Buffalo, he's not getting much chance to fly. And for Scott, things are about to get even worse. Unbelievable. Yes, sit on, guys. Buffalo Joe is about to shake up the pilot roster. When we move a guy who's ready to move from the right seat to left seat, it takes some planning, it takes some thought. He's fast-tracking co-pilot Gord Cooling to get him checked out as a captain as soon as possible. We want to put Gordon on the DC-3 in the morning. We want to put him on the C-46 at noon. If he's back in time, we'll put him on the DC-3 again at night because he's in his last 100 hours. Golden Boy Gord has zoomed up the ranks in his four years at Buffalo. It's pretty neat that I'm becoming a captain at Buffalo and my brother's Got a job in an airline, and my dad's retiring, all within the same month. Hey, congratulations. How are you doing, man? The son and grandson of commercial pilots from West Vancouver, Gord was born to fly. He's amassed 2,600 flight hours, just 100 short of the Magic 2700 that will make him one of the youngest captains in the country at age 24. So that's how I have to ask you guys to bear with us because you'll be very interruptive in our schedule. To get Gord those hours quickly, Joe expects all other co-pilots to stand down. There, there is an element of professional jealousy. Always arises somewhere. You just don't know where. It's, it's buried somewhere under the surface. If anyone has the right to feel frustrated, it's Scott Blue. Compared to Gord's 2,600 hours, Scott only has 750 as a co-pilot. 
I'd like to be flying more. You know, we're paid by the mile, right? So the more we fly, the more cash we make. But there's more at stake than money. Too much time off the stick, and Scott risks losing his touch on the C-46, the only plane he flies. You can get quite rusty on that machine very, very quickly. You gotta have that feel for it. And the best way to get the feel for it is by flying it, flying it a lot. But with Gord co-piloting all scheduled C-46 flights, Scott is grounded. Little to nothing I can do about it apart from being negative and bitch, but who wants to hear that? Nobody, so what's it gonna do? Scott sucks it up. Hopefully we've passed on enough to you, which I know we have. Uh, there's just a few more things we wanna show you, and then you'll do your line dock and you'll be on your way. So all the best. Gord wastes no time jumping in the cockpit with C-46 Captain Devin Brooks. As for Scott, it's back to rampy grunt work. This afternoon, it's a little slow, and uh, I'm on Operation uh, Park My Ass for the next few weeks, so Gordo can get his hours up and go captain. So I get to uh, watch the plane today. Gord Yay! After working up the Buffalo ranks for almost two years, Scott's back to square one. At the end of the day, I'm just a, you know, pawn in the grand game that is Buffalo. And it's starting to get to him. On the ramp, tempers rise. Screen it all down, you're making a little monkey do the f work, aren't you? You want to know something, asshole? I did the broom on the top part of the wing, and now we're trading jobs. In five minutes, we'll trade again. Scott's a team player but he's got to find a way to get off the bench. Grime, slime. Hey, I just got a call from Shell uh, saying that there's no ad gas anywhere. In the Buffalo office, General Manager Mikey McBride is reeling from his own piece of unwelcome news, and it could spark a crisis. Some sort of weird shortage going on right now, and they've only got uh, enough fuel for the fire fighting aircraft. In an era when big airplanes burn kerosene-based jet fuel, Buffalo's piston-pounding fleet still burns leaded aviation gasoline, or avgas. But a shrinking demand for avgas and environmental concerns about leaded fuel have reduced its production worldwide. So this is, this is it, eh? Holy smokes. Mikey is shocked to learn that there will be no avgas available for the next three weeks. Like, as of today, right now, we're done? As of right now, they're freezing everything for firefighting only. Just like water. Can't get gas, you can't drive. How, how useful is your car if you can't go to the gas station, right? It just looks pretty. And we're not a museum, right? We're, we fly airplanes. Word of the freeze on Avgas sales has yet to reach the local distributor in Yellowknife. We're freaking dumping all our uh, fuel trucks right now and filling them all up before they find out here. So Mikey moves fast. Who's left on the ground, Gene? Get him on charge of filling that yellow. Grabbing every available hand, they must empty all of Buffalo's fuel trucks, some bucket by bucket, then refill the trucks to capacity at the depot before the local tap gets turned off. Three fuel trucks, how long do you think that would last us? Last us a week. Yeah, so I said until about Thursday, Friday. Yep. The pressure is on Mikey and his brother Rod, the company's director of maintenance. We're probably, we, could, we could empty the yellow knife easy. We could hold the whole yellow knife right here in the yard. That's what we're going to try to do if they let us. Take it all. Uh, we're going to fill the green one at 4.30 before they realize they're not allowed to sell it to us. So we've got to get... Uh, now? Yeah, I know. We're a little late. Mikey's booked a 4.30 appointment at the local fuel depot. Before then, every drum, every tank, every fuel hold and every plane has to be topped up to get the trucks emptied. It's a mammoth job. Yeah, it's full. They can't afford to miss this appointment. It's after 4.30 when the trucks finally head out. With Mikey hoping there will still be avgas for them. If not, Buffalo's fleet could be grounded within days. Number one. Buffalo Airways is in a desperate situation. 
If they can't fill their trucks with aviation gas before the local supply is shut down, their entire fleet will be grounded. No one's ever phoned and said they don't have gas available in Canada. Until now, the government has declared a freeze across the country to conserve the fuel for firefighting planes only. Buffalo's trucks make it to the fuel depot just in time. There is still Avgas available, but how long will it last? We're just playing it day by day. The, uh, like I said, we put all the fuel we could on site and uh, hopefully we can make it a couple of weeks. But the freeze may last longer than that. They need a backup plan. With this fuel shortage situation, we're trying to see who has what right now on the stops that we normally do. Operations manager Mike Hanley routes every supplier he knows to dig up another source. You go through 90,000 on average a week, and you've only got 129. But so far, he's striking out. Okay, bye. Well, that's not very good. On the tarmac, Buffalo Joe juggles his dwindling Avgas supply. I'm gonna need your fuel, your fuel out of here. Your weight, your all-up weight. They put a freeze on the gas for non-essential service. So what I gotta do is stockpile some gas for my essential service. What I feel is essential, what they feel is essential are two different things. For Joe and people in remote northern settlements, Buffalo's food and mail deliveries are as essential as it gets. Yeah. And that means more flying for Gord Cooling. We're going to Fort Good Hope, Norman Wells, and Toledo. Gord takes off with C-46 Captain A.J. DeCoste on another Mackenzie Valley run. Clear. Buffalo 323 Tower. Clear takeoff runway 33. Left turn out. Three down left. Good. get precious food, supplies, and mail to the four remote communities on their route. They'll burn thousands of liters of Avgas on this run alone. It's a 1,600 kilometer trip from Yellowknife up the Mackenzie Valley and back. How's it going today? Good, it's Mike Kelly from Buffalo Railway's calling. I'm looking for Alex. So Mike Hanley keeps working the phone. Avgas always goes up in price. Okay, so... He calls the airport in the village of Norman Wells. Like 370000 you said? Oh, okay, so you guys have lots then. Jackpot. Norman Wells is the second to last stop for AJ and Gord in the C-46. Mike has secured a deal to fuel up all valley flights here. Gord makes sure to fill the C-46's wing tanks to capacity. With a supply of Avgas here and more stockpiled in the Yellowknife yard, Buffalo should make it through, this time. But as this specialty fuel gets more scarce, the days of these piston-banging warbirds could well be numbered. In high D, there'll be no bitching about the quality. Meanwhile, on Great Slave Lake, cargo manager Kelly Jurasevic is taking a rare day off to work out a problem of her own. What's gonna happen if I catch a fish? I'll bonk it on the head. Why don't you bonk Joe on the head, and then you can leave. Kelly's husband, Juan, a flight engineer at Buffalo, recently butted heads with the boss. You guys just me I'm not f***ing anybody around you, okay? I don't take this thing apart. I ask you, you say talk to movie or talk to me. I don't like being yelled at. 50 years old, and I'm not one of his kids. He had an issue with me, and I had an issue with him, and he elected to, to quit. Yeah, I quit. But he just had enough, so it was quite a shock to me that he actually did quit. Now, Juan has landed a job with one of Buffalo's competitors. I'm not abandoning you, Kelly. I'm getting another f***ing job. Is that's not the point. We had, a, we had a pact that you and me were going to stay at Buffalo, finish our year out, and then we're going to leave and have our farm in Alberta and live happily ever after. But that's all changed. If Juan's going to stay in Yellowknife, Kelly's dream of the farm is on hold. 
She must decide whether to follow Juan and leave Buffalo or stay put. There's no law that says you can't quit if things get shitty. So just continue. You just sleep at night, and I don't. And if Kelly chooses to stay put... You know what's going to be hard for me? Staying there without you. At Buffalo? Yeah. It's down the road, like... You, you can have throw no a rock. idea. You can throw a rock to the How first you area. you my backbone there? Kelly has a tough decision to make. In the eyes of her co-workers, she's irreplaceable. If she wasn't here, then nothing would be done as well as it is right now and as organized as it is now. She can't allow herself to let go and let anybody else deal with anything, you know? She's just that way, I guess. The next morning, all clean-shaven, Juan shows up for his new job at First Air. Just up the road, it's back to work for Kelly, too. On the clock now, boys. After her day off, she's had time to think about her options. Just gotta get over it and think positive about other things. I'm not stuck here, but I will stay here. Jax is gonna be 452, yours is 400, and that's 380, okay? And that should be it. Kelly's resolve to tough it out, for now. Yeah, it is a busy day. <laughs> so we should get 380 next. Coming up. Pisses me off and they don't show up. A shorthanded Kelly blows her cool when Rampy Jeremy Dow misses his shift. I recommend it if fires ass on the road and put him on his on a gray on bus out of here. Rampy Jeremy Dow has been fighting to get off the Buffalo ramp and into the cockpit for eight long months. Too tired to be frustrated. But now, yet another detour. He's been assigned to help Kelly in cargo. Good morning. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, no problem. Donate, donate. He's trying not to let it bring him down. It's not a big deal to me. I mean, I knew I was going to come here to work hard. I didn't particularly care what the work was as long as it led to flying and just got to get her done man. Jeremy settled into his new digs in Yellowknife where tonight he's hosting a bit of a party. Hey everybody. We haven't decided whether it's a hoopla or a hoot nanny yet but uh, it's certainly going to be one of the two. Jeremy made the move from Hay River less than a month ago and it was only days after he got to Yellowknife that good things began to happen like flying as Buffalo Joe's co-pilot for the very first time. A nerve-wracking test of Jeremy's ability. It was a good trip. Nice trip. Well done. After that successful training flight, Jeremy is poised to be the next DC-3 co-pilot. There's talk of me uh, flying within the next week even, so that's a good sign. But his luck may be running out. Five o'clock the next morning. It's time for one of the biggest jobs of the week at Buffalo Airways. It's gonna be a good day. Morning. The Sunday morning food mail shift, when Kelly Jurasovic and her cargo staff receive and sort the week's massive grocery shipments. Sometimes we'll get like 7,000 pounds we have to do, and if you don't have enough people, you can't get it done. I mean, I'd be here all day. And today, one member of her crew is missing. Well, I got here and there was no Jeremy. Jeremy arranged for his roommate Andrew, who was scheduled to work anyway, to cover for him. But he neglected to let Kelly know he was taking the morning off. It just screws the whole day up. They can have any other day off but a Sunday. And it pisses me off when they don't show up. I don't think there would have been a problem if Jeremy would have just called in, but I didn't know. Now, Kelly has more cargo than she expected, and she could use Jeremy's help with the heavy lifting. So she tries to reach him. It's hard to keep anything quiet at Buffalo. Joe soon finds out about Jeremy. You're supposed to be at work. Huh? Yeah. Doesn't show up, doesn't phone in. There's just no recovery from that kind of shit. I recommend it if fires ass on the road, put him on a Greyhound bus out of here. 
I'm trading him off for a bus ticket. While things are looking grim for Jeremy, there could be good news for Scott Blue. The government needs a fuel haul at the edge of the North Pole. They've asked us if we are even able, if we have an aircraft that's able to shuttle things from Eureka here to Tanqueray Fjord. This could be Scott's ticket off the ramp and a chance to boost his much needed stick time. Eureka is a nine hour flight straight north. Eureka was the first of Canada's high Arctic weather stations established in 1947. These days, the updated post monitors the stratospheric ozone layer. Shit, I'm sure more people have been to a Playboy mansion than, you know, up in this neck of the woods, like, by a factor of, like, 10, you know? Eureka is on Ellesmere Island and just above the 80th parallel, near the North Pole. The government needs 100 drums of jet fuel moved from Eureka to an emergency airstrip even further north at Tankery Fjord. It's a dream job for any pilot, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I want to do that. I want to do that for sure. That would be awesome. You know, like, you know, 1,300 miles north of here. Hey, Mike. Yeah. I can trim the oil cost, too. We're not going to go through 100 gallons. Scott jumps right in and helps Mikey prepare the quote. We can scrounge for drums around here and see what we come up with. No one's asked him to do all this stuff. He's technically uh, doing my job right now, and I don't really mind. That's pretty cool, actually. So. Okay. No, oh, cool. All right. Scott's hoping that his hard work will pay off with a chance to be the co-pilot on the job. Even if you're there for two days, you get off the plane, take a couple photos, you know, some stupid thing where you're standing there with your camera and Eureka's in the background, at least you can say, hey, Mom, look where I was. Problem is, Gord Cooling wants in too, and there can only be one co-pilot on the flight. Gord really kind of didn't want anything really too much to do with it um, at first. Then he kind of got a little bit excited and started working on it. Well, that makes you bang. What do you say? 27 hours of flight? 27 hours. Scott, Gord, and C-46 Captain A.J. DeCoast go over the quote with Mikey. Sure. Okay, so let's double check. So three hours to Cambridge. Under Joe's orders, Gord's been getting all the flying time so he can make captain. Yeah. And he figures this flight will be his too. That was a total mileage. Don't worry about us going up to care that. We haven't done the battle to see who would go. <laughs> 25 hours, 560, what's that give you? There may not be a eureka moment for Scott after all. You know, I'll have to pull a Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding on his ass and bust his kneecaps or something, then maybe I can go. The next day, Jeremy Dow returns to work to face the music. Oh, I feel pretty crappy about myself. He missed a shift in the cargo terminal, but thought he had it covered. Big mistake. I wasn't worried about there being anything wrong until Andrew came home and said, hey man, uh, there wasn't enough people there, uh, so we had to call in some rampies to help, and then I knew that things weren't going to go too well. I went in to work like I had planned. Joe was there, and uh, and he confronted me about it. Well, if you're 21 years old, you can't get your ass out of bed to go to work because you've been to a bar the night before. What slide are you on? Said he wanted to fire me right there, that he had no no room in his organization for uh, partiers and alcoholics, neither of which I am anywhere near. Jeremy well, came to me and was just like so upset. I couldn't believe how upset that kid was. I actually felt bad for Jeremy, very bad for him, because, you know, the kid tries hard and all he wants to do is fly. Jeremy uh, got a letter saying, hey, this is it. If you mess up one more time, you're done. After eight months paying his dues at Buffalo, longer than any other rampy, Jeremy is put on probation. In one short day, he's fallen from first in line for promotion to co-pilot to back of the pack. I got to show them that I'm still a hard worker, still, uh, still worthy of recognition for flying and whatnot. It's up to him either to fit in or get on the Greyhound. But even Jeremy's rampy rivals think he deserves a break. You just work as hard as you can, accomplish every job you're given with enthusiasm, and Joe notices that, 
what's gonna happen, I don't know. We all wish that someone's gonna be checked out on the DC3 pretty soon. It would be nice if it's him, just because he deserves it. That's the way I think. Jeremy's only hope is for Joe to forgive him. Joe is the king of giving another chance to people because, you know, he has more belief in people than I think people understand. But whether or not he can work his way back into the cockpit remains to be seen. It's up to him. It's not up to me. I'm not his judge. I'm not his keeper. I'm not his mom. I'm not his dad. Totally up to him. Buffalo Airways has been flying vintage prop liners for nearly 40 years. But the recent shortage of the aviation gas they guzzle was a harsh reminder that times are changing. If ab gas production keeps dwindling, Buffalo will one day have to retire its fleet of classic World War II airplanes. The fact that, that I might be the person, the last person to um, operate it is it's a very surreal thing. It's something you don't really think about. It's kind of asking, oh, what are you going to do when your parents die? That's a question Robert Ott has asked himself recently. He's come to Yellowknife from his home in Calgary on a very personal mission. I'd like to spread my father's ashes uh, from a plane, from a DC-3. Frank Ott died at the age of 74 after a career in the Royal Canadian Air Force. He was a RCAF guy for 32 years and I made a promise to him to do this. He enlisted in January of 43. So I, I think his big connection with the DC-3 is he followed that plane, or the plane followed him throughout his whole career with the, with the Air Force. I'm sure to fly a DC-3 was one of the most exciting things he did. That smell of a hangar, and, you know, takes me back to being a kid. Some of the air bases. It's something you never forget, that smell. I haven't seen a DC-3 this close in 30 years, something like that. Yeah, long time. Now, he needs Buffalo to help him honor his father's last wish. The next day, Mikey jumps into action. Yeah, so we're heading out to the, to the automotive store here to get some tools to get this guy's father's ashes out of the plane. It's going to be a little bit of engineering to uh, figure out how to do it properly in an airplane so it doesn't all kind of blow back at you, which would be the, the worst case scenario. Like his dad, Mikey can't resist an unusual challenge. On Buffalo standards, this is definitely a aid of the craziness of requests. It kind of surprised me at first. Um, the more I thought about it, the more it makes sense. Like his father was a World War II uh, DC-3 mechanic. He definitely would want to freaking go out in style. But there's not exactly any aisle in the store for this kind of job. There we go. Yeah, looking for a jerry can. I guess what, I need one with a bigger spout. These ones got like a, a tight Oh, right they got a stopper in the middle. What we're actually doing is kind of crazy is we're uh, spreading ashes out of an airplane. And we don't want, uh, we don't want any, like, back, uh... Yeah, blowback. So, I, even, like, something like this. Yeah, that's way better. You guys have tubes here? Plastic tubes, eh? Um, All we need is about four more inches, five more inches. I might have something back in the park. Maybe, like, a rat hose or something, too, eh? Oh, geez, yeah. That'd be perfect. No problem. Cool. Have a good day, guys. Thanks. No problem. So, 29 total. I'm pretty confident that the stuff we have here, like the, this uh, contraption here, will, will work. There's just one problem, getting Joe on side. Always been cranky as hell. Geez, nothing's going right. This could be an opportunity for him to look back and, and to see that uh, as crazy as life is, at least we're all still together. And uh, hopefully. Probably not. He'll probably just yell at us even more. Things have been a little strained at Buffalo. These days, co-pilot Gord Cooling has been flying almost non-stop in a final push to get the flight hours he needs to make captain. I need another 10 hours, but Arnie's not even here, so I'm sure I'll get them over the course of Arnie's back. 
Gord knows the 18-hour return trip to Eureka on the brink of the North Pole will clinch the time he needs. But Scott Blue is hungry for hours too. And only one of them will get to go if Buffalo lands this new government contract. In the hangar, Mikey gets word. Thank you for your bid on the D&D requirement to move drum fuel from Eureka to Tankery Fjord. Mondale Aviation was excessive vigor of this program. However, your bid was too high and we had to contact another operator. Once again, blah, blah, blah. The Eureka bid is a bust. And we got outbid by everybody. Like, everybody's got cheaper numbers than us right now. And Joe is not happy. He's so stressed out right now that any bad news to him is just like throwing him more gas on the fire. It doesn't make the fire that much bigger, just a little bit more ferocious for a short little while and it goes back to just being a fire. Buffalo's quote was driven up by the need to bring along their own avgas for the return trip. C-46 was sued for the job probably 50 years ago when there was lots of fuel around. Now there's only fuel for turbine engines or jet engines. Um, so it's out of its league. The airline that got the contract flies jet-fueled planes that can fill up in Eureka. This failed bid is another sign that Buffalo's reliance on Avgas could lead to their downfall. It's a big blow. It was emotionally hard because there's a lot of jobs on the line, there's a lot of people on the line, and uh, would like to be the, the hero for a little while. Oh, Mikey's just like, yeah, we didn't, we didn't get the Eureka trip. I'm like, oh, really, man? Scott's missed out on the flight of a lifetime. Some other pilot gets to have all the fun of going up to Eureka. Maybe some other day we will, but. <sighs> Coming up, a simple but sacred task. We'll all be the jump master. I'll be back here. Gets executed Buffalo style. After a week of aviation gas shortages and failed bids, Buffalo Airways has received one of the company's most unusual requests. Robert Ott has come to Buffalo to scatter his late father's ashes from a DC-3. His father was a World War II uh, DC-3 mechanic. He definitely would want to freaking go out in style. Just Mikey's persuaded Joe to donate his time, but Joe's patience is wearing thin. So I'm gonna go do this thing now at the airplane and get back to work. Get him in the airplane, get her done. I gotta get back to work, Rick. I can't spend any more time out of Can you get in, get him and get him in the airplane so I can get going? He was so freaking cranky. Uh, if I had to spread his ashes this morning, I probably would have just freaking kicked him in the boneyard somewhere because uh, he wasn't in the best mood this morning. Hi, how you doing? Good, good. Hey, guys. I'm Joe McBrien. Hey, Joe. Yeah, really great to meet yeah. you. Yeah, I just talked to Mikey. Joe you know, leaves you know, Mikey to you know, brief Robert Ott. As the son of a former Canadian Air Force mechanic, Robert might expect military protocol and precision. What I came up with was uh, the watering can with the extension. But this and is Buffalo. We're going to try to do it out the back door. Okay. Which would be the most efficient. And broad funnel, uh, depending on how it goes, we might use the funnel as like the windbreak, and then this goes right into the funnel. So we're putting ashes into here? Yep. Yeah. And you think they're going to get kind of drawn out? Hopefully, that's yeah. the whole thing. And then if this doesn't work, we can always have just this as a straight shot. Okay. So I guess we just got to transfer it. Okay. With some trepidation, Robert removes his father's ashes from the box. I couldn't even imagine what would be going through Robert's mind at that point because to me, it's it's a box with ashes to it, but to, to him, that was his father who had an entire life. Robert's been waiting 10 years for this day. It was only recently he heard about Buffalo Air. If that's an awfully thin tube, it's only three quarter inch heater hose. Mm. Hmm. Are you gonna do it here? Yeah. Impatient to get going, Joe steps in. See, even this, like this was, you know, if it's happening in this, which yeah, is know, larger. Well, that's what I mentioned to you, that, that you need a, a fair size. The old man came and said, no, we need a bigger hole. True to form, Joe takes a hands-on, or rather hands-in, sure. approach. Well, what, move your hand, your left hand. There she goes. It's 
kind of surreal thinking back on it now that, holy smokes. Sorry about that, I like to be a little more. That's all right. It's, it's like my dad to be difficult yeah. right now. Right oh, up yeah, the oh, end. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, Rod. Come here. Now all three McBrien's, yeah. father and sons, oh, get in on the act. So you just take off enough here that, that I can just get a clamp on it with a hose. Okay. So this thing here, yeah, like Mike hit physics, physics 30, grade 12. Remember that? Too much in here, not enough here? Well, the original one you wanted was half the size. I think his agenda was, you know, get her done. Let's get up there and get her done and no pussyfooting around. And Yeah, geez, that worked pretty good, eh? We're going to use the SCAD hose, which is like used for heaters and stuff uh, within the DC-3. So it's kind of suitable that we had to throw in a couple DC-3 parts in there to make it uh, a little bit more uh, authentic. That's good, yeah. Just like that, you want more of that? Yeah. yeah. We taped up the funnel to have a little bit of blockage just in case there was some blowback. It's all in the family. Buffalo Joe and his sons trying to ensure that Robert Ott's farewell to his father comes off successfully. He wanted it done quickly, but when he was there, he gave it his 100% attention. And that's what he does. You coming? Yeah, I'll come. No one really knows if their duct taped, homemade ash scattering contraption will actually work. But solving crazy challenges with unorthodox methods is the Buffalo way. No, the air from the back of the airplane wants to move forward. Okay. Inside the plane, Joe works out the logistics. What I want you to do, Mike, is make sure that hole is not getting any smaller. Now what I got to do, we got to make sure the front cockpit windows are both open. And he's decided that he's going to release the ashes himself. So I'll be the jump master. I'll be back here. Robert Ott follows Joe and co-pilot Sean Barry into the cockpit. Right there beside you. Robert settles in as the DC-3 taxis out. The service is about to begin. Hold that altitude. I'll just bring right back in the cruise. Once they're up in the air, Sean flies the plane while Joe and Robert join Mikey in the cabin. I hope it works. Well set, Joe. Well set, Joe. Sorry, I'll just do this No ceremony, no solemn prayer, no amazing grace. Just good old Buffalo get her done as Joe begins to disperse the ashes of late Royal Canadian Air Force mechanic Frank Ott. Inside the DC-3, you got all these invisible air currents. You can't really tell where, what's sucking, what's blowing, what's going on. So we try to eliminate that and try to make the vessel as closed as possible. I know now it's just inevitable. There's no way you can get by without any new blowback. Yeah, at one point I looked up and I could, I could almost feel him because I could see the, a little bit of his, his remains floating in the, in the back of the plane there by the door. And that was okay, it was all right. I'm not gonna comment on the fact that if we inhaled the human remains or not. None of that matters to Joe. Yeah, he gets in that mode that uh, there's a customer and the customer needs to get the job done. It was my responsibility as, I, I guess, the captain of the airplane to, to see that whoever goes overboard go overboard in proper fashion. Yeah, from uh, one DC-3 person to the next, he took it upon himself to get the job done. If that's what Robert's father wanted, that's what Robert's father got. He got the full nine yards, he got the meal deal, he got the president of the company out there hand-bombing him right out the door. I think of a better guy to help me out do that, but Joe. After doing this, I feel calm and peaceful, and I'm just filled with joy for the whole experience. And 
performing this good deed seems to have turned Buffalo's luck. What's the, what's the fuel like up there right now? A karmic payback oh, really? is in the air. Mikey receives okay. word about another Eureka contract. What happened was uh, something got damaged up there and they had to bring up an emergency, uh, emergency supply kit. And since we're ready to go, we uh, were the first call up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, we got crews. Yeah, so even though we were planning, got shut down, the planning paid off. Yeah, you'll get an email here any second. Thanks, bye. The flight to Eureka, just beside the North Pole, is back on. The only question is, who will be the co-pilot on the job? Scott Blue or Gord Cooling? It's a trip of a lifetime, an urgent mission to the top of the world. It's 24 hours of daylight too, man. Oh, I know. Two co-pilots have good reasons to go, but only one can. Gord Cooling needs just a few more hours of flight time to make captain. But Scott Blue worked his butt off to snag the contract and has slogged on the ramp without complaint. Only one can make the journey. Mikey McBrien makes his decision. Scott deserved to be the first officer on that one because he worked the hardest. Finally, Scott will get some stick time. Here we go. He'll be back in the co-pilot seat on the C-46 flying due north to Eureka, the second northernmost research station in the world. Nine, ten hours from now, we're going to be in Eureka. Cool. Scotty was very, very excited and uh, yeah, you should be. We'll go to Resolute and up to Eureka. Scott is making this once-in-a-lifetime journey alongside Buffalo's chief pilot, Arnie Schrader, and engineer, Adam Smith. O301 tower, left turn up, clear for takeoff, runway 33. Hello, tower, Buffalo 301, departing Alpha. We're rolling. The C-46 heads northeast to Resolute to fill up with Avgas, then continues farther north towards Eureka, near the North Pole. En route, Adam Smith catches up on some shut-eye. But Scott wouldn't miss a second of this trip for anything. Like, oh my god, we are so far north right now. You know, like our GPS went blank after the 75th, you know, parallel. Like, we're up at the 80th, you know. Um, we're directly in line with Magnetic North, so if you had a compass, it would actually be pointing due west, you know, as opposed to north, right? So they're useless. Throw them out the window. You your power up there, so you're not going to take us long to slow down here. No, not with that one. Get it over left a little bit more to, to the left. Sure, yeah. Go. Touching down on Eureka's dirt landing strip, it's still light out, although it's almost midnight. But Scott's too excited for sleep. He grabs his camcorder and explores the true north with Adam. Here we are in Eureka. Adam's walking around, picking his nose. XOA! Oh, Gio! Look at this, there's the old station across the way. Put the new one, real nice. Okay, it's cold. It's probably about three degrees. Man, we're at the top of the world. Can I also mention that it's midnight right now? It's not, uh, Wow. Less than 10 degrees of latitude from the North Pole. The sun doesn't set in Eureka from April to the end of August. The lovely Eureka Beach. Great for swimming, maybe, maybe not. With the uncertain future of Avgas and of Buffalo, this is one flight that might never happen again. Hey, look, our airplane's still there, nobody stole it. <laughs> <laughs> Will a big, huge tail dragon piston pounder ever make it that far north again? Maybe, maybe not. Might be the last time the plane's ever up there.
Scott could be right, yet Buffalo's crews have somehow managed to keep flying these vintage warbirds to the ends of the earth for 40 years, defying all odds and all predictions. But times are changing, and another winter is coming. And it's miserable. Can't feel my feet. When the battle to fly the frozen north will take off all over again. On the next season of Ice Pilots NWT. That's where I'm going to leave that, boys. Check it out, guys.